Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor, like Cummings, Mayor yeah. before you um, move in, just for Catherine and um, Cynthia, star six allows you to unmute yourself. Oh, yes. okay. To mute and unmute. Yes. Both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Before we begin, I'd just like to let members of the public know that we have been experiencing some technical difficulties, but we're hoping to get through this meeting uh, as smoothly as possible. So please bear with us today um, as we try to run this meeting with the difficulties we've been experiencing. At this point in time, I'd like to see if there's any members of the public who like to speak to us on items that are on our closed session. Uh, when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. Uh, the timer will be set to two minutes, and you may hang up once you've commented on your item of interest. So at this time, we'll open it up to the public. If there's any member of the public that would like to speak to us on the items on closed session, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes. that there's no members of the public who would like to, co to comment on items on our closed session. We will move into uh, our closed session and we will close the, the meeting uh, to members of the public. Pardon me, Mayor, um, there is a referral to closed session on your open session agenda. Yeah, you need a motion to add it to closed session. Oh. So it looks like, yeah. I'll move. I'll second. So it's a motion <laughs> by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by Mayor Cummings, to move an item to closed session, which is city-owned vacant parcels on Front Street. So I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote for the item. Thank you. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. So with that, uh, I guess we can move into our closed session. So if there's any uh, staff or members of the public who um, are currently on and don't need to be on for closed session, we ask that you can, that you please come back during the open session portion of our meeting. Mayor, this is Laura. There's a, an attendee mm -hmm. on the list right now. Okay. That's not a panelist. Okay. We may need to get started here. Oh, Councilmember Matthews, are you on the line? I'm online. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, we can yeah. hear you now. I, I took your word at a break. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's go ahead and get started so we can get okay. through this. Yeah. All right. So, good afternoon and welcome to our 12:30 p.m. session of the August 25th, 2020 meeting of the City Council. I have a few meetings and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and is streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely, and I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wishing to speak on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone. Please note that there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's time for public comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak during public comment, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes, and you may hang up once you've commented on your item of interest. And with that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. 
Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Council Member Byers? Aye. Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Here. Watkins? Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings. Here. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land upon which we gather is unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking UP tribe. The Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. Uh, before we begin with uh, our presentations, I just wanted to take a moment to say a few words uh, regarding the uh, CZU fires that have been uh, occurring in our mountains. In a year when our community has been so negatively impacted, impacted by COVID-19, we are now faced with another crisis. After a lightning event on August 15, 2020, forest fires were able to establish and rapidly spread across the San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. To date, 78,869 acres have burned, 70,000 residents have had to evacuate, with the fire contained at 17% um, currently. Our hearts go out to all the people who have lost their homes due to this event and to those who have had to evacuate. I'd like to thank all the firefighters, public safety officers, and first responders for all that they're doing to help put out the fire, get people out to safety, and protect remaining property. I would also like to thank all the city and county staff who have been working diligently to set up evacuation centers and, com and connect people to necessary resources. And I would especially like to thank our community for the outpouring of donations and volunteering from individuals, businesses. And as the year 2020 has really been testing our ability to overcome adversity, and we are continuing to demonstrate our ability to come together as a community, to unite, to support one another, and we could not ask for more from our community. We, your local representatives, are meeting with our state and federal partners to get as many resources as possible, knowing that our recovery will take a long time. We are here to support all of our residents and neighbors in the county, and we'll do everything it takes to continue providing support during these difficult times. For information and resources, please remember you can visit the City of Santa Cruz website and click on the link for fire resources, and also visit the County of Santa Cruz website and visit their fire resources page as well. Between the impacts of COVID-19 and the fires, now more than ever, we need to come together as a community to support one another. And I want to thank everybody for the hard work they've been doing during these difficult times. And with that, um, we'll move on to the first items on our agenda, starting with the um, proclamation of David King Month in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, so uh, this is a proclamation for June 16, 2020. Whereas David King, a native of Del Norte, Colorado, was born on June 16, 1951. And whereas David King was a man who was larger than life itself, beloved by an array of surfers, volleyball players, paddle boarders, so full of goodwill that his love and light would truly fill any space that he was in, an ambassador, a true waterman, a graceful surfer, a pioneer of paddle boarding, who, he, who himself became a monster paddler, and a commanding presence on any sport, sporting playing field. And whereas since its inception in 1988, David King was a mainstay in Ride a Wave, he believed those in the program were the kind of people that he wanted to surround himself with, and that he was meant to help others surf and enjoy their lives in a healthy way. The Ride Away kids loved him and would light up when he strolled across the beach towards them. And whereas David King dedicated his life to others, but no one took the place of his twin daughter, Brianna, and Sean King. He was madly in love with them and always said that there were never words powerful enough to describe the love that they had for each other. He was also the beloved grandfather of Nico Dior King, 
Grafinga, and Gianna Sophia King. And whereas on, June, on July 3rd, 2020, David King passed away just before 5 in the morning in the comfort of his home, surrounded by his loved ones, beautiful flowers, and paddle in hand. After all, it was the Dawn Patroller's favorite time of the day. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim June 16, 2020, as David King Day in the City of Santa Cruz, and urge all citizens to join the annual celebration of his life to honor, love, and remember the loss of a gentle giant of a man who was always more comfortable serving his community than shining in the spotlight at his own paddle out on August 8, 2020 at Cowles Beach. And if there's any council members who'd like to speak on this, I'd like to just open up if anyone has a few things they'd like to say as well. I'll just say a couple of words. Um, yeah, Dave King, um, uh, I did not know well. Um, we had common friends for many years, um, other servers who unfortunately have passed as well. And uh, But I do know Dave's work with Right Away, which is um, serves um, handicapped kids and kids that are, um, have physical so that they would otherwise not be able to get in the ocean, much less actually experience the um, have the experience of surfing a wave. And so, um, right a wave was born on Cal's Beach. It's a um, it's a huge um, event for the surfing community as well as um, many many others. Um, and also, Shared Adventures was one of the um, founding groups in doing this event. So, um, Dave. Dave was part of the team that really made right away impactful for kids, uh, hundreds of kids every year. So wanted to recognize him and also just express my condolences to his family and all the people who loved him. He certainly was a, a very big presence in our community and did a lot of really wonderful things. So thanks. Thanks, Mayor Cummings. Thank you. There's no further comments from council members. We'll move on to our next proclamation, which I'm very excited to present today, which is uh, proclaiming the celebration, the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote. And so I'll make the proclamation. We also have Dorothy Fry, Vice President of the League of Women Voters here joining us today to say a few words after the proclamation. And so I'm, uh, I'll read a few of the whereas is. Uh, whereas in 1848, suffragists began their organized fight for women's equality when they demanded the right to vote during the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls, New York. And whereas on May 21st, 1919, the United States House of Representatives finally approved the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, which guaranteed women the right to vote. And two weeks later, the United States Senate followed and the 19th Amendment went to the states to be ratified. And whereas on August 26th, 1920, Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby issued a proclamation declaring the 19th Amendment ratified and part of the United States Constitution, forever protecting American women's rights to vote. And whereas the bold, courageous, and powerful women who fought for the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution deserve special celebration by the city of Santa Cruz, especially on the 100th anniversary of its ratification in 2020. And whereas the 19th Amendment did not guarantee suffrage for all women, including Native Americans who did not gain the right to vote until 1924, and Asian Pacific Islander Americans until 1952, African American and Latino Americans suffered voter suppression until passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and 1975. And whereas the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution has played an important role in advancing the rights of all women to vote, and today, more than 68 million women vote in elections because of the courageous suffragists who never gave up the fight for equality. And whereas even in the year 2020, American citizens continue to fight against voter suppression to ensure that everyone has the right to vote and access to the democratic process. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim August 26, 2020, as the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution Day in the city of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in celebrating the 100th anniversary of the passage and ratification of the 19th Amendment, providing for women's suffrage to the Constitution of the United States, 
honoring the role of the ratification of the 19th Amendment in furthering promoting the core values of our democracy as promised by the Constitution of the United States and reaffirming the opportunity for students and adults in the country to learn about and commemorate the efforts of the women's suffrage movement and the role of women in our democracy and our desire to continue to strengthen democratic participation and to inspire future generations to cherish and preserve the historic precedent established under the 19th Amendment. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dorothy Fry, Vice President of the League of Women Voters, um, if you'd like to say any words on this uh, very special day that will be tomorrow. Oh, you're muted, by the way. Okay. Um, thank you, Mayor Cummings and the Santa Cruz City Council. Um, I accept this proclamation on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Santa Cruz County. Um, as this proclamation proclaims, this honors the 100th anniversary of the passage and ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States for women's suffrage. The League of Women Voters, founded in 1920, is a nonpartisan organization encouraging voters to be informed, to register, and to vote. And the local branch of the League was founded in Santa Cruz uh, over 50 years ago and continues this work today. Thank you very much. Thank you as well. And I'd like to invite any of our council members if they'd like to say any words, because um, this is a very special day. Mary, if I may, I just want to thank you, Dorothy, and uh, the members for your work and for continuing the fight for our rights to vote. And as we see in this upcoming election, we still have to continue to work so hard to ensure that members of our community can access voting. And we can never lose sight of that. So I appreciate this moment to pause and reflect on our gains and our victories and the acknowledgement that not uh, 100 years ago was the right for all women to vote and that we still had to work to receive uh, women of color's right to vote uh, less than, you know, nearly uh, 70 years ago, right? And so here we are continuing to uh, have a battle for uh, us to participate in democracy. And um, I want to thank all those who are, one, raising awareness and two, continuing to do the good work to ensure that it's happening. So thank you for allowing this moment. Thank you, Councilman Watkins. All right, if there's no further questions or comments, Dorothy, again, thank you um, for receiving this proclamation and for all the hard work you do. And with that, um, we'll continue on with our regularly scheduled meeting. Okay, so I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be open for public comment. Please note that public comment is heard only on items Council is taking action on and not regular updates or reports. Items will be open to the public today are numbers 7 through 23 on our agenda with the exception of item number 18. With that, I'd like to ask the council members if there are any sta statements of disqualification today. Yes. Yes. Councilmember Matthews, you, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Trying to punch all the right buttons. Yes, uh, I am disqualified, uh, which I have notified uh, you and the clerk about on item number um, 22, last item on the agenda, and I'll make the appropriate announcement at that time. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask the city clerk if there's any additions or deletions. There are not, no. Uh, regarding oral communications, oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item number 23. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item number 23. Next item on our agenda is the city attorney report on closed session. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report out on closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the city council. 
Um, this morning, the council met in closed session to uh, consider two items of uh, discussion. Prior to going into closed session, the council referred vacant parcels known, num, uh, designated as APNs 0051548, 0051549, 0051550, uh, which are all located along Front Street, um, into closed session. Uh, item two, the council received a report from the city attorney's office of an item involving significant exposure to litigation. There was no reportable action on that item. <laughs> item three, the council received a report from its negotiator, Bonnie Lipscomb, on an expression of interest on the part of SCFS Venture LLC in acquiring city-owned properties uh, that were referred to closed session, including uh, parcels known as parking lot 11 and a small undeveloped, undeveloped parcel on the corner of Laurel and Front Streets. Again, APN 0051548, 34, and 35. And directed the staff to obtain an appraisal of those parcels and to return to the council at a future meeting uh, with a report on the appraisal and uh, additional information. There was no other uh, action discussed or reportable action in the closed session. Thank you very much. Um, this time I'd like to call on the city manager to report and pro provide updates on city events and business items. Thank you, Mayor. I've got uh, two reports today, um, one on the um, fire response, and I'm gonna have uh, Chief Hyduke and our water director, Rosemary Menard, provide updates on, on that item. And then after they're done with their presentations, um, I'm gonna do an update on the library mix use project. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Chief Hyduk to give an update on the fire response. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, Jason Hyduk, Fire Chief for the City of Santa Cruz. Um, as you know, we've had a very significant fire uh, just in our backyard. Um, it's been a weeks long event and I expect that it will continue on uh, the initial phase for the next week or so and then it'll be a months long process. And even though um, I recognize that the city itself has not been directly impacted, we have absolutely been impacted just because of the interconnectedness of our community. Um, all of us have uh, loved ones, friends, families um, who have uh, suffered a significant loss or have been displaced. Um, and so I wanna recognize that when I'm talking about the city itself, uh, that this, this is still an ongoing event and um, that we need to support the greater community as a whole. Um, Bonnie, if you could share uh, the, the uh, map that um, I sent to you earlier. So um, I'm gonna talk about the city response as a whole and then I can take questions. Uh, this incident started, and for us, um, City Fire Department, we were drawn into it uh, very early on, uh, either through uh, helping Felton manage this or through the number of people that uh, we assigned to the incident. We still have three engines assigned to this incident, and we also have a number of overhead positions that we're filling either in the base camp or um, in, in other areas. What this map represents is uh, the city of Santa Cruz, and a number of the measures that we took uh, when we activated our emergency operations center, our EOC, working in conjunction with all of our city departments, um, public works, parks and rec, city managers, IT, um, Santa Cruz PD, um, the water department, and uh, really uh, trying to uh, get a handle on what impacts we could prevent and which ones that we needed to be prepared for. So if you look at our city map, the black lines represent uh, dozer lines or fire breaks that were put in place by CAL FIRE working with their incident management team to uh, prevent the spread of fire from coming uh, from a north to south direction. Um, I'm happy to say that those are in place and I don't think they're going to be needed. Um, the blue areas represent some of our really critical infrastructure within the city. Um, if the fire moved into those areas, we wanted to make sure that they did not suffer impacts. Our city landfill is now open again for uh, city use. It's not open to the public yet. And then we identified our, our water distribution. And as you know, we not only supply water for the city of Santa Cruz, but also to the greater county of Santa Cruz. Um, the UCSE uh, areas in red, 
they decided to uh, evacuate. It was not a uh, county or Santa Cruz City decision. Uh, they did that uh, within their facilities. And then the areas in green uh, represent uh, the areas that we went out in a proactive manner to uh, talk with the uh, people in those neighborhoods and so that they could harden their homes. And by harden, I mean take proactive steps to create defensible space and make it less likely that a fire, if it came into this area, would impact their homes. Uh, we covered uh, a significant portion of our community and I'm really proud of the collaborative approach that we took with the fire department, Santa Cruz PD, their volunteers, lifeguards, CERT. Uh, it was a pretty broad coalition. Um, and at this time, uh, the fire itself is not going to impact our city, but I would caution uh, everyone that we still are in wildland season. And so while this incident uh, may not come into the city, uh, we still have to get through September and October. And all of the measures that we took uh, for this incident, uh, I think need to be a wake up call that it's an ongoing effort that we need to continue with. Um, and I think that's uh, up for the update. I, we can stop sharing the map. And if you have specific questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer those. Thank you for that presentation. Um, are there any questions from council members at this time uh, for the fire chief? Okay. Seeing none, thank you again, thank Jason, you. for that update. Oh. I just want to say thank you to your, you and your team for everybody that went out and educated everybody within the city. I think it really put everybody's mind at ease knowing you know, how, what they could do to prepare even though the event of a citywide evacuation or even parts of the city were highly unlikely. But I think um, the effort but, you know, was well received. So thank you. Thank you. All right. With that, um, I'll turn it over to our water director, Rosemary Menard, to provide an update as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking a few minutes to kind of get a quick update about the status of our water system, as you know, uh, many of our facilities are not in town. So we've had a, a, a really um, a, a very interesting week and um, we continue to be watch, watchful of the fire that is in particularly the upper part of the basin. So I want to give you a quick update on the status and then the continued risks. Um, with the a cooperation, collaboration of the fire department staff, Every one of our key facilities in uh, the county, both in town and outside town, were um, investigated and inspected and recommendations were made for um, hardening the, the area around those, those facilities, clearing to make the more dispensable space. And so this is a just one photo of um, the U4 tank, which is a really key facility over on the west side uh, on Empire Grade Road. That this. This work basically happened between about noon on Friday and kind of noon on Sunday, uh, not just here, but a lot of these facilities. At our Graham Hill water treatment plant up on Graham Hill Road, uh, we did also similar kind of fire break and tree trimming, the, the stuff that you would do in a typical urban wild, wildland interface to create defensible uh, space around your facilities so that you know you can, uh, in, the in the event the fire comes closer, you're able to minimize the risk of damage to those really key facilities. Um, and I want to sort of talk to you for a second just about what the kind of risks uh, that have occurred in this area. So this is a, uh, these are photos of a five mile uh, HDPE pipeline, this big plastic pipeline that is uh, from Boulder Creek water system for the San Lorenzo uh, water system. And that area has burned as you probably are aware. And this five mile long pipeline is, this is what's left of it. You can see it's a melted mess or, uh, and it's basically interrupted their ability to bring water into the system from that source until that pipeline is replaced. So we do have a uh, similar pipeline above the ground in our Lydell uh, watershed, which is, um, this is a map of all the watersheds in the county. And it's really good because it helps kind of put things in, in perspective. Uh, this is the Lydell uh, watershed, which is really important to us. And we are continuing to uh, protect that watershed, have uh, water coming in from that watershed uh, in one, some segments of that pipeline are, as in the case of the, um, the Boulder Creek pipeline, 
uh, are in fact above ground and are that same kind of material, so very vulnerable. Uh, we also take water from Laguna. This, this watershed has been impacted. We know there's a burn area in this watershed, and so we'll be watching to, uh, for the opportunity to get in there and do damage assessment. And then we take water from majors, although this particular watershed has been offline since last winter uh, because there's a, a major pipeline problem in that area that we haven't been able to uh, prioritize to get fixed at this point. Um, I really want to, though, talk to you more about the San Lorenzo Basin because this is the source of the most of our supply, uh, both our Loch Lomond watershed, uh, which is our surface water storage for our peak season, and about 45 percent of our total supply comes from this watershed. And I think this map really helps to put that in perspective. Looking at our um, at the watershed boundary from our Tate intake at the on uh, River Street, it's about 73,000 acres, and about 18 percent of that watershed has, in fact, been affected by the burn area. So even though we didn't cross over to get into the Loch Lomond Basin, which has been a blessing and certainly dodging a huge bullet. We are not out of the woods with respect to the potential long-term water quality, uh, water supply potential impacts associated with the burn area in our watershed. And uh, I do want to sort of just talk to you about, just for a second, just on yesterday, what we, the, the source waters that we had in, Lydell from the North Coast, Loch Lomond, San Lorenzo River, Tate Wells, which are uh, at the at the, across from Coast Pump Station on River Street and then the Belt uh, Treatment Plant and Wells, uh, fully, you know, 70 plus percent of our total supply is at risk can, still with this fire because until it's out, uh, it's, not, it's not over for us. And this is a lovely picture uh, of our Laguna diversion. The before picture, we haven't been able to get into the watershed, so we don't know what the after picture looks like, but um, we will be doing that very soon, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Rosemary, for that presentation, and thank you to all the folks in the water department as well who've been working so hard during this really difficult time. Um, any council members have questions? Vice Mayor Myers. Thanks, uh, Rosemary, for that update. Um, do we? Are, are, do you anticipate? I mean, how do you plan? I, so I guess my main concern, right, is the winter. The winter ahead of us, which you know, based on what we all know, can happen in the Santa Cruz Mountains in terms of rain. Right. Um, how? Do you, do you, I mean, I'm sure that you guys have um, a contingency sort of operational plan, but can you foresee, um, I mean, kind of what's your projection? I mean, if, if, if the mountain, you know, we've got the full burned area above our three intakes on the north coast, and then we have the San Lorenzo watershed, not the entirety of the watershed coming into Loch Lomond, but a good part of it coming into Loch Lomond has been burned. Um, what can we do to either secure um, federal funds through NRCS or, you know, what are the kinds of things that we can do as, as council members to advocate to try to get some watershed protection and restoration funds on the ground for, for our, right. to protect our, our watersheds? I think the very first thing is to um, bring in the, the watershed assessment teams, and there are both uh, state and federal versions of those, and I know that CAL FIRE has already lined up uh, uh, one of those to come in and start actually doing the damage assessment. And we will be working with them, obviously, to prioritize the watershed lands that affect water supply for our communities uh, for early action. So that's number one. I think number two, I know that, um, there, that the governor, uh, the legislature, the Senate actually is looking at some opportunities, the California Senate, for some funding that would really help to put resources in place for restoration activities. And so I think that there's obviously, uh, that's a huge opportunity for us. I think the, the state Senate is trying to act before the end of this week when they go out of session to see if they can make some progress on that. So to the extent that anybody has contacts with uh, folks there, I think it would be great for us to reach out and you know, make it known that restoration funds are gonna be really important to us. Um, 
a lot of uh, what we're doing now, we, we started this yesterday. We actually have started this before yesterday, but we did convene a call with the Waterworks Foundation, the Waterworks uh, Research Foundation, which is a, a real clearinghouse of this kind of research that's been going on for particularly the last 20 years in most of the West, Colorado and, and California, big players, but other places as well, looking at the, how to deal with the impacts of wildfire on drinking water uh, systems and resources. The most recent work that's come out of this group is focused on some of the distribution system assets that happen. The Santa Rosa and Napa fires had a lot of melting toxic material going down into their, you know, contaminating their soils. And that, there's a whole set of issues that we dodged because we didn't have the, um, the fire in our, in our distribution, in our, you know, water service area. And then there's also a number of really great uh, uh, products that have come out over the last several years. One I just handed off to my treatment staff this afternoon that really has looked very carefully at what kind of water quality changes will you see sort of immediately longer term and then how to plan for uh, adapting your treatment process for that. So these are all things that, you know, this is a big focus, not that we weren't sitting, we were sitting on our hands over here, but, you know, we turned our attention to um, these issues as a high priority emergency response planning, recognizing that, you know, we have three or four months to do what, any of the things that we can do to get ourselves ready to be able to operate in the event of much higher turbidities, much higher um, uh, total organic carbon coming into the system as a result of the kind of del deluge and debris flows and, uh, you know, kind of uh, slopping off of uh, increased water flows and what have you coming off of the burned areas. Yeah, and I'll just, um, so thank you. Um, the Mayor Cummings and I met with um, Congressman Panetta this morning, um, and we mentioned the need for federal monies to come in through NRCS, Soil Conservation Service, um, anything that could be brought in from EPA watershed programs. So we just reminded him about basically that we operate the water system for almost half the population in the county. So um, nice. we did make a plug this morning for um, any kind of federal programs that could match any state state monies coming out. So um, thank you. And, uh, uh, yeah, I don't envy you the next three or four months. <laughs> but thank you, and thanks, thanks to everybody on the water staff and um, fire staff to – keep an eye not only on protecting everyone's homes, but also the infrastructure that provides our water every day. So thank you for all the work. We have, great, we have a great team. The city staff is a great team. Yeah. Are there any further questions for water director at this moment in time? Rosemary, I had one question. Um, do you have any sense of, I know that, you know, the fire is still burning, obviously, and can change at any moment. Do you have any sense of kind of timeline? You know, you mentioned that five-mile-long pipeline was melted. Um, do you have any sense of potential impacts to infrastructure and timeline around being able to assess those impacts and, and repairs? Well, I know that Rick Rogers, who's the general manager of the, um, the, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, has requested some assistance uh, with from what's called CalWARN, it's the mutual aid sort of a, a organization, to bring someone in to walk that pipeline route for, for their uh, system and to, um, and to come up with ideas for how to, you know, replace that in a kind of the quickest possible way. So that, that's certainly going to be their focus. I know that they have an inner tie um, with Scotts Valley Water District, um, the San Lorenzo Valley does, and I know that they, uh, I think they started to open that inner tie, but they had some other issues with it yesterday. But I think there are all those kind of, you know, sort of mutual aid kind of strategies also that could potentially bring water back into the Boulder Creek uh, service area um, more quickly than even you could bring the facility back online. I, I know they've had some other facilities damaged as well, so that pipeline was just a really good example of something that we have a similar risk to, but they obviously got the worst of it so far in the in terms of the impacts to their water system facilities. Okay, 
Good. Thank you. Okay. There are no further questions. Uh, thank you again, Rosemary and Martine. I think you had another report or item to report on. And you're muted, by the way. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so just to c complete the, uh, the fire response related item, uh, I too just wanted to, uh, well, a couple of things. One is to note that uh, the fire um, uh, incident is, is not over. There's much more that, that continues to need to happen. And uh, while the city is uh, we're out of the, uh, the danger with respect to the direct fire impact uh, at this point in time, and we're very fortunate uh, that we're able to do that, um, the city still continues to be a partner and to work on trying to address the, the, the situation um, with our partners. So we'll, we'll continue to um, facilitate the use of our Sky Park property uh, in Scotts Valley, which is being used as the main operation center for the fire. We'll continue to operate the Civic Auditorium as an evacuation center. And uh, we are also working to assist uh, businesses to perhaps do pop-up businesses uh, in, in the city, those uh, businesses that have been impacted in some of the, the fire areas. And, and as well, uh, continue to be a partners with the county and others to try to assist as, as best we can. So I just want to highlight that, and there'll be more of those efforts, I'm sure, in the coming days and, and weeks. And then finally, I really did want to acknowledge and thank the, uh, first of all, Chief High Duke, uh, as well as all the city staff from all departments and at all levels who came together upon the activation of our emergency operations center, uh, including actually uh, volunteers uh, and uh, retired uh, fire personnel. Uh, they all deserve a great amount of gratitude for coming in and doing an incredible job of protecting the city. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, so thank you. So. With that, I'll move on to the second item, and that is just an update on the library housing mixed use project. Um, you'll recall that the council provided direction on coming back to, uh, to you on updates on various uh, uh, points in time or threshold uh, uh, items with respect to that project. Martina, and so, before, before yeah. we start, I, I think uh, Councilmember Byers had her hand up for a question oh, sure. on the previous item. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, Marty, I just want to um, tell me what's going on with the shelters. Uh, there weren't that many in the city itself, but I'm sure there's some kind of report or something. Are they full? Are they starting to empty? Do we need more? Uh, yes. Uh, my understanding is that the, the county was able to stand up um, capacity to about 2,000 uh, evacuees throughout the county uh, from Santa Cruz down to Watsonville. Uh, but at this time, they were at about uh, 1,100 uh, in terms of need. And so they actually were starting to scale back some of those um, as a result, but are ready to scale them back up if needed. I think the, uh, the issue will be because, you know, these, these evacuation centers really are, are not adequate for even temporary ongoing kinds of sheltering. Um, and so that, I think, will, will have to be the transition to how do we get more temporary, uh, ongoing, uh, appropriate type of shelters, and I'm sure those discussions will happen about how to do that. Uh, we had that conversation with uh, Jimmy Panetta and whether the, uh, the federal government could assist in that regard. Uh, but for now, um, there seems to be enough capacity. I think a lot of individuals uh, really made use of family and friends throughout the county. Sure. Virtually all of us know someone who was helped or uh, assisted in one form or another. Uh, but at this point, as, as I understand, the, uh, the, the capacity is, 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 is there. Okay. Yeah, I guess I was thinking long term, so many people will need rentals, family rentals or things. And, uh, yes. Because yes. what you hear is still going to be a few weeks maybe for some right. people right. evacuated. Or some uh, semi-temporary uh, facilities, yeah. trailers, hotel rooms. Uh, that's yeah, one. that's okay. That's exactly right. Yes. Okay. And I'll just, I'd just like to follow up by mentioning that this morning when we met with Congressman Panetta, we brought that up as, you know, the need for long term because for people who can't go back to their homes, um, whether they've burned or whether the roads, um, you know, the bridges have been burned out or the conditions are such that they can't go back, there's going to be a need for longer term housing. So we discussed uh, the FEMA trailers and just expressed the need for funding so that we can um, ensure that people who lost their homes will have somewhere to stay and that we're not increasing our homeless population here in Santa Cruz. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And also to point out that the, uh, the county has a, a very, very good uh, website uh, where you can go and get information on 
uh, information and resources, particularly on sheltering. That does yes, great. Great. Yeah. great. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins, did you have a question? On, did you have your hand up for this item, or was it for the library item? It was for this item. I'll, okay. I'll be brief. Yeah, I um, I know that we're behind time, so I, I'll try to be brief, because I think this is a really, obviously a really big conversation. Definitely want to echo the um, appreciation and sincere, sincere gratitude to everybody who's been working around the clock to protect our city and our county. Um, I guess my question, I guess, would be uh, in regards to volunteers who are wanting to uh, contribute and give back, how is the city directing folks at this time? I know at one point it was full. Are you directing people to the Volunteer Center and the Community Foundation? What's sort of the latest on ways people can contribute and give? Uh, yes, uh, we are, uh, I think, uh, directing people to the uh, Volunteer Center. Um, as well as to the, the, the county, uh, and they also have a, a site on that. Uh, I don't know if uh, Jason, you have any more information on that, but but yes, it's uh, to ensure that it's all coordinated um, with respect to the community foundation, with respect to uh, certainly uh, fundraising and, and supporting financially, and then the volunteer center with respect to volunteering, as far as helping directly uh, in, in different ways that are that are available. Okay, and then I guess my last question is. Uh, sadly, this is happening amongst, uh, you know, pandemic, and we've been sheltering in place and trying not to uh, mix with other households. Is there concern that there will be an increase in COVID cases as a result of, of this uh, natural disaster? You know, it's, it's hard to say, although, um, you know, it, it wouldn't necessarily be surprising, obviously, because you're mixing more people. Uh, the extent of it, I think, it's, it's, again, at this point, I think it's difficult to, to assess. Uh, I know there's been a considerable effort to try to prevent it. Um, we uh, toured the Civic Auditorium, for example, this morning uh, with uh, Congressman Panetta, and they have pretty stringent procedures around uh, social distancing. Also, you know, they, they ask you questions about uh, your health conditions and, and, and try to do as much uh, uh, you know, filtering and mitigation, the, the tent, there's individual tents, they're spread out. So there's quite a few procedures, the capacity is not as high as it could be, for example, in place to try to mitigate it. Um, so I don't think we have any, any clear data on that, uh, but, but certainly uh, it, it has forced individuals to uh, socialize more than they would otherwise. You know, there's people who have to move in with relatives or with friends uh, and that sort of thing, which makes it uh, more difficult. So I think we'll find out uh, probably in the coming weeks or months. Thank you. All right. If there's no further questions from council members, um, we can move on to the next item on the city manager's report. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. I kind of rushed it towards this one. Uh, so you'll recall again that the council has provided direction on, on coming back to you and, and providing updates on the library housing mixed use project. And uh, what, one of the directions was, that we received was for this meeting, which is to return with an update on the RFP and RFQ process. And so following council direction, the Economic Development Department released an RFP, a request for proposals for an owner's representative. This is on July 27th. The proposals are due back on Thursday, August 20th, and staff is currently reviewing the proposals and is working towards having a contract in place by the first or second week in September. And we received a robust response uh, to the RFP, and Amanda uh, has been reviewing proposals uh, and uh, interviews should start later this week. So that'll be coming back to you. Then as far as the next direction was for uh, three months out, uh, which would put us at the second meeting in September for the, the, the next follow-up. And that will include uh, detailed financial information regarding each component of the mixed use project, a work program and timeline for implementing the affordable housing units, library and parking garage to include a public engagement process. And uh, thirdly, general schematics showing the integration of the library, housing, parking, and commercial use components. So as I noted, uh, we're still in process of getting the owner's rep under contract. Uh, so we actually may need uh, to be co come back to council at the, the next meeting with some additional context and a request for more time for the above di direction. So, th but those are the, the steps that we'll be coming back to you with, with updates. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members at this time regarding the library mixed use project? Okay. Seeing none, 
Um, thank you for those reports, and we'll, move, we'll continue moving through our agenda. So next item on our agenda <clears throat> uh, is the meeting calendar. I'd like to ask the clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. We have no addition. Okay. Next item is our consent agenda. These are items number 7 through 16 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items number 7 through 16. Instructions are on your screen. And please remember to mute your streaming device. Uh, press star 9 to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying that you've been unmuted when it's your time to speak. All the items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. At this time, are there any council members who'd wish to pull any items from the agenda? See council member Byers and then council member Brown. Yes, um, I'd like to pull number seven, which is the emergency ordinance uh, that happened between our council meetings uh, having to do, of course, with the uh, vendors on Beach Street. So I'd like to pull that. Okay. So item number seven is been pulled. Council Member Brown. Yeah, I have uh, just a question on the on item eight. Okay. And then I have a question on item number thirteen regarding the wharf. It might be fourteen now, I think, because of the adjustment to our our agenda. Okay, so why don't we start with those questions on items number eight and the item related to the wharf. So Council Member Brown, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, I um, I read the, uh, this is about the updating the bail schedule. And so I read the agenda report and it wasn't entirely clear to me uh, why the change in 13.04011C um, in the code there, that's in park after hours, uh, an increase from 30 to $50 uh, for being in a park after hours citation. And I'm, I'm just trying to understand why this is included here, why we're doing this, um, and is this really an, uh, a move that's going to actually achieve the goal in any way. I mean, I, it's just hard for me to understand. So just help me understand what, why that's here in addition to the other two, which are um, clearly related to the current uh, kind of emergency situation that we're in. Yeah, this, this item um, is one that, uh, if you recall, over the past few years, we bring these periodically to the council, sometimes to incorporate new language uh, or new um, provisions of the municipal code to the bail schedule, other times when we just identify a discrepancy or an issue, and this is the, the latter, um, in that um, a, a $50 fine is specifically called out in subsection D of 13.04.011. Um, and so we just um, wanted to make it clear. Oh, just very quickly, I want to follow up. I'm not sure how to do this, but I'm, I'm going to be registering a no vote on that particular piece. And should I just say that when the time comes? I just, I don't, I don't yeah. agree with that. I, I wouldn't can register a no vote on item eight. Just, yeah, okay, thanks. I had a question related to item number 14, which is, um, related to the permitting of wharf small boat landing and south landing projects. I don't know if Bonnie is on. Or maybe, Mark. yeah. So I was just curious, um, some members of the public had reached out on this item because they were curious about the status of the wharf master plan and when that item will be scheduled to go to the planning commission. So we are um, actually coordinating that right now um, and working also, we had some interest in that going before um, the Parks and Rec Commission. So we're trying to coordinate with the Planning Commission and get to council as soon as possible. The public review period has closed for that 
And so we're, we're, we're wrapping up those details, and um, we anticipate within the next you know, month and a half, um, and probably in September, we would go to the Planning Commission and um, as soon as we can schedule it after that, um, depending on what the direction is from the Planning Commission, um, we would schedule it for the City Council. Okay. The September Planning Commission date is September 17th. Thanks, Lee. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay, so at this point in time, um, if there are any comments from the community, now is the time to comment on any items with the exception of item number seven that's on our consent agenda. So if you'd like to comment on any item on our consent agenda with the exception of item number seven, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and um, you will be unmuted and given two minutes to speak. numbers are 2003 you are on the line and you have two minutes to speak huh, what are the chances of that I'm Nora Hockman I have two comments uh, the first is I hope you all recognize the irony of celebrating uh, Susan B Anthony and the hundredth uh, marking the hundredth anniversary of the women's right to vote but let's be clear this country has still not passed the Equal Rights Amendment. Locally, you all have messed with the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women kind of shamefully. And just today, I heard Council Member Myers, Council Member Cummings, and General Man uh, the City Manager Bernal refer to Jimmy Panetta as Congressman Panetta. You all ought to be ashamed of yourselves. I'm here to speak in opposition to the uh, emergency ordinance that was unilaterally issued by the uh, city manager, Martine Bernal, rescinding all legal permits and the ability to vend on Beach Street. Um, I cannot can I, understand. Can I stop you for one second because we're, we're going to vote. That item still hasn't been, we're going to pull that item from consent. And so right now it's items, numbers, um, with the exception number seven, eight through 16. And so once we vote on those items, we're actually gonna come back to discuss that and you'll have an opportunity to comment on that item at that time. Did I know that when you just opened the microphone for me to speak? I just said it multiple times. So, um, but you'll have your two minutes if you um, would like to comment on that item after we vote on yeah. items number eight through 14. Yeah. Um, seeing as there's no members of the public who would like to speak to us on items 8 through 14, um, we'll go ahead and bring it back to Council for action and deliberation. So uh, is there a Council member who would be willing to move the consent items numbers 8 through 14? Council member Byers. If you can unmute your microphone too. I move the consent agenda items 8 to 14. Okay. Approval. Uh, we have a motion by Councilmember Byers. Councilmember Matthews, I see your hands raised. She'll say it. I'll, I'll second the motion. Okay. So we have a motion made by Councilmember Byers. Seconded by Councilmember Matthews to move consent items numbers 8 through 14. I'll turn it over to the clerk to uh, call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Um, Matthews? Aye. Brown? I, with the exception of uh, the change to code 13.04.011C in the bail schedule revisions, I'm registering a no vote on that change. Um, Boulder? 
Aye. Watkins? Aye. Myers? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. So that passes. So items numbers 9 through 14 pass unanimously. And item number 8 passes with council members Golder, Matthews, Byers, Watkins, Vice Mayor Myers, and myself voting in favor, and by, um, Council Member Brown voting opposed. It's actually it, um, consent goes through to item 16. Oh, my apologies. Yeah. Item number 16. Sorry. Okay, with that, um, item number 7 was pulled by Council Member Byers, so I'll turn it over to you, Council Member Byers. Well, thank you, and uh, I see uh, city manager is before us. I um, just did why, well, many reasons I pulled it, but I guess I called Martin, the city manager, right away because we had just so worked on the ordinance and, you know, making in line with state um, policy, state law, and I thought we did a lot of tweaking that would sort of resolve some of the issues that we were hearing on a daily basis and certainly from our police department. Uh, so I was just kind of, it just hit me. I was surprised. And then I know you all know uh, instantly there's been a lot of pushback on it. And uh, just it's worth a conversation. Um, to, uh, I felt it was worth a conversation to see where we are now, how long is it going to be. So many people are depending on it's their income. And is there a way that we can work it out with uh, to get them back up? earning some money. So anyway, that and I know I talked to Martine about this, so I'm sure he's got some answers for me. Yeah, at least. I'll, uh, I'll um, do a little bit of background and then a kind of a status as, as to where we are. We are. So in, in June, we received some uh, concerns uh, uh, from individuals regarding primarily social distancing uh, uh, with uh, vendors on Beach Street. Um, and uh, I issued an executive order, which the council ratified subsequently, that uh, established some social distancing guidelines uh, uh, with respect to uh, using sanitizer, wearing masks, you know, keeping distances. Uh, whereas primarily, what the what the um, uh, conditions that were uh, put in place on Beach Street, uh, again, to really um, prevent the, the spread of, of the of the Corona 19 virus or the COVID 19 virus. Um, subsequently, then, uh, and also uh, just to uh, point out to our staff uh, from our code enforcement uh, division in the planning department, work to, with the vendors to achieve compliance with that by assisting them with uh, obtaining their business licenses, uh, translation services, putting them in contact with the health department to ensure that they had the appropriate permits, uh, and then just working with them on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that they complied with the distancing requirements uh, there. So there was quite a bit of work done early on to work with the vendors to to achieve uh, compliance with the, the initial uh, executive order. Uh, subsequent to that, um, in addition, uh, spaces were demarked uh, uh, to, uh, again, provide for more guidance and assistance with the social distancing. Uh, then subsequent to that, uh, we uh, work really hard to try to achieve compliance, uh, both uh, the uh, code enforcement and the police department uh, when the code enforcement was not able to be out there and just found it very difficult to do that. We continue to receive concerns around social distancing. Um, and so as a result of just the, the, the various challenges with uh, really just a large number of vendors that really want to be in an area that's pretty limited and where you have a lot of interactions there, with uh, with pedestrians, with bicyclists, uh, and individuals you know, wanting to to, uh, to sell their goods, uh, it became very very difficult to uh, try to uh, also uh, to uh, enforce uh, again given you know the lack of resources to be able to do 24/7 enforcement um, and and uh, just the difficulty in trying to achieve compliance. Um, I issued a subsequent executive order to. Uh, essentially prohibit uh, the street vending there uh, through October uh, 1st uh, of this year. Uh, and part of the idea around that was to try to provide an opportunity to have conversations around how to best achieve trying to uh, 
to work something out because the city, as you know, uh, based on state uh, uh, law, you know, we have an obligation and duty to allow for street venting. It's you know, individuals have a right to do that. And so our our responsibility and our objective and goal is to try to achieve it in a way that, that works for the community, uh, both in terms of the pandemic, but also just in general with respect to all the other health and safety aspects around trying to have all these activities in, in a very limited space. So uh, that was really why the second additional uh, executive order was issued to do that. And then also subsequent to that, uh, we did have uh, community bridges reach out to us and offer to facilitate discussions between the vendors in the city to see if we can come up with uh, a way to, to achieve that. Is there a way we can work with the vendors to create a system uh, or process in place? Uh, because even between the vendors, it, became, it was very competitive. We had vendors, for example, that uh, were out there very, very early and would take up all the spaces, and then you had other vendors that weren't able to do that, and it became difficult for them to be able to do what they wanted to do uh, without the, uh, you know, being out there at three o'clock in the morning and, and that sort of thing. So I think there really is a need to kind of sit down with the vendors uh, and uh, with neighboring businesses and others to try to come up with a system that, that will work, uh, not only just in the, in the pandemic environment, but also moving forward because some of these crowding conditions will continue and some of these conflicts I think will continue even post the pandemic period and consistent with the regulations that the council adopted uh, with the revised ordinance. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, my understanding is that the community bridges have reached out and we're currently working on scheduling uh, meetings uh, to do that. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is uh, as a result of the um, uh, fact that the, uh, we are obviously not encouraging uh, tourism right now and we've asked individuals to, who are visiting to leave the county because of the fire, uh, as well as the, uh, we'll be uh, looking at closing beaches uh, during the uh, Labor Day weekend. Right now there really isn't the uh, advisable to, to, to encourage uh, you know, a, a lot of business activity in, in the beach at this point. That's another sort of consideration. But uh, it is an opportunity nonetheless uh, to, I think, to work with uh, vendors, uh, street vendors in particular, to come up with a, with a solution that will work uh, sort of post this difficult period that we have now and, and into the future. So that's where we're at, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, as well as the planning department and the police department. Just as a follow-up to that, I'll just mention that shortly after the uh, the executive order went out, I got in touch with um, with Ray Cancino from Community Bridges, and we started having these conversations. And we're, you know, we're really trying to figure out ways that we can, you know, create a system that will be compatible, you know, given the circumstances that we have under COVID, and just you know, with the concerns of crowding down in that area where. Um, we were seeing substantial amounts of people bottlenecking when they were walking through that area. And I personally almost got into a bike accident where um, a biker had been moving over to avoid running into a vendor and then came into oncoming biking traffic. So uh, some of the concerns around safety are real down there. And I just want people to know, members of the public, that you know we um, are taking people's concerns seriously and really are trying to facilitate this conversation around how can we create a system where there's compliance, where we can have vendors vending in a way that's going to be safe and compatible, especially under COVID-19. Uh, Council Member Brown. Well, uh, to say that I'm dismayed about the way that this executive order has been issued and utilized is an understatement, but I'll save my comments for afterwards. I'd like to hear from the public. I have questions, um, a series of questions. First, uh, why, given that the issue was is purportedly about Beach Street, why were why was enforcement targeting uh, vendors also walking on the beaches on the beach? What was how did that play into this? Because the concern that was expressed uh, was not really a concern that mm, was, you know, intended to for the, the beach, right? I mean, it was about the, the, the street there. So that's one. I also um, am uh, wondering, in terms of the issuing of the order, uh, my understanding is, and you mentioned, uh, Martine, that it was the there was translation and some other um, issues were kind of being worked out, um, yet the order was issued in English only. Why was it not issued in Spanish? 
um, and how was it conveyed to the uh, vendors prior to the enforcement action uh, when they were uh, removed. Uh, I think those are, and then you mentioned the program status or the status of conversations about a program and I'll uh, talk about that in comments. Oh, I have, I'm sorry, I have one other question. Um, why were, uh, I understand that people's uh, things were confiscated and I, um, and wondering why that was given that the um, the enforcement was around infractions and people had not abandoned their their stuff. Okay. So would you like me to answer this questions now or after the public comment? So I'm clear about that. I'm happy to do it either way. We generally do council member questions then public comment. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, yeah, so first with respect to the, the beaches, um, we did have concerns uh, at the beaches around uh, vending there as well, um, as far as, uh, again, being able to maintain social distancing there uh, with, with sales. Um, and also we had um, concerns regarding um, the storage of goods uh, on in tents uh, and supplies on the beach. Um, uh, that was another uh, concern and consideration. And also uh, we had, because again, because of the large number of competition of people uh, spending the night and uh, uh, also trying to, again, so they could be the first ones there to uh, be able to use the, the limited spaces. So uh, it was all around trying to, again, uh, ensure that uh, we had the conditions with that didn't uh, uh, provide for uh, the spread of the, of the virus. So that, that was the rationale for really the entire executive order and in, 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 in all the provisions that they're in. Uh, with respect to the, uh, the order, uh, the order was issued uh, uh, again in anticipation of uh, big crowds coming in before the weekend and, and trying to address it as quickly as we could. The first weekend it was issued, uh, it was all uh, done uh, first with trying to educate and inform individuals. Uh, citations weren't issued. Uh, uh, there were some instances where individuals were uh, arrested and, and uh, their items had to be moved, but it wasn't because of the vending uh, or violations of the order. It had to do with other uh, circumstances and I can ask the police chief to comment on those. So uh, with respect to the first weekend, uh, we did have our Spanish speaking we do have Spanish speaking code enforcement staff that have been out there on a regular basis already. Our code enforcement staff was very familiar with many of the vendors just from the, the initial set of, of interactions and from the first uh, executive order in terms of working with them on an ongoing basis. So there's been uh, quite a bit of interactions already with them relative to uh, the first uh, executive order. And so with the second executive order, uh, those relationships were there. Uh, and the, the, the intent was to communicate it uh, first before doing citation. So that was the approach that was used to uh, educate, inform, let them know uh, before any, any, site, any sites occurred. Uh, so I'll let uh, Andy talk about the confiscation, or the confiscated items that, that happened and, and the circumstances around those. Yeah, Councilmember Brown, I think it's important to know that uh, first of all, we spent almost two weeks uh, warning people and talking to them with our Spanish speakers down there. And for uh, two days, we deployed multiple people down on Beach Boardwalk, uh, talking to people before we started doing enforcement that week, including that week. And we're told that we were just gonna, they were just gonna outweigh us. And we can't, we couldn't continue to, you know, staff that permanently. So, uh, and we also, uh, by the way, also had the health department come down uh, to look at the hot dog vending and the health department told them that that was not acceptable uh, the way it was done, and that was continued also. So when it came to uh, confiscating materials, uh, there were two incidents where we uh, took materials from people. The first incident, uh, the person was arrested and taken to jail for other crimes. And uh, we asked people to, to, you know, who were related to the individuals to go ahead and pick up the stuff and take it and hang on to it. Nobody did, so after an extended period of time, we didn't want to leave the stuff there and have it stolen, so we uh, brought it back with us to the police department for safekeeping only. Later that afternoon, I came down and watched it uh, be given back uh, to the individuals in our back lot, and they got everything back 
uh, that, they, that was taken from them that same day. Uh, the following week, when a couple of items were taken, I believe it was a handful of umbrellas, uh, again, it was a different crime. It wasn't for the, uh, the uh, vending. It was uh, for a felony crime. And uh, that was taken and impounded as part of the uh, as part of evidence. So that a uh, couple of umbrellas were taken and uh, and kept. And uh, at whenever the case is disposed of, then the property can be given back. Uh, but it's one of those things where um, uh, I really felt like there was a lot of effort to be as patient and as uh, as uh, long suffering as possible. Councilman Brown. Yeah, I have a couple of follow-up. Thank you for that uh, that explanation. Uh, so a follow-up question, um, Chief Mills, you said, did I hear that you said that citations had been issued prior to the actions that were taken? Um, that was not my understanding from the conversations I had with, with vendors or with people who were working with the vendors. Um, so. Were there citations issued prior to the en the enforcement action that we then heard about uh, pretty pretty widely? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as uh, Mark, as the city manager mentioned, it was education first, enforcement second. So a great deal of education. Then it went to enforcement, and when we went to do the enforcement, the idea was to go ahead and write them citations right there, and then release them right there. Uh, however, the person being cited wasn't cooperative and wouldn't give us a name. So therefore, we had to take them uh, to a place where we could verify who they were. Once that was done, they were released. So um, the idea was to do cites first and then arrest second, yes, to answer your question. Thank you. And one more question, I think this might be for you, um, Martine. The, so I, I've also received considerable amount of communication about uh, asking why the vendors in particular were targeted when there is uh, a whole lot of other kinds of activity happening in the beach area on the beach with the brick and mortar uh, stores and restaurants that cause crowding. And um, so it, it appears uh, selective to be enforcing uh, with this particular group. And um, given that they are, um, you know, Mark, marginalized, um, primarily immigrant uh, members of, our, of the broader community or, or participants in our community's uh, economic activity, uh, you know, why, how it is that that, that was the, the focus and while other, um, you know, challenges are continuing to occur without action. Okay, sure. Uh, so the our primary focus is it's complaint based uh, as far as the responding, um, and so uh, and we we treat all businesses the same, whether it's street vendors uh, or whether it's, it's a business. So whenever we receive a complaint regarding uh, violations of the health order, uh, we follow up with them, and we've had some for you know, some businesses, uh, and so we follow up with the health officer. I've done a number of those myself, where we get them, um, and so. Uh, there really isn't a difference if, if there's violations in one business or another and, and a complaint is filed, uh, then we'll follow up on it, uh, whether, again, whether it's on the beach or whether it's a business if it's downtown or on the east side or really anywhere in the city. Um, in, in this particular case, obviously, the executive order was our own order, so the enforcement is, is our own staff. In, in other cases, it depends on whether it's a violation of the county health order, which might refer to the health department, and they do follow up with enforcement as well. Uh, and again, use a similar approach of informing, educating, and, and then citing if needed. Um, are there any other comments from council members at this time? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll open it up to public comment on this item. This is item number seven on our city council agenda. If you'd like to comment on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes to speak on this item. Just 
last four digits of your phone number are 7254. Yeah, please unmute and you have Hi, two minutes. I'm sorry, Mayor Cummings, that's a mistake. I'm waiting for number 19 to comment on. Oh, could you please can lower you, your... Can you mute me? Sure. Can you mute yeah. me? I can comment. Thank you. So next caller, last four digits are 0861. This is to comment on item number seven on our agenda. Uh, yes, this is Scott Graham. Um, good afternoon. Yeah, I have my own personal experience going down to Beach Street and buying some food from vendors down there was that the vendors were not the problem. They were uh, socially distancing from each other. They were all wearing masks. It was the day-tripping tourists that seemed to be the problem, that they're not wearing masks, they're not socially distancing. Um, so I don't know why the enforcement was against the people that were following the COVID-19 guidelines and instead of going after the people that were not following the COVID-19 guidelines, which are the day-tripping tourists. Um, it just seems somehow uh, wrong to go after the group that is following the guidelines instead of going after the group that's not following the guidelines. And as far as, um, you know, people rushing down there to get a spot, in Berkeley and also in San Francisco, the um, cities have assigned spots. So if you are a street vendor or even a street musician, you have an assigned spot and a time of day that you can be there. So uh, maybe working out a system like that will help. But I think, you know, enforcing the rules against the tourist is what needs to happen here, not against the vendors. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Reggie Meisler, um, and I just want to say I think this executive order should be struck down 2016. This is a racist executive order. It largely bans Latinx uh, street vendors who are largely immigrants um, from operating and contains incredibly offensive, untrue claims about vendors, uh, which are racist stereotypes, things like they're violent, getting in fights, intoxicated, dirty, that they can't follow food regulations. I mean, this is deeply offensive, and very little evidence has proven that this is the case. And this comes, this order comes shortly after the very public assault of a Latina hot dog vendor by a white business owner of the Falafel Hut. Chief Mills then went on TV to excuse that racist violence, suggesting that the hot dog vendor didn't have a permit. Uh, this is an area where tourists are constantly congregating, not wearing masks, on doing volleyball. Lines are forming around an ice cream truck, literally in the same area that's allowed to operate there. And so how is it more pragmatic to confiscate and arrest, confiscate the property of and arrest women and children than it is to just allow them to operate within state level uh, standards? Uh, many of the vendors aren't even selling food, but masks and umbrellas. Uh, now Bernal is saying that he's closing beaches for a weekend, so it doesn't matter. I mean, this is unacceptable. This isn't public health. This is a racist executive order in support of racist business owners. Uh, and so this is yet another example of an executive order where many, of many, where city manager Bernal has worked with Santa Cruz police to abuse the poor, be it homeless or Latinx street vendors, to the benefit of the capitalist class, be it brick and mortar businesses at the boardwalk or brick and mortar businesses downtown. Um, just yesterday, Santa Cruz police swept two houseless people from the post office, citing the city manager's ability to perform executive orders in just a generic sense. You know, there were literal protests in the street to support these vendors. There was a city during your budget study session. Enough of the do not authorize this executive order and defund police. Thank you. This 
is Abby Samuels. This is uh, addressed to um, the, a few of the statements that Andy Mills just made regarding the vendors and confiscating their items. I was on the beach as well as several other people to witness. The police drove up, and I have a video of this, and so do the police by their body cams. If they were turned on, that can be easily seen. They drove up. They did not talk to them. They got out of their they got out of the truck and they started taking all the items while two vendors were there and a little baby. That's all. There was no problems with social distancing. Um, and they grabbed all of their items without a discussion. And the only reason they released it is after several of us, including people from the ACLU, started writing. To the, to the city attorney, Martine, and Andy Mills, and it was released immediately. The second time that he was arrested, that was last Sunday. The second time it was arrested, uh, a week ago last Sunday, the second time that you made arrests was on Monday. The other arrests that you're speaking about, Andy, occurred after those other vendors got arrested for selling their items. The second arrest was two young vendors on the beach that the police had to drive back, to drive past to lifeguard station, passing tons of people partying on the beach, mostly white, not wearing masks, not keeping social distancing, and big parties with guitars and people sitting um, arm to arm. They had to pass by all those people to get to two vendors that were not, no one was around them. They were just walking down the beach, which can be seen on your video, and they arrested those two people. And all of their items were taken again, umbrellas, sand buckets, and boogie boards. Okay, I'm going to have to cut you off there. Thank you for your comments. Okay, next call, you're on the line. Hi, Council. This is uh, Ray Cancina from Community Bridges. Um, just calling in about this item. Um, we have been also inundated with um, a lot of um, community members concerned um, about the order and the impacts it has on vendors and the ability for them to make a living um, during this time. Uh, we know that a lot of people are struggling uh, to make ends meet, and a lot of the folks that are vending are trying to do just that. So. Uh, our goal is to try to play mediator uh, and have an opportunity for a rampant discussion where vendors and the city council staff can sit down um, and set clear expectations uh, about how to make this work um, with uh, the limitations that we have uh, based on city, st city spots. Um, as well as uh, current conditions based on COVID. So uh, in the following weeks, uh, we have already reached out um, to several of the vendors. We are still struggling to find all the vendors um, in order to have a discussion uh, via Zoom, but our goal is to get as many people in a uh, Zoom room as possible uh, to try to discuss uh, possible solutions um, to help address this and to help um, um, basically crawl, uh, call, crawl back uh, this executive order. Um, in a safe manner. So um, we're here to help support the city in any way, uh, as well as the vendors, uh, to try to find a, a mutual beneficial solution uh, for all of us. So uh, thank you again, and hope you are all safe uh, during this, uh, this time. My name's Madeline, and I'm calling in to urge the city council to not approve this executive order. It seems very one-sided and directed toward a certain group of people who are just trying to make a living. You know, we had closed our beaches earlier in the COVID uh, pandemic, and 
people just kept coming to the beach anyway, and law enforcement kind of threw up their hands and were like, this isn't what we signed up for. We're not going to enforce this. And so the beaches have just been reopened, and people have been coming there, and they're not really social distancing. There's all kinds of people there and around that area, the boardwalk area. But now suddenly there's all this concern about COVID and the vendors, and I think it's actually been shown that COVID transmission in an outdoor area is not really a huge concern to begin with. So. It just seems really harsh and unfair, and it's interesting that law enforcement is so interested in doing this kind of enforcement when they weren't before. That's it. I hope you just um, rescind this uh, executive order. Thanks. Hello. Hi, you're on the line. Hi, um, my name is Vicki Winters. <clears throat> I'm a downtown business owner, and I have um, witnessed how the city has gone out of its way to support downtown businesses and shown a lot of care and solicitude for you know us continuing. I would like to see the same care and solicitude shown toward these vendors who are in a much more precarious position than I will ever be in. Uh, and I'm, I'm so thankful that uh, Community Bridges has stepped in. <clears throat> I wish that that had been the first uh, step that was taken. And we can see how using police and policing as our first response to a situation only makes things worse. And so please reach out for other options first. And I also wanna make sure that all the council members know the, the situation that a lot of these vendors are in, if they are part of a, a, a family with mixed immigration status, where some members, like children, may be um, in the future eligible for status adjustment, if the family has been shown to, to use, um, become a public charge, use um, you know, some kind of a, assistance, it may jeopardize their adjustment to permanent immigration status. So even the threat of this sort of enforcement from the federal government has made people extremely uh, fearful to reach out for the assistance that's available. So you can see that when, you know, selling some beach umbrella, umbrellas is the only way that your family has to make ends meet, you can see why, you know, people would get emotional when that is threatened. and. I think also, unfortunately, we have another case where what the police statements, public statements, are at odds with what's going to be shown at video, and that's very, very sad to see um, as a Santa Cruz resident. Hi, this is Stacy Falls. I'm calling in um, in opposition to this ordinance, to this executive order. I, um, you know, I live really close to the beach, and the, I work near downtown, and I've seen all kinds of congregating, like congregating in a way that makes me really uncomfortable. I was downtown a couple weeks ago, and like somebody without a mask walked by and spit on the sidewalk right next to where I was standing, and I just, I mean, I. I know we have to take precautions in this era, and I, in particular, am really trying to social distance and be really cautious, but I, I'm just surprised that we're taking this level of enforcement action when it really seems like there's all kinds of people behaving in extremely unsafe behavior on the beach, on Beach Street, downtown near the businesses, and it's hard for me not to just see this as kind of a racist attack against you know, mostly Latinx vendors. And I'm not saying that the police department or the the city manager are racist, but I think, like, you know, it's easy to target people who have fewer means, who don't have the privilege of owning a brick-and-mortar business. Um, 
and I just, I think we should be taking care of those folks. And I was listening to Vicky's comments about, you know, the impact that, that something like, that like having something on your record can have on your immigration status. And I just want us, you know, we're a sanctuary city and I want us to be a city where we're going to work with people and make sure that like trying to make money during a time when a lot of people are out of work isn't something that's actually going to get people in trouble with the law. Like, I just can't believe that's the direction we're going. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad that that uh, Community Bridges is, is going to help out. And, you know, I heard Chief Mill say that they were trying to do education. But I really just think, like, we should do education and stop there. Like, there's no reason to take all kinds of really drastic enforcement actions at this point. Hi, you're on the line. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, yeah, I wanted to uh, talk about my thoughts on this this ordinance and uh, I was actually there when uh, said police came in and uh, did their education uh, quote unquote um, so the first time they went out there was on Thursday and they went to the vendors and told them if you're out here tomorrow we're going to come by with the truck and take everything on the street so just kind of getting that information from the vendors and, and uh, you know, that, that's not right. That's not right. The order ordinance was not signed. And then the next day on Friday, they came up again without a signed ordinance. And that's when they started saying, oh, you know what? We don't have an ordinance yet. It could be signed in an hour. It could be signed in a week. Uh, we don't know, but this is not. That. And then they come by an hour later with the signed ordinance. Um, so to saying that there's a week of education, that's not, not what we have been seeing. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's not right. It's not right. What's going down. Um, the ordinance is due to COVID and like everyone has said and have witnessed, uh, the vendors out there were wearing their mask, had the proper, uh, hand sanitation and were taking all the necessary precautions that the city had placed and, yeah, it's just not right. And to hear that, oh, it was multiple complaints, uh, or was it one big complaint from the Seaside Company? Because this ordinance does go hand in hand with uh, when their drive-in movie was supposed to take place. Uh, it it ends on October 1st, a week after uh, the drive-in movies were supposed to end. So it's just a lot of things about this ordinance. Is really part of it. Thank you. Last name is Juarez O'Connell. Um, please unmute your phone. You will have oh. two minutes to speak. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. Uh, yes, I want to second what I heard. I was spending time down with the, the vendors. and um, A lot of these uh, vendors are indigenous, and I believe that this um, is uh, directed at them in a very unfair way. I don't believe that the communication from Santa Cruz Police Department was made in a way that um, respected them. And also, um, I feel like, based on what I witnessed, there was a lot of aggression um, directed at the vendors. Um, so I just want to second what most everyone has said. Um, I believe that there are smarter ways to go about this. I like the idea of maybe doing a lottery system or a system that where um, there can be designated spaces for vendors. Um, but altogether, I believe this could have been avoided if the beaches had just been closed, if this really was an issue regarding safety for our public health, um, then beaches should have just been closed from the beginning um, rather than Santa Cruz targeting um, their, or Santa Cruz PD targeting their um, uh, targeting, you know, these poor vendors who are there just to make their living. 
also believe that um, the ordinance should be rescinded and there's other things that our city could be spending resources on. Thank you. Thank you. Last four digits of your number are 3173. Please unmute your phone. Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. This is, thank you. This is Peter Gelblum. I'm calling on behalf of the Santa Cruz chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. Um, I urge you, council members, to not simply be a rubber stamp for the extraordinary powers you gave to the city manager when you declared a state of emergency. I urge you to instead exercise your duty as elected officials to review and analyze the order and its enforcement carefully, listen to the public's comments, and exercise your authority under the municipal code to not ratify this order. This has to be done on every executive order, but this one in particular. There are many infirmities with the order. I'm gonna focus as a, as a retired attorney on a couple legal points. Uh, although the executive order purports to ban vending on Main Beach and Cal Beach, there are no factual findings in the order to support that ban. Again, there are no findings to support the ban. The only findings in the order concern people congregating on the sidewalk on Beach Street, which has limited space that may make adequate social distancing difficult. This obviously is not true for the beach, which has huge amounts of space. There's also no finding at all about vending on the beach. The order contains speculation that vendors forced off the Beach Street sidewalk might move to Westcliff or the Municipal Wharf, where the order claims without evidence that similar space challenges exist. But the order doesn't even contain, because it cannot, similar speculation about the beach. If there are no factual findings in support, and Mr. Condotti should confirm this to you, the order cannot be legal and must be rejected. Uh, second, although the targets of the order, as everybody's heard, are mostly or all Latinx, the order was issued only in English. As far as I know, it has not been translated into Spanish, so people's property being taken and being arrested for violating an order they may not be able to understand. Thank you very much. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Great. Uh, hi, I'm Lane Edwards. Uh, I'm evacuated right now, uh, kind of stressed, so I haven't put together quite an el eloquent as a statement um, as many of the other callers today. Uh, but I'd also like to support the demands to withdraw this executive order immediately. The order is blatantly racist and targets vulnerable members of our community with police violence. I just think Santa Cruz needs to be better than this. Thank you. We're getting towards the end of this item. If you would like to speak to, on item number seven uh, related to street vending, now is the time to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Um, and once you have been called upon, you'll have two minutes uh, to speak on this item. Hi, um, I'm, my name is Ivy, and I'm calling in to basically reiterate what everybody else has said. Um, it just seems really odd that the city uh, bends over backwards for restaurants and especially food trucks um, and other forms of creative uh, vending or selling of, of products and food. Um, uh, closing streets downtown, setting up a, a food truck thing on the on West Cliff. I wish that you guys would put some of the effort that you've put towards those businesses into uh, the vendors. Um, I think that instead of this whole process could have been, um, I think, dealt with a lot more creatively and a lot um, and with a lot more thought for the the welfare of the vendors. Um, I would have liked to see. 
uh, you guys figure out somewhere where they can vend safely, um, where they can still capture tourist dollars, which is something that I'm interested in, the, in them doing. Um, and uh, I, I think that this was not the best way to go about this and that uh, the order should be rescinded. Thank you. Nice to hear some strong consensus amongst the community. Uh, first, well, I just want to reiterate what everybody else said and then just add the fact that a lot of these vendors, you know, are some of the most vulnerable people in our uh, community and they, you know, don't necessarily qualify for a lot of the other kinds of aid that has been happening with COVID, which means like they are even more dependent on this single source of income to provide for their families uh, and themselves. Um, and then in addition to that, or kind of a little bit of a separate issue, is the whole issue of the city manager um, having this kind of complete executive authority and very little accountability. The city manager is an unelected position. There's zero ways for the public to hold that person accountable. They make more money than any other employee in, at the city, and they have this executive authority to make decisions uh, without any kind of deliberation or democratic process, and I think that's just and complete shame and really um, needs to be addressed immediately. Thank you. The last four digits of your number are one, two, two, five, you are um, on the line. Hi, um, my name is Cindy Mendoza Lopez, and I am calling because I spoke directly to Chief Mill, who told me that they would not be throwing out the items. They, the last resort was to arrest the street vendors. They would be holding off on um removing them from there, they would cite first, and that was not how it was done. Uh, I was very disappointed. I really respect Chief Mills, but when his officers did not conduct in the manner that he expressed was not gonna be done, it was very disappointed to see. Not just this, but we're currently in a pandemic where people are struggling to hold jobs, pay their rent, their mortgages, and by doing this to the most vulnerable population, you're only making conditions worse for them, the ones that are first impacted by the pandemic in the first place. Please, please, please rescind this order. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Hi, my name is Kelsey Hill. Um, I'm calling to express my support for rescinding the executive order. I live near the beach and I went down to the beaches to meet the vendors and there was very little crowding due to people selling backpacks, masks, and bracelets. I was also told a contradictory story about measures from the city to engage in good faith discussions with the vendors. Um, just to paint the picture that I witnessed, there were uh, crowded, it was crowded beach on one side, folks selling handmade crafts on the sidewalk and outside visitors in the hotel and restaurants across the street. So I don't see how it's the vendors who are proposing, posing a disproportionate risk to our public health when the beaches are still open. Similarly, I don't see any brick and mortar businesses on the beach selling masks aside from the vendors. So wouldn't we want tourists coming in from out of town to have access to masks if they're going to be flocking to the beach? I can understand concerns about food vending, but it seems inappropriate to ban all forms of vending on Beach Street in one fell swoop. I'm also concerned that these people paid for vend permits to vend on Beach Street. Is there going to be any effort to repay these permits? 
If the city purports to do everything through a lens of equity, an executive order aimed at people who are working from sunup to sundown to make it make ends meet during a global pandemic seems like an unfair move on behalf of the city. I hope you'll consider all the consensus by the community members here and resend this order. Thank you. Okay, this is the last call. If there's any member of the public who'd like to speak on this item, please press star nine to raise your hand. Otherwise, we're gonna go back to council for action deliberation. Okay, the next speaker, you're on the line. Hello, can you hear me, everyone? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tyree Ritchie. I'm one of the community activists locally in Santa Cruz County. I organized the June 19th March, and I also wanted to speak on the uh, street vendor situation that was just uh, brought to my attention by a lot of people from the community that have been in support of the street vendors, and I really have alarming concerns concerning the street vendor situation. I'm also chiming in with other activists and community members. Uh, this is uh, global pandemic and the fact that many of people in this proportion of communities, mainly black or brown, are, are just as highly affected in this Santa Cruz community already due to higher rent, rising rents, but also the fact that uh, many street vendors are getting discrimin discriminated upon for selling their items in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I've realized that, I've, I've been realizing that, and also I wanted to ask City, are there any efforts moving forward to do any rent freezes, uh, which is not uh, already any efforts to do any type of actions to really help community members move forward with this pandemic as far as alleviating uh, payments as far as rent and other uh, payments as well as other issues evolving in the community. Um, I feel that the fact that uh, the police department is really criminalizing both the street vendors and recently the homeless situation uh, really uh, speaks volumes to where about our police funding moving forward. I feel that and also as well as our the priorities of our city manager as well as our police department moving forward. I feel that as community members, we truly do support our street vendors and definitely need more changes moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we'll have one more person, one more speaker. person who was going to speak lowered their hand. So with that, <clears throat> I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. And I'll just say that, um, you know, hearing a lot of the comments that were made, um, it is an extremely difficult time. And I know that some folks have organized around other street vending activities. And I think what's really important is that we can figure out a way that we can allow for this kind of vending to happen, but in a way that's going to be, um, you know, compatible with the community, that we're going to be able to ensure social distancing and really work with these vendors to do it in a, in a way that's safe. Because um, as I mentioned before, uh, there are days when I've been out there and it's been great and I've seen really good distancing and there's other days when I've been out there and it's been really concerning to me from a public safety perspective. And so um, really grateful for, um, community bridges and their willingness to kind of help facilitate this conversation and this process. Um, and I'm hoping that we can get to something that will really be, uh, you know, a win-win for the vendors, the city, and the community as a whole. So with that, I'll uh, acknowledge Council Member Byers and then Council Member Brown. Well, first of all, thank you, Mayor Cumming, for reaching out to Community Bridges. I'm so familiar with all of their programs which uh, constantly raising money for, and uh, uh, they're just wonderful. So I wanna be sure that they have the resources that we're gonna need to, to implement something like that. So now I will turn to the uh, city manager um, with my comment, or kind of a question. Martine, do we need to, uh, let's say we agree to ask 
community bridges to do this and put every resources they need. Because I think starting out, it's going to be a big deal. Do we need a budget adjustment to do that? I assume we're going to be giving them some money or off, I'm sure they'll want to be paid to do this. Or will the budget just without our taking action? Uh, there's no need for a budget adjustment uh, at this time. Essentially what we're doing, uh, Ralph Demericut, who is in my office, has been tasked with uh, leading the effort in terms of getting individuals together. He's actually right now setting up meetings. He's hearing to hear back for, uh, with respect to dates. But I think initially the discussions will revolve around looking at, you know, what what can be done to make it work for for everyone? Because there's 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 a uh, uh, concerns and issues uh, just involving the, the vendors themselves being able to operate uh, because, again, there's limited spaces. So how do you have an equitable system of sharing the spaces? Because, for example, we would have one, one business entity uh, or one vendor who uh, would take up all the, all the spots, and so that's not really fair to the rest of the vendors. So they were forced to try to squeeze out space in other places, which then made them, you know, be in violation of the of the order or the distancing requirement. So, other operating guidelines, are there locations, other ways that they can operate, uh, or some system that's more fair and equitable for the vendors themselves, is, is I think what we would explore uh, to avoid conflicts. Uh, because again, as I noted earlier, uh, vendors do have by, by law the right to to, to operate. Um, and so it'd be creating conditions, uh, parameters that would be uh, such that would work for them, as well as for any, anyone that might be impacted in the surrounding area, adjacent businesses. Um, and I think uh, I've heard from a variety of uh, businesses and residents uh, in the area who I think all acknowledge the, the need to try to come up with something that works for everyone, that's sort of reasonable. And so I think that's the intent of doing that, um, and we're actively working on getting that going as soon as possible here. Uh, the vending is a new phenomenon to Santa Cruz. Uh, we have not really had it in years past in the beach area. We've had it downtown, but in the beach area, it's a fairly new thing, so it's not something that, quite honestly, we've had to deal with uh, or experience. So this is our first uh, experience with it. Um, and uh, again, early on, our attempt was to try to facilitate, try to work really closely with them to, to make it work. Unfortunately, it was hard to do. So I think we have an opportunity here to try to make it, uh, make, make it work, um, and we'll sort of report to the council on anything that emerges or any need that might come as a result of the discussions. Well, um, I think I just understand now you've assigned this to Ralph, too. Yes, he's facilitating the, the getting everyone together, well, getting the city staff, the appropriate city staff together, as well as community bridges, and, and so that's that's yeah that's started and in, in place now. Just a comment on that because he's a great researcher, so I assume he's going to look at other communities because we don't need reinvent a lot of it. I'm sure right. if we look at successful communities and little I know Ralph, I bet he'll do that. So that well, it all sounds good. We're we're on it. I just hope it doesn't take too long. There's too much, too much bureaucracy involved, so we can't resolve this as quickly as possible. That's all my comment, the mayor. And I just had, um, I have a question for the city manager. Would it, today would it make sense for council to provide that formal direction um, in terms of next steps moving forward, just so that the community is aware that you know we are in agreement that we we need to take steps to try to create this kind of program that will allow for the street vending to occur and, you know, working with nonprofit partners and, and you know, folks in our community. Sure. I mean, obviously, uh, we, uh, we need to have those conversations and they've been initiated, uh, but uh, certainly the council wishes to provide some, some guidance and some and direction or to uh, acknowledge and, and, and ratify that that would be uh, completely acceptable and uh, yes. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, I, uh, I'll just start by saying I, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, most of the comments that we've heard today. And so I won't give you all a, a speech reiterating those, but I do want to highlight uh, a concern and, and about the, the way that we've prioritized or the city has made the decision to prioritize this kind of enforcement over other uh, issues that are happening in our community related to this public health crisis. And given the fiscal crisis that we are in and are likely to be in for quite some time, it's even more um, 
kind of uh, confusing to me. Uh, I um, appreciate the the interest to nego to engage in some kind of discussion and good faith negotiation to try to make this work. Um, and I appreciate Community Bridges for stepping up. I heard from their representatives just now that uh, we ought to be rescinding this uh, executive order, and so I'm going to move that we do that. My motion is to rescind Executive Order 2020-16, to direct staff to continue work with Community Bridges and the vendors, and to report back to Council at the September 8th Council meeting And I believe that's it. There we go. That's my motion. Yep. So we have a motion by Councilmember Brown to rescind the executive order and to bring back the item at the, well, to have community bridges, the staff work with community bridges and to bring back the item at the September 8th city council meeting. Anyone with their hand raised seconding the item before us? No. Okay. Uh, given that there's no second to the motion, that motion fails. And so, um, Councilmember Matthews. Yes, thank you. Am, am I unmuted now? I'm, like, I'm happy to be on track. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the comments um, and the general direction of this. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that the whole subject of vending, street vending, sidewalk vending has changed quite a bit in recent years. And specifically the issue on the beach arose very quickly. Um, and it did involve some uh, very tense and contentious Be ashamed dynamics. Of yourself. Pardon? Oh, I don't know where that came from. Oh, um, uh, dynamics. Uh, between and among the vendors, as well as some legitimate issues about food safety and the whole intrusion on the bike. Those, those were legitimate issues. There are other legitimate criticisms of the way it was handled in the moment. But um, I think to rescind the emergency order would quickly uh, revert to the kind of um, tension and uh, uh, contentious dynamics that existed previously that were a source of concern. My preference would be to ratify the executive order, but also convey to council's direction, um, priority direction to staff to continue to work with community bridges to develop a more structured and equitable system that would accommodate each area of ending. So that would be my motion to proceed. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews. Is there a second to that motion? Councilmember Golder? I'll, I'll second that. Um, I did have some questions and a comment, but I'll second um, Councilmember Matthews' motion as well. Okay. Um, why don't we hold your questions? Councilmember Brown had her hand up, so we'll address those questions. And I'll just say as well that um, I appreciate the direction Councilmember Brown was, was taking us in, um, but I do share the similar concerns that Councilmember Matthews brought up with. If we um, kind of just rescind this um, order that, you know, we pretty much are just opening up, you know, the vending to the same issues we were facing, you know, prior to that order without having an opportunity to work with the vendors and the city to develop a program that can be effective. and so. Um, I think it's important that we try to, you know, get something in place. And I know that many other vendors in town um, that have put on other events have done a lot of that work up front before those events have happened, um, some of those being the food trucks that we've seen um, periodically on Westcliff, uh, the Maker's Mart that we've seen downtown. So I think that if we have an opportunity to really work with the vendors first, that we can try to mitigate a lot of these concerns that we're hearing in the community and bring back something that's going to really be effective and benefit the vendors, the community, and um, in a way that's equitable as well. So uh, Councilmember Brown and Councilmember Golder. 
Thank you. Uh, so in uh, yet more evidence of the substantial challenges that uh, the public has in weighing in here in this format, I have received a message that the last person who had her hand up uh, did not lower her hand and was unable to speak. And so I'd like to reopen the public comment to allow that speaker. I think it's the least we can do because who knows how many more people have just not been able to get in. Sure. I mean, if that person can call back in um, and if they can press star nine on their phone, I'll let Council Member Golder ask her question. And if you can direct them to call back in, then we can let that happen. So Council Member Golder. So correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't we learn at our last discussion about this that the majority or there was a, a, quite a few of the vendors um, were from outside the county? And just coming into vent? Uh, my understanding is that uh, yes, uh, the vendors the uh, most are from um, uh, from other yeah other other, places. other counties. Yeah. And so, given the circumstances that we're in with 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 evacuations and and the beaches already being closed across the county because of the pandemic during Labor Day weekend, I think it's essential that, that we put a pin in it, continue the executive order, have the discussions, and then come back. Because if these people don't live in the county, they shouldn't be coming to Santa Cruz right now anyway. We need the space for our evacuees. So. Okay, so it looks like there was an individual who wasn't able to speak, so I'm gonna open, it looks like they've joined the call. I'm gonna let them have the opportunity to speak, and then we'll continue moving forward with our meeting. Last four digits of your number are 0749. Okay, you are on the line. Hello, um, I'm sorry if I passed the time. Um, I actually have another member that had um, the live video who wanted to speak as well, and we had a lot of problems going on with that. We thought we would be able to speak just through video. Anyways, um, I'm Karen P. I am actually one of the first people that reached out after the hate crime uh, to the exact vendor you're speaking of where it's all came about um, and created a GoFundMe um, for the hate crime she had to endure. Um, every day since, me and um, a member of Indigenous Surf Club, my friend Oscar, my friend Edena have been there speaking to vendors, advocating, getting all the points of view that the city council members are so confused about um, that apparently no one can advocate for. Um, I have so much to speak on this. All your concerns I can answer if we can do a separate Zoom meeting. Um, in regards to comments already about these people not being apparently local, if they were um, due to housing being more um, equitable for people, they would be here. Unfortunately, because of that, because of the city not having set rules for locations, they do have to sleep sometimes in the cars because this is their livelihood. Um, so that's a separate thing in itself. They've tried to reach out for housing. They've been here for years. They know their crowd, and because of livelihood, this is why they still come and still suffer racism every day. If you were to go and speak to vendors, within an hour you've had racists yelling out their slurs. Okay. Locals, by the way, that you're defending. Um, anyways, I can touch on everything. Um, again, Cindy Lopez, a social worker, spoke to Chief Mills about all the claims that um, arrest would be the very last resort. Arrest happened a day after the ordinance. Um, speaking on bilingual access to the vendors, you guys gave only an English version of the ordinance. All the um, warnings that they got, were threats by people that they don't trust because they've been getting harassed the whole summer about everything that business is trying to do. Yeah, I have a lot to say, but... Um, we reconcile Beach Street. Yep. But All right. <clears throat> Bring it back to council. Um, and thank you for those comments and for the public for weighing in on this item. Councilmember Matthews. I'll just make a comment in reference to um, Council Member Golder's um, comment about people being from out of town. Uh, that has been widely reported. My motion is absolutely agnostic on that issue. Um, it's my understanding that we have required people to have business licenses, but 
our business licenses in general don't require that people live in Santa Cruz County. That's, that's a different issue altogether. So just want to be clear on that. Right, but if they're, I, I agree, but my point was that we, we know, we heard that they were coming in and camping on the beach. But we think that given the circumstances, it's probably better just to put the pause button on, have the discussion now, and they. I, I think so you're allowing tourists to, to come in and bend. That doesn't make no, any sense. This is not a discussion. Yeah, I, sorry, for some reason, the, the um, person was able to unmute themselves, but. Yeah. Yeah, so. That was my point, exactly. Um, at this point, we I'm don't. I'm reading your point. Thank you. We don't um, prohibit people coming into the county. Where if the Santa Cruz is asking people not to visit, but we don't, at this point, have that legal authority. So, um, again, my motion is uh, absolutely legal on that subject, and I think it reflects a very broad interest and working in a, uh, with our community partners in a way that is more structured and equitable, culturally sensitive, um, to have a plan that can operate without the kind of um, tension uh, that has been really um, disruptive. Okay. Council Member Byers. <coughs> you need to unmute your microphone. I was going to ask uh, Councilmember Matthews to restate her motion, but I believe she just did, and I got it. But this, her, your sound, her sound, your sound, sorry, yeah. is yeah. really awkward. I, uh, I, I only get about every third word. Oh, I had I problems know. today. Is it oh, better okay. now? Pardon? Is it better now? That was better. Okay, that was better. I mean, I'm closer to the computer. I, I apologize for my. Yeah, well, I, and I think I heard, I think I got the motion. Okay. I, I have, sorry, I had to leave for a bit. Everyone else clear? Yep. Okay. Okay, with um, in the interest of time, <clears throat> I'll turn it over to the clerk so that we can uh, do a roll call vote on this item. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? No. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes with council members Byers, Golder, Watkins, Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers, Mayor Cummings voting in favor, and Council Member Brown voting opposed. Okay. That brings us to our next item on our agenda, which is consent public hearing, item number 17. Uh, second reading and final adoption ordinance number 2020-18, revising three chapters, Santa Cruz Municipal Code, so as to bring them into compliance with Senate Bill 946, California Government Code sections 51036-51039. Um, if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, or, or sorry, before that, is there any member of the council who would like to pull item number 17 from the agenda? Okay, seeing none, if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak to us on item number 17, now's the time. Please press star nine on your phone, and you will be given two minutes to speak to us on this item. Okay, seeing that there's no members of the public who would like to comment on this item, I'll bring it back to Council for Action Deliberation, Council Member Brown. Yeah, I'll go ahead and move the second reading of the ordinance. I just want to comment that I, I do find it ironic that uh, we are uh, doing a second reading on an ordinance intended to conform with a state law that was adopted precisely to try to prevent uh, discrimination against uh, immigrant 
communities and the vendors, uh, Latinx vendors who are um, targeted in communities throughout the state of California. Um, but I'm happy to uh, move the second reading. Okay, so a motion by Council Member Brown. Council Member Golder. I'll second that. So motion by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Golder. Uh, I don't think there's any further discussion on this item. So I'll turn it to the clerk to call the roll vote. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Jeremy? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Item number 18 has been continued and won't, and won't be heard today. So the next item up on our agenda is item number 19, amendment to regulations of beekeeping on residential and non-residential property. Um, I also want to mention before this item that there's a member of the public who is asking if this item could be continued to um, a future meeting just due to the impacts of the fire and people's inability to um, come and speak on this item. So. I just wanted to put that out there uh, that that has come up, and um, and so if there's any comments from other council members, I'm just curious if anyone else had been contacted regarding this item. Uh, council member Vice Mayor Myers, and then we have Council Member Byers, Matthews, and Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, um, I, I did receive uh, comments to that effect as well, and given the. Um, Given the the fires, um, I think, um, and, and the engagement by the the uh, Santa Cruz County Bee Guild on this um, on this item, and uh, I met with them early last year, um, and certainly they are very interested in this and have been um, helpful and supportive in trying to um, bring the item forward. Uh, many of them would like to be here, but they cannot, and. Um, so I think uh, I, I'm happy to entertain a motion to continue the item, uh, but I'm happy to also have council members uh, ask questions as needed. Thank you. Council member Byers, Matthews, and then Brown. Um, no, I support continuing. I think some of the email we just got right before this meeting uh, was important. I read it quickly, but I'd like to absorb it. So I, it's totally appropriate, I think, to continue it. So I'm supportive of it. Council Member Matthews Brown, and then I have a question for the city attorney and for staff. I'm quite happy to continue. I, with Council Member Myers, met with speakers on several occasions last year, and um, it's such an interesting field. <laughs> and um, our ordinance, on the books currently is clearly outdated, needed work. They brought us a lot of resources from other communities. I was really grateful given everything on the planning department slate that they even got this far. I, they, um, they engaged actively with the beekeepers. I was under the impression that the issues were largely resolved when it came to this. I didn't see um, that there were significant issues to, to revisit in detail. We did get some very late correspondence. I understand everyone's life is so disrupted right now. <laughs> we just take that as a given. This is not urgent. Uh, the beekeepers have acted patiently and in good faith, and I think the planning department put a good effort into it. So um, I would like to have a little bit more discussion in, in current time with what the issues are. Can't necessarily guarantee we we get to 100% agreement, but I think, you know, we're very close and we can do a good job on this. That will be a really good outcome uh, for the future. And so with those comments, I will move that we continue this to a future date in the relatively near future. I think I had made the same motion. Yeah, oh. did you want a second, Cynthia? <laughs> you said you would entertain a motion, so I thought I was... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Did I say entertain? Okay, sorry. <laughs> you can make the motion. Go for it. <laughs> sorry. I think Renee second, seconded 
Justin, I think you're um, muted. There you go. Yeah, I was muted. I just had a question, Tony. Um, so if we can just continue this item to a future meeting. Um, there's no need to table or anything like that. No, I don't think there's any need to table it. It's not a time sensitive item. Um, and so I don't see any issues with that at all. Okay. <clears throat> we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, second by Councilmember Golder. And um, I just want to thank staff for bringing, putting this together and bringing this together. And um, obviously there's been so much um, just uncertainty and, and kind of crisis right now. And so um, I just wanted to thank you all for bringing this and, and uh, we hope that we can hear it again uh, soon so that we can, so you all can move on to other things. Uh, Council Member Golder. Okay. Sorry, I just was when I'm thinking about when it comes back to us, I just want us to be cognizant that there's probably bees in the rural parts of our county that have been evacuated with yeah. bees. And so maybe not too soon so that we're not, you know, I'm, I almost got given a turtle and a dog yesterday. So, like, I don't know what kind of situations people are in, but I don't want anyone to be um, affected but under evacuation long term. All right. So I guess with that, um, if, unless staff, if you have any comments you'd like to make or um, thoughts you'd like to share with us. Um, yeah, I'll just say this is Sarah Noisy with the advanced planning section in the community development planning department. Um, so I just would like to um, take one little brief moment to comment that um, we were able to do some really great work on this this summer, mm -hmm. despite the furlough, despite limited staffing, because we were so, so privileged to have um, a planning intern this summer, Ethan, who was able to really take this project on and do the bulk of the research that was necessary, a drafting of the code language to get it done. So um, this is Ethan's last week with the city and we are just so grateful that he's been able to be with us. And um, one of the advantages of Zoom is that perhaps he will still be able to join us for this presentation at some point in the future um, from the East Coast. But we have no problem with continuing the item generally. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks. And Ethan, thank you for interning with the city and for all your hard work on this. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Brown, and then maybe we can move on to our next item on our agenda. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Ethan. I didn't know it was you doing all the work on this. And, you know, when you go for your job interviews in the future and they say, tell us something really interesting you did, you can point to this. <laughs> Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you as well to Ethan. And I know we're kind of running very much behind right now, but if you want to say something right now, it seems like you could just take a moment to, if you have anything you want to say, since you might not be with us for the, the actual hearing. Um, thank you. Um, well, I hope to, I hope to be able to tune into the hearing. Um, thank you for taking the time today uh, for this item, despite it being continued, and thank you to Sarah and to Matt uh, Benoit of the Advanced Planning uh, for, and everyone else in the Advanced Planning team for a really successful summer. So thank you very much for this moment to be here today. All right, with that, um, if there's no further questions or comments from uh, the council, I'll call on the, um, the clerk to call the vote. The motion before us is to continue this item um, item number 19, um, amendments to regulations of beekeeping on residential, non-residential properties to a future meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Aspires? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you all again for your hard work, and we will be hearing this item in the, in the future, and hopefully the near future. And so with that, um, we'll move on to our next item, item number 20, 
general business update on general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation efforts and approval of a contract with urban planning partners for consultant services on the objective standards senate bill to grant for members of the public who are streaming if this is an item you want to comment on now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen the order will be a presentation by staff followed by questions from council we will then take public comment and return to the council for deliberation and action. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah Noisy, senior planner. Good afternoon. Um, I am going to share my screen. Um, go. Okay, so um, we are here to talk today to talk about the objective standards for multifamily housing. Um, this is a project that we are able to undertake because we were successful in pursuing a, a, a grant from the SB2 fund through the state of California. Um, I'll just, oops, hang on, there we go, okay. Um, I'll just go through some very brief background. So the project we're discussing today does still grow out of this um, ongoing sort of mismatch between the city's general plan and our zoning ordinance. Um, I'm just gonna cover this very briefly. The report in when I was here in May, we went through a lot more detail of it. So um, if anyone has questions on the background, uh, you know, I can answer those, but I'm just gonna spend just a little bit on, on this right now. Um, so to reiterate, our general plan created some new land use designations, specifically um, three land use designations related to mixed use development specifically. Um, the zoning code that we have in place allows mixed use, but does not fully implement the land use pattern that's envisioned by the general plan. Um, there was an effort to um, amend the zoning code to bring it into compliance with the general plan. That's the typical course that um, a jurisdiction goes through when, the, when a general plan gets updated. Um, there was a lot of concern from the community and um, work on that process was paused internally in the summer of 2017. And then formally, um, the city council gave direction to staff to cease work on the corridors plan in August of 2019 and to begin a new effort looking at how to reconcile this difference between the general plan and the zoning ordinance. Um, along with that change came some state legislation. The Housing Accountability Act was amended last year um, to the point where um, cities and counties are now really only able to apply objective standards for development. So those are things that can be measured and um, to a mutually agreed upon standard. So height limits and setback limits, um, you know, things that can be measured and defined specifically, we are able to apply so long as they don't get in the way of um, a developer being able to fully execute the planned development capacity of a site. So um, the city does not currently have a lot of objective standards in our zoning ordinance. We rely a lot on design <coughs> review to determine how buildings look and feel and relate to a street. Um, we're not really able to use those as much now, um, given the change in state law. So in October of 2019, we um, applied for and uh, um, we applied for and were approved for a grant to um, get some funding to help us develop these objective standards. When I was here in May, um, just a few months ago. I talked about how we were getting ready to release the RFP or maybe we had just released the RFP and we appropriated the grant fund, the total is $310,000 into the city budget, which will allow us to um, pursue reimbursement for work on this project. So over the summer, we've been working on our procurement process to get um, some really great vendors on board to help us work through this community process to create zoning standards for multifamily housing. And we're so excited today to have um, urban planning partners. We've selected them. We're really excited about the project. We have two representatives from the firm with us today um, to answer questions and introduce themselves. So when we released the RFP, um, we really were looking for um, several things. We wanted we wanted to see proposals that were technically strong, um, you know, really covered all the bases, could produce a robust analysis, had experience running um, complicated community processes. Um, and we found that with this team, Urban Planning Partners, Strategic Economics, and Interethnica. Um, we, they really demonstrated, their proposal demonstrated um, like a pretty nuanced understanding of our community already. And more than that, also demonstrated that they really have the tools to um, engage with our community with all 
facets of our community uh, and really make sure that those voices get incorporated into the process and into the product. So we liked how their proposal um, had a strong focus on educating the community so that the, pro so that the feedback we get and the, in and the input we get from the community, um, that they really understand what they're contributing to and how their comments are gonna be used and reflected in the final product so that they're really providing the city with useful um, feedback and information so that we can really make sure that um, that were responsive to those comments. We also were really excited. Um, this team really identified the city has um, a goal and an interest in ensuring that our outreach is really equitable and they are specifically bringing a social justice and anti-racist lens to this work about zoning, which is a piece that has been historically really missing from the process. And it's not something that, um, you know, city planners typically like dig into about the history of zoning and um, where it comes from, how we came to be that our land use patterns are the way they are today and our building forms are the way they are. Um, and all of those things have a history and all of those things have an impact on our community. So we're really excited that this firm seems um, very interested and very capable of including that history and educating the Santa Cruz public on um, those factors because they matter in, in this work. They also have a really strong track record of proven participation tools to ensure that we're reaching all members of our community and that we're not um, only hearing from the same folks that we hear from all the time. I hope we hear from those folks as well, folks who really understand our processes and have engaged with them in the past and have that um, you know, institutional knowledge and that history, that's also important. And we wanna make sure that we're also hearing from people who maybe haven't understood how to participate, haven't felt like they were empowered to participate in the past. Um, and we feel like this is the team to do that. So I'm gonna just run through the scope of work briefly here. Um, work would kick off pretty immediately in September, sort of as soon as we can get set up with the contracting and um, invoicing, we're gonna get started because there's a lot to do and we have a grant deadline. So um, the scope of work currently takes us through about November of 2021 based on the um, funding source. We have to really be finished absolutely no later than January of 2021. I'm sorry, 2022. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're trying to give ourselves just a little bit of wiggle room there right at the end of the year, which is tough with holidays and stuff. But um, yeah, with that, that deadline, unfortunately, is um, external and not movable. So the budget for the consultants is just under $180,000. And the scope of work consists of four primary tasks. So they're gonna be doing some, start off with some information gathering um, to understand sort of the existing conditions and um, the existing sort of lay of the land in the city. They're gonna focus on developing their community outreach tools and processes, um, and then performing that community engagement and having um, some feedback loops that ensure that it's really being successful in, in the goals that we've set for it, um, and then drafting the objective standards, and then lastly, uh, bringing those standards to hearings before the Planning Commission and the City Council. So um, I, this pull quote was in the, um, the consultant's proposal, and it's taken from comments that the city received during the Housing Blueprint, um, out, housing blueprint Outreach, um, the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee Outreach says, I don't want endless meetings and outreach. I just want housing to get built without any fanfare, except for the new residents being very excited to move in. Um, and I thought this was a very insightful pull quote for the, um, for the team to put in their proposal because it really highlights one of the challenges. We have done a lot of outreach and a lot of talking about land use patterns and zoning and housing in Santa Cruz and um, I think there are a number of constituents in the community that probably look around and feel like it's all talk and it hasn't really generated a change or it hasn't generated the change that they wanted it to generate. Um, in fact, maybe has done something different than they were really hoping it would do. So um, this is gonna be one of the challenges that this process is gonna need to kind of grapple with. So um, these task one and task two would both sort of begin concurrently 
um, right away in September. The consultant would be like gathering information from staff, re reviewing our existing planning documents, getting their arms around what are our existing um, standards and where are they. They're contained in several different documents throughout the city that govern development. Um, they're going to look at refining that list of potentially affected interests so that it's really focused and targeted and it's a, um, a list of the constituents that are most important to include and to met and, and whose um, engagement we really want to be measuring through this process. Um, then they're going to be start beginning um, to analyze the existing conditions. Um, so that includes um, looking at the regulations that currently apply to um, specifically, again, those, that mixed use, high density general plan designation. So as we talked about in January in our report, um, you know, there are 91 parcels in the city that carry that designation and only one of those has pursued and received an entitlement to redevelop. Um, and that was at, you know, a significantly lower capacity than the site is planned for in the general plan. There may be lots of reasons for that. It may not be a bad thing that that's how that developed. And it's important for us to understand um, the reality of development. Um, you know, as we've talked about in some, some of the past updates on this, um, there is this question about uh, is the capacity that's currently planned for in the general plan appropriate? Is it the right answer? Is it feasible? Will it work? Um, so we need to be answering that question with this process. We're going to get a lot of information um, through this process in terms of identifying that and then being able to um, talk about whether we need to launch a second process to kind of move some of that development capacity around in the city. So, um, but getting back to task one and task two, um, the, the community engagement will include refinements and then metrics to measure success. So where certain groups haven't been represented, you know, they're, they're going to be looking at the city demographics and collecting that information um, as people engage with the with the program with the um, project and if we if we notice any gaps then they have um, specific ideas about how we might create a focus group or do some interviews or really target our engagement outreach to to get those voices in the process and make sure that they're heard and included so task two for community engagement it begins sort of immediately and it extends all the way through um, you know the fall the winter and into the spring and the summer of 2021. So that task kind of um, carries us through the whole um, process of working with the community. So task three is a task to really define and develop these objective standards. So um, these standards are gonna be drafted based on outreach from the community and really reflect the preferences that the community has expressed during the community engagement um, program. So, um, you know, part of that community engagement process is really defining community character and, and um, characterizing exactly what it is about Santa Cruz that we want to see and then measuring that so that we can include those as standards. Um, you know, one of the challenges that we are up against right now is that the way the state law is currently drafted, um, we really have very little control, unfortunately, over what gets developed. We currently have floor area ratios in the general plan, we have height limits and setbacks in the, um, in the zoning code. And that's kind of it. We don't have any standards about materials. We don't have any standards about um, articulation of building facades. Um, you know, we don't have any comments about like window placement or materials or anything like that. That really makes a difference in how a building feels and how it contributes to the streetscape and then how people feel walking past it and interacting with it and having it in their community. So um, the information that we gather from folks about what they really care about seeing and what they love about their community that's gathered during task two is going to inform um, the standards that get developed in, in task three. Additionally, task three is the task where we do that test fit of the existing objective standards and sort of identify if it's even possible to build a 2.75 FAR, if it's possible, if it's likely, um, that's the information that um, would inform staff and then ultimately inform the council about whether it might be um, necessary to look at relocating some of the capacity for the um, for housing development to other neighborhoods in the city, other than where it's currently planned along water and SoCal. 
So that's going to be a really important task. Um, let's see. Uh, I also want to mention here um, there is both, there's an optional task about like developing parking supply recommendations. Um, we're not sure right now if that's really going to be necessary or useful. Staff is working on some other um, amendments to the parking ordinance sort of as a separate process right now. And so um, that task has been downgraded to optional because we're not sure how necessary it's actually going to be. It could turn out that it would be useful. And so we do, we are interested in maintaining the ability to add that task at, at a future date should it sort of become obvious that it's going to be really useful and relevant. But for now, it's optional and not included in the scope. Um, so I do want to mention here task, um, I think it's task 3C includes a tool uh, where the economic develop the economic consultant would create a tool where um, members of the public, decision makers, staff um, could kind of play with um, some different objective standards and see how they affect the likelihood of something getting developed. So as we adjust height, as we adjust floor area ratio, as we tweak the number of required parking spaces, like how does that actually affect the likelihood of development and the creation of housing? Um, you know, I think those are those are really important trade-offs to understand, and I think sometimes they're quite opaque to the public. Sometimes they're opaque to me, and I do this for a living. And it's, you know, some of those things, it, it's sort of remarkable how much a parking space can cost. And so changing the parking ratio just a little bit can have a big impact on the number of spaces, the number of units you can build on a property, and then also the cost of those units. So. Um, we're really excited that that kind of a task and that work is going to be included here because it's really going to help all of us understand the choices that we're making and the trade-offs that we're choosing. And then finally, after you know, developing these standards, refining them, ensuring that people understand what they're seeing and that we're getting the right kind of feedback about how they may need to change, um, then they would come to public hearings before the Planning Commission and the City Council. Um, I would also like to mention, ultimately, these any changes to our zoning code um, that come out of this process will have to go to the um, California Coastal Commission. Unfortunately, due to the grant, we don't have time for the consultants to be part of that process. So we are ensuring that the consultants will be through the process, be with us all the way through the process of getting approval um, and feedback from the city council. Um, but then it would be on city staff to process that ordinance amendment through um, hearings at the California Coastal Commission. So before I introduce our consultants in just a minute, I want to spend a minute talking about the role of the Planning Commission. So both the City Council and the Planning Commission have been interested in how the Planning Commission could be involved, how they could um, contribute to this process. Um, and you know, we really want to ensure both for our sake, for their sake, that the Planning Commission really adds value and contributes in a meaningful way to this process. Um, given the, the timeline that we're on, um, we, we want to make sure that we are using our time very efficiently with the Planning Commission. So um, given the focus on broad and inclusive outreach, none of the four proposals we received recommended that we create any kind of community advisory commission, um, technical advisory committee anything like that, all four of them really said, you know, if your focus is on bringing in new voices, a committee is the wrong way to do that. Um, really, there are other better ways to do that. And I, I, you know, we were surprised by that. All of us kind of expected that would be part of the process. Um, you know, we have used community advisory committees in the past, the corridors plan had one. Um, and. So, you know, we are kind of trying to learn those lessons about how that process went, how we are hopeful that this process can go, and so we're choosing some different tools. So we are recommending that the Planning Commission play a very important advisory role in this process. Um, we will be bringing them detailed updates at four key milestones in the process. The first one will be pretty soon when we have that community engagement strategy sort of um, finalized with the consultants. That would be the first point that we would bring something to the Planning Commission and ask for their feedback um, and you know any, any recommendations they might have to staff and consultants in terms of how we proceed with that and hopefully help us improve it as we start our outreach with the community. 
Um, the second time would be shortly after that, we would come back with the results of the test fit of existing standards, because like I mentioned, that's gonna be this important point for um, you know staff, planning commission, city council to kind of weigh in and, and take a decision. Are we gonna pursue a second project? Are we gonna initiate a process to do a general plan amendment and everything that that involves? Um, you know, what do the results show us about how much benefit we would be likely to get out, out of engaging in that process? So we would really want the planning commission to be involved with that and make a recommendation to the city council about um, pursuing that kind of a process or not. You know, I mean, really that they're gonna have to be involved with that. Um, the next time we would come and see them would be as we're visualizing those draft standards. So um, between you know bullet two and bullet three, there's a lot of community work that's gonna be happening. Um, and the planning commission as individuals would be able to participate in almost all of that work. You know, they couldn't all five of them attend a live meeting, but given that um, you know, our community outreach is gonna have to be very um really varied in terms of format, given that we aren't gonna be able to have large community meetings. Um, it, it's almost an advantage in that the planning commissioners would all be able to participate in, as individuals in those processes. Um, and we think there's a lot of benefit to that. Uh, so they can see how it's happening with the community and um, you know, sort of hear the feedback live as it happens um, and see the results of that and really be involved. So, and then obviously they would be involved in hearing um, the formal draft standards. So they would see the visualization of the draft standards. They would provide feedback that would go into that refinement step where staff and consultants would, you know, tweak those standards based on all the feedback from the various places um, and then develop the final draft that would go into formal hearings. And then that would be the planning commission's final role would to be to make a formal recommendation to the city council about whether the um, proposal should be approved and um, with or without any further amendments recommended by them. So with that, um, I would like to introduce Lynette Diaz from Urban Planning Partners, um, who's here with us today, just to take a few moments to introduce herself and her firm. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I'm Lynette Diaz, I am president and founder of Urban Planning Partners, and I also have Meredith Ruff with me tonight, and she is our project manager, or I shouldn't say tonight, this afternoon. Um, and really appreciate um, this opportunity to be before the council today and um, to work with the city um, on this project. It's really a great opportunity in planning um, and development. It's changing a lot. Um, it's hard to keep up with all the regulation changes and what we can and what we can't do. And there's a lot to learn and there's a lot that's changing. And so this is the type of work we really love to do and we're really good at. Um, we like working in controversial situations where there's opportunity to learn and educate and inform the process. Um, and we were really excited to see that staff um, was really open to approaching this in a, in a different way. And, you know, I think we're all recognizing that we need to evolve um, our approaches to things. And so with that, I'm gonna um, say we're available for questions. I know you guys have a lot on your agenda, but both Meredith and I are here and look forward to working with you. And very some things. <laughs> Okay, okay, so whoops. with that, um, our staff recommendation as printed in your staff report is to direct the city manager to execute the contract um, in the amount of $179,935 to procure these consultant services. Um, we're also ask, asking for um, the city council to authorize the city manager to approve change orders not to exceed $23,300. Again, all of this money would be um, provided for by the grant funding that we've received. Um, and that 23 um, three would be for optional parking tasks that are called out in the scope of work. And then number three, direct staff to invite the planning commission to significant outreach events and to incorporate regular updates to the planning commission into the project schedule. So with that, we staff and consultants are available for questions. Thank you all for that presentation and um, 
With that, I'll turn it over to council members uh, to see if any council members have any questions. Council member Byers. Um, thank you. Um, great presentation. So would you put up that last um, slide? Was it for, yeah, this one. Um, down to direct staff to invite the, um, I'm, I'm talking about the Planning Commission. Um, reminded when I read this here. To significant outreach events. Now, okay, they go to an outreach event. I mean, I'm sorry, it was almost a little insulting to have an, invite them to a public meeting, but that's okay. Um, at that meeting, are they speaking as, if they want to stand up and speak, and are they speaking as a planning commissioner or are they speaking as a person, a, a citizen, just a plain old citizen? Yeah, so that's what, sure, if you'd answer that one first, that would help. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So um, in consulting with the city attorney, um, well, let me back up. So one of the things I'd like to say is that um, the realities of COVID are that um, the outreach process for this project is going to look different than any project we have done before. More of it is going to be um, yeah. online. Mm -hmm. More of it is going to be in sort of smaller groups. It's going to be outdoors. It's going to be via tabling. It's going to be via surveys. Um, all of those are community engagement activities. Um, if we hold a meeting, either in person or online, um, the planning commissioners would be governed by the Brown Act. So um, they would not be able to, you know, we couldn't have a quorum of them all attend that event live. Uh, the advantage, though, is that, um, you know, any meetings that we do online, it's very easy to record those and make them available through the website so that planning commissioners would still be able to, um, you know, participate after the fact, gather the information, send their comments in, provide their feedback. Um, and then and in that role, they would be participating as individuals, as citizens, and not as represent, not as formal representatives oh, okay. of the Planning Commission. You know, isn't, uh, maybe this is a question for Tony. Oh, hold on, I'm so sorry. I just gotta turn this off. Oh. Um, isn't there a way to also the public event, I'm sorry, I don't know how to turn off my phone. Um, a public event to uh, notice the Brown Act so they could just attend that one public event with all the other people uh, that they are as commissioners? When, yes. couldn't you, that could be done. You could do that, yes. Okay, all right, that was a, okay. Uh, That's just, right, it would just have to be involved the posting of an agenda. And right. It wouldn't have to be conducted in the same format as a planning commission meeting, but it would have to be noticed. But they could attend, and they could be there. So long as it yeah. is agendized. A majority. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. That's right. We would have to agendize okay. and notice uh, a right. meeting if a majority wanted to attend. Okay, that's correct. And then it talks about updates going to the planning commission at key. I saw that in an earlier slide. Mm -hmm. One of the tasks was bring key, what was it called? Yeah. These key milestone. updates of key milestone. Um, does an update, just an update, or can they totally engage in their opinion, good or bad? You may or may adopt their opinion, or is it just a lecture on the update? Um, so at these key milestones, they would be providing feedback. So okay. on the community engagement strategy, they would be advising about whether it was robust, adequate, any changes they would recommend, um, and then okay. incorporating that feedback. Um, so good engagement. Yes, and, and with, the set, with that second bullet, they would actually even be making a recommendation, I think. Well, maybe Lee wants to jump in. Would they be making a recommendation to the city council on that test, results of the test fit? I would see that. us having that conversation with the council, and so we would bring the planning commission's um, recommendations as well as the community feedback that we've heard thus far um, to the council. That's something that the council would want to um, weigh in on in terms of whether to start up a, a separate and um, parallel process, although not uh, linked uh, entirely in terms of the timing, because this has. Uh, uh, shorter um, deadlines associated with the grant. You know, I certainly, and I agree with those deadlines. I think it's a long, it's a long thing. So, but but then the last the last one is that they do um, receive the whole document and advise the city council. Yes, right. Yeah, that so they the would be thing. providing advice to the city council, a recommendation to the city council at two of these points, and they would be providing feedback to 
um, city staff and consultants at the other two points. This, oh, I've got other questions, but I want to stay in the planning commission. Did this, uh, maybe uh, city attorney can help me on this. Did the council take a vote on whether the uh, the planning commission should be involved? Or I don't know what involved meant, but there's something in your the role of the planning commission. The city council previously contemplated the planning commission's role. Right. You know, what, I don't, did we contemplate? Did we take a vote, or did we just speak up? up. I'm not sure I understand the question, but if, I I can um, take it. <laughs> <laughs> so when when we were here in May, when I was here with the update about. Um, reconciling the general plan and the zoning right. ordinance mm -hmm. there was a motion made that the planning commission form a subcommittee that motion okay. failed yeah okay that's kind of what i remember it didn't really say that in this paragraph but that's true yes yeah. okay yeah. okay but you know um because i was on the planning commission for years and i'm not going to go anything with this but i just want to acknowledge hold on a second um, I looked up the purpose of the Planning Commission in the bylaws, and there are eight, I'm sure you know this, Lee, and you probably know it too, Sarah, but there are eight um, duties and responsibilities of the Planning Commission, and they shall have the ability, I'm sorry, um, as vested by the city and are required to, and then there's eight things they're required to. None are as but I remember just so often our meetings were just full of working on policy and updating, you know, not just hearing projects. So I, I looked at these and I just want to be sure that we're meeting their bylaws because some of them are very, um, make recommendations on zoning, you know, stuff. Um, can't read them all because I have to read all my cell phone. I can't see it. Anyway, um, I think it's just being really cognizant of those responsibilities of the Planning Commission. And I do trust that how you're going forward, you're gonna do your best, but I would hope minimum, you would invite them to these key events as Planning Commissioners. I think it would save time. Okay. I think whether you going and giving them updates, anyway, that's, that's um, enough on that. Uh, I was intrigued by the, um, this is for the consultant, um, Less traditional outreach. I would. What would that be, for instance? I mean, like we'd all learn something on less traditional outreach, but maybe the consultant could answer that, or maybe you know what they have in mind. I'll take that um, question. Um, we know with public safety concerns and COVID, and now the fires in the community. Unfortunately, there's going to be some challenges, and so like if we could send a meeting in a box to people and have a little workbook for them to do and put their answers on social media or send it back to us. If we could have a little data walk where they go around a neighborhood and see different um, things about our economic analysis or our test fits and interact with exhibits, uh, we could do sidewalk talking to the neighborhoods, just thinking about new ways to reach people since not everyone uh, has the uh, means to engage online and uh, you know, engaging in person as a lot of obstacles. So just thinking uh, outside the box on how to engage our communities. Well, thank you. We're all struggling with how to engage under this. So, but those ideas are excellent. So thanks for elaborating on that. If you think of others, I'm sure I'll look forward to hearing about them or participating. Thanks. I think uh, Mayor Cummings, that was my, uh, that's all. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Sarah, and um, Urban Planning Partners. I'm excited to see how this process unfolds. Um, I have a question for you about uh, the, the kind of trajectory around the corridors planning process. As you know and saw in the timeline that Sarah uh, provided, I'm sure you already knew, uh, the, the council um, in August of 2019 did uh, move to uh, ensure that the 
the process uh, for general planning and zoning ordinance changes would um, would have as a, a pri as its highest priorities uh, protecting residential neighborhoods and existing local businesses and also prioritizing affordable housing and so I'm and I um, I'm glad you uh, reviewed and, and included the housing blueprint subcommittee uh, information in your in your proposal uh, I was on that uh, committee and it was in fact during that committee process that we we decided there and we kind of affirmed the idea that we wanted to put uh, those zoning reconciliations on hold because of all of the community uh, input and community input opposition really. So I'm just wondering how you're thinking about that. If you could talk about how you um, will, will try to um, use that, uh, you know, that as an underlying kind of uh, direction in the work that you're, you do. Um, sure, so I'll, I'll start in the narrative. If you have anything to add, um, feel free to jump in. Lee, also feel free to jump in here. Um, so yeah, so we are working with, you know, holding these principles of preserving and protecting existing neighborhoods and city businesses as a highest priority. Um, one of the first tasks under community engagement is, is defining and creating metrics for community character. And that's really where I see that principle being upheld. So what, and, and this goes back to the focus groups we held in the fall on this topic. Um, you know, to be quite frank, there was not a lot of consensus about what it meant, what a neighborhood was even. Like number one, how, what are the boundaries of my neighborhood? Number two, what does it mean to protect a neighborhood? Is that pro about protecting specific existing structures? Is that about protecting um, specific existing current residents? Or is that about maintaining a demographic feel of my neighborhood? People had all different answers to those questions. And that is gonna be a big part of this community engagement process is answering those. Do we care about every local business, including Taco Bell? They're local, they, you know, they're operating here. Um, do we want to prioritize certain businesses? What does that mean? And how, what kind of space do they need? You know, so as we think about this process is going to be largely focused on housing. So it is going to have less to do with businesses. And to the extent that we are talking about how mixed use housing happens, that's going to happen in the context with some commercial uses. So that is going to be a piece of the conversation. Um, and especially when we talk about how, you know, the process of a site might go through as it redevelops, um, you know, thinking about how our existing businesses might be accommodated through that process, whether our existing tools and processes that we have in place are sufficient to address those concerns or not. I mean, that's certainly going to be part of the conversation. The consultants are really tasked with developing objective standards for multifamily housing. So to the extent that we have existing um, single family neighborhoods, we're not really talking about them at this point based on the general plan. Um, should we get to a place where we're amending that pattern in the general plan, we might be talking about people's existing single family neighborhoods. Um, this gets into, you know, what are the boundaries of my neighborhood? Is SoCal Drive part of my part of a neighborhood or is it a separate entity? Um, and I think there are a variety of opinions about that in the community. I don't think the community is just of one mind about that. Um, so to sum up, <laughs> um, that is really gonna be the underpinning of a lot of that initial community outreach, defining what these terms mean and how folks wanna see them reflected in the final product. And I, I just have a, a follow-up question, uh, actually two now. Sarah, thank you for the uh, the response. Um, just one question for the consultants. I think this will be for the consultants. Um, I'm, I was interested to hear about the kind of innovative ways that you're uh, thinking about community engagement. And you mentioned chalking and kind of uh, getting uh, neighbors or you know community members out to, to kind of look at the the space to sort of envision what uh, things might look like. And I know that story polls are 
you know, often uh, we get a lot of recommendations to use them. Uh, we never seem to, um, but I think that they can be a really useful way of understanding what, uh, you know, especially when we're talking about higher density and height, what that might look like. So I'm just wondering if do you, have you used those in your own uh, work or would you consider that? It, it seems like it will be coming up in the public input portion of the process. I'm not quite familiar. Is it, you mean showing different stories of heights or stories as in, okay. Yeah. But story yeah. Is also, yeah, story poles are like physical poles that people put up that sort of outline a building so folks can get a sense of what the perimeter would look like. Yeah, and I have um, not used those in the context of objective design standards. We've used them frequently on projects, um, you know, that are in a design review. Uh, to evaluate them in the context of, uh, of that. Um, that's something to think about. It's, it, like I said, it's not something we've done before. Um, and so um, we can definitely brainstorm that and strategize with staff and think about how that um, may be helpful in the process. Um, I think it could get tricky, though. Um, because of the standards and kind of the process we're doing um, and picking an individual site to do that on and such. Um, but we can definitely consider it. And I want to just be sure that we're clear. Like, we will have um, products that help people visualize the change that would happen on some of these sites, that would help them envision compared to what's existing, compared to what's adjacent, what would this building look like? How tall would it be? What kind of shade would it cast? Um, what kind of trees might need to be removed? Where you know, so so things like that will definitely be included. Whether or not it's specifically a physical story pole on a physical property, um, that's something we'll have to think some more about. That's helpful. Uh, thank you. I I um, I think that one of the reasons that this comes up. Uh, is that, you know, so often when we are looking pro project specific, uh, you know, architectural renderings, they tend to show street views that kind of minimize the potential, the, what the impact on the view shed might be, or, you know, so I just want to make sure that we're talking about tools that allow people to really be able to see what, um, you know, what, what the changes might entail. Um, mm -hmm. And then I had another follow-up question for you, Sarah, but I think I will have to pull it up in my head from my okay. brain somewhere deep in the back of my my brain for later. So I'll leave it there okay. for now. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Vice Mayor Myers, and then I have maybe just a couple short questions, but go ahead, Donna. Yeah, I just, um, I just, uh, wanted to just make a comment about uh, the proposal. I did read through um, those materials. Um, and I'm just curious uh, if you designed this process sort of based on how we sort of issued our RFP, or is this something you guys have done in other communities of sort of like mind and like concern in terms of, you know, I think Santa Cruz, we picture ourselves as kind of maintaining this, a certain feel in our town, you know, and we, we like our houses and we like our small businesses and we like trying to maintain our historic buildings or at least the kind of the eclectic kind of, you know, feel to the community. And so I'm just curious, um, is this, um, I'm just curious about your proposal and whether or not, you know, this is something that's sort of generated out of kind of our desire of, of expressing what we wanted or just curious about your comments on that. Meredith, you want me to start or you want to jump in? Um, I can jump in and you can add on. Um, so it was based on a couple of things, uh, a, largely a review of what has been done. So with the housing blueprint subcommittee and the corridors plan, um, but also based on experience uh, working in other small towns and coastal communities and on contentious projects, um, housing and infrastructure. Uh, we do have a lot of experience with um, active communities and, you know, when change is coming, how, how to do placemaking and placekeeping. Um, and we also have Interethnica on our team who has a really great track record of working with diverse communities and um, really doing the research and the partnering 
working to get uh, different viewpoints in um, their community engagement process. Yeah, we, we are very committed to developing a unique approach for each community that we work in. And I will say for this, we dug pretty deep and um, spent a lot of time strategizing and brainstorming with our partners on the project um, to develop their approach we proposed. Yeah, I appreciate, uh, I do appreciate the team that you put together and um, and the proposal, and I, I do feel that this will serve our community well. This has been, change is always hard, and really at the, you know, at, at, everyone is gonna look at it from the neighborhood, they're gonna look at it from the neighborhood perspective. You know, they're, they, they know the corner they've been riding their bike by for 25 years, and there's always that fear of change. And so I really appreciate um, the way that you've approached this in terms of really trying to provide um, tangible ways for people to understand what these, what the, what their options are, and what change might look like within, you know, their scale of what it's like to be in their neighborhood, the scale of what it's like to be down, you know, walking down one of our one of our popular streets. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. I had a quick question. Um, just in terms of the process, if you could speak a little bit more, like so the next steps after you know, this gets approved, I guess what, what are some of the next steps in terms of timeline? I know um, you mentioned it before, but maybe if you could re just reiterate. Sure, yeah, no problem. Um, so the first thing we'll be doing is, so, so executing the contract, getting the consultant set up so we can you know, pay them for their work. Um, and then you know, the, ne the first thing we're gonna do is have a kickoff meeting. We're hoping that we'll be able to do that you know, one of the first two weeks in September to really get them going, do a download from staff about um, you know, where we are with the project, what we know about it, what we know about our local communities, hand off um, you know, our, uh, the planning documents they need to review, um, start, brainstorming about um, that long list of potentially affected interests. I think we had 150 of them on that list when we came in January. Um, uh, we're doing some refinement to that so that we're hitting the most important components um, that are representative of the whole city and also while well, still bringing it to a, um, a level that is really gonna be able to be accomplished. Um, so we're gonna be starting that right away in September and um, we will have that, you know, that the schedule for the, the community engagement strategy is to have that, I think, like the beginning of November and um, the schedule for the, um, the test fit of those couple of sites is like the end of November. So, you know, that's going to, all of that work is going to start rolling pretty immediately um, to, to get started. One thing that I would recommend, and maybe this can come forward later, but I think it would be good, you know, if we, if council approves of this today, I think it would be worth having this also go to the planning commission to get some kind of input before all that engagement starts happening, just so that you know, they have an opportunity to weigh in, in addition to council on this whole process as it's developing, since, you know, part of their role, I can see part of their role being, you know, really helping to inform this process and also just really getting buy-in, I think, across the board in terms of mm -hmm. how this is rolled out. So um, that's a recommendation and maybe we could consider that later, but um, just something that came to mind, if this is still in the development phases as it's continuing to be developed, just making sure that we have the planning commission involved in this process. So, so the only thing I would say about that is that we are really cognizant of our timeline. As I mentioned, it's pretty tight. We have about 15 months from today to, to complete it. Um, and so uh, I, you know, we can absolutely consult with the planning commission, we can go to them, we can speak with them. Um, and I, I would hope that we could also approve the contract today so that we can get started because we really are on a tight timeline. I would just add that one of the first things that we'll be doing is um, working on that community outreach strategy. And that community outreach strategy is something that we will be bringing to the planning commission. Uh, Sarah, do you have a timeline for when that um, would be completed roughly? Uh, beginning of November, the current project schedule is that that, would, that task would complete sometime in the first half of November. Okay. So uh, you know, we would get it to the planning commission you know, shortly thereafter. And I think that's part of you know what I was trying to address with those comments too is that you know just making sure that it's clear to council and members of the public the different 
you know, this is going to be developed, that, you know, the outreach strategy will be created, that will go to the planning commission. So, so it's clear that, you know, that there's engagement at all levels of the various um, levels of government with our commissioners, our council, and, and how that's going to be rolled out. Transparency, so, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Byers, and we're approaching 5 o'clock, and we should probably <laughs> continue moving on. <laughs> I'm really very excited at, and at the quality and the approach of this project. Um, I appreciate the value of community education early on. I'm not going to go into all my comments now. Starting this latest uh, discussion about the role of the planning commission, um, I think being cognizant of the timeline is so important that we actually get a quality project um, out of this. Um, my phone rang, sorry. Um, very often the city council will give directions, will go to the planning commission for comment, the planning commission make recommendations back to us, and then we hear it again and consider their recommendation. That's the back and forth. It's really time consuming considering the different steps. So I think I understand what our staff is saying and consultants. Certainly informing, engaging, and giving the planning commission opportunity to comment, but not not creating a time-consuming back and forth um, process that the emphasis should be on community engagement and moving forward with the pro I, I think this is very exciting, given that we uh, our level of control over these kind of projects or influence regulation is limited with a good product at the end is going to be beneficial. I have one question and a comment. Uh, when you listed the, the timeline for the step, I think number five was develop standards. Do I remember that from the very beginning? Um, task three is developing standards. Yeah. And then for the, I mean, I would assume number six or number five or whatever it is, is adopt the standards. I mean, <laughs> right. St sorry. Task four, I covered that one pretty quickly. Thank you for that. Yes, task four is public hearings. So public, with public hearings, but the goal yeah. is we don't just have them, we actually... Well, yes. we don't want to pre presuppose any action by a public hearing body. Um, we will be... Our yeah. commitment is to bring it before the Planning Commission, bring some kind of recommendation from them to you. Um, whether it's in a great, uh, you know, a recommendation you agree with will be obviously at your discretion. Yeah, got it. Anyway, very excited about the approach here. Council Members Brown, Council Member Byers, and then we'll, uh, after that, we'll just open up to public for public comment. Thank you. Well, I remembered my question, but since we've jumped into the fray of uh, discussing Planning Commission involvement, I'm going to make a comment first. <laughs> Um, so I know a majority of the council members uh, currently on the council have made clear their opposition to the planning commission uh, having a subcommittee and, and moving through a process with the consultants with a planning commission subcommittee. The reason I made that motion, and I know, Sarah, you were awfully polite in the way you framed the, 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 how it came up, and it, you know, it was, it was uh, contemplated. Um, I'm not sure that it really was. but. Um, given that, uh, you know, I thought this would be a way that, you know, and the, and the concerns about timelines, it, it seemed like having some kind of subcommittee, and I've been involved in many, many subcommittees as a council member, those are bodies that can move more nimbly, um, kind of make informal recommendations, engage in conversation, and so that was my hope uh, that, that that could happen with the consultants rather than going through all the formalities of the back and forth and back and forth. And I take, I, I really take issue with this because I, I don't think it's the council's job to pick and choose uh, when the planning commission is involved, depending on whether they like the makeup of the commission or not. Um, I'm just gonna say that. Um, but my question I do remember uh, is, if you could, I mean, I know we're very limited in terms of what objective standards can be, and Sarah, you've kind of thrown out a few ideas about what, what those might look like in terms of, you know, uh, materials and other things. I, if you could 
just ex say a little bit more about how you're envisioning, like, are you going to come up with possible objective standards, present them to co the community in conversation and ha get feedback? Or, you know, how will those be developed? And, uh, you know, it's, it, I just couldn't really tell from the, the agenda item, but it was very, which is very thorough, just, just a little <laughs> That's clarification okay. would be helpful. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I'll talk about it a little bit, and then I think I'm going to ask Meredith to sort of fill in. Um, so um, the first, what, these first steps of community engagement are about education and then defining that community character. Um, understanding like what are the features of structures, of frontages of structures, of roadways and public realms that make them feel good to people is gonna help us understand, you know, there's really a difference in how people feel between like an eight foot sidewalk and a 15 foot sidewalk. And also, you know what, it's different depending on how fast the traffic is on the street. And maybe there's a difference between, you know, what people like to see on Mission and what they like to see on SoCal. Um, you know, and so it's, we're gonna kind of be, that the initial phase is gonna be really kind of parsing that apart, like how fine grained are these or regulations gonna need to be in order to really um, reflect the desires of the community and the preferences that folks have. Um, and then what are those features that people really care about? And I would imagine that varies from one place to another place. You know, there are, um, you know, some, some places that are very concerned about architectural style and everything in the, in the you know, city has to be mission style, or at least in the downtown, you know, things like that. Um, I don't know that Santa Cruz feels that way. I think Santa Cruz has a more eclectic character. Um, I think that's something folks tend to appreciate and like about our city. So um, I would expect that, you know, including a variety of architectural styles might be, you know, some of that. So getting a sense of what folks like to see, that'll be sort of the first step. Um, and then, you know, combining that with the analysis that we do on the test fit sites and the economic sort of analysis that happens, um, we will start to try and develop a set of standards that we think reflect what the community has said, uh, respond to the economic realities of, um, you know, development of housing and mixed use projects. Um, and then we are going to illustrate those with um, diagrams, illustrations, photographs of other buildings that are you know, using these techniques and standards. Um, and then go to the community and say like, is it right? Did we get it? Um, you know, what needs to change? And that's that sort of refining step. Um, and the planning commission would be a part of that refining step. They would get, you know, they would participate in this visualization or, I mean, they would, you know, we would bring that to them at, as, at a hearing and they would, you know, comment and, you know, tell us to change X, Y, and Z and make Mission Street match Soquel or whatever they tell us. They probably wouldn't tell us that. Um, you know, and then with that refining and, um, you know, further input, then that will help us get to the, the final stage, which then would come back again to the planning commission for hearing and the public and the, I'm sorry, city council for that recommendation. Meredith, would you add anything to that? I, I think you did a great job. Thanks, Sarah. And I would just say what we're taking to the community is really trying to get the look and feel of these different scenarios because the average person can't, you know, weigh in if they want this setback or that setback. Um, so the visual, visualizations will be key. And I appreciate your comment also because it is kind of hard to think about what these objective standards will be. There are a couple different approaches to them. You can just give people a menu of these are acceptable options or you could do a performance standard as long as you meet this criteria, whatever, however way you wanna achieve that is okay. There's different typologies or uh, if it's on this type of court or these standards apply. Um, so it is uh, very nebulous at this point, but um, like Sarah said at that first stage when we hear from the community about what they would like to see that will help us narrow it down and figure out the right way to visualize it for the community and council and planning commission. Thank you. All right, council member Byers. Catherine, you're muted, by the way. Um, the report, I think it's eight pages, and it is an excellent report. It was very well done and lots of information. And I don't know whether 
um, the idea of picking up on uh, Mayor Cummings' suggestion, at least I think it would be nice if we sent that to the Planning Commission and, Sarah, you could just, this is what was passed by council. Here's the information, because it, it's so full of good information that it kind of kicks it off. So to me, it would kick it off for the Planning Commission if they had access to this document. You know, it's overdone, we've approved it, but I think, um, you know, I don't want to involve the cons um, consultants, don't have to be there, you present it, maybe. Anyway, that's, I don't know. I'd like to include that in the motion when someone gets around to a motion, because it's really, really a good document to read. I think you were part of the author. I don't know the other person. All right, if there's no further questions on this item at this time, um, I'm gonna open it up to public comment. So if any members of the public would like to speak to us on item number 20, update on general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation effort and approval of contract with urban planning partners for consultant services on the objective standard Senate Bill 2 grant, now is the time to call in. Once you've called into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will have up to two minutes to speak on this item. Hey all, this is Kyle Kelly. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted that um, people are, that we're, that we're gonna come up with a plan that will help address some of the uh, implicitly racist policies that have been within Santa Cruz and across you know, the rest of California in many cases. Um, and coastal California is a, is a place where we admittedly need more housing and we need to figure out how to make it more inclusive. And we need to think about how do we help uh, increase the diversity in Santa Cruz itself. Um, and I, I'm a little bit worried about having the Planning Commission have an outsized role um, within um, this process so that we don't get the same loudest voices on the Planning Commission uh, to effectively shout down the community uh, so that they don't get the same level of representation. Um, I understand some of them, you know, they, they, may, they may know a lot, but some of these people have also uh, been the ones to to help down zone and have made it so that we have less political will for building multifamily housing that can help a, a lot more people. Um, so I, I would really like to make sure that you know, everybody thinks about you know, whether we're, we're elevating some people to, uh, to a degree that, that causes outcomes um, that end up hurting, hurting a lot of people. And so I'd, I'd love for some time to be spent on what the impact of past policy positions has had on uh, both diversity and displacement. I think that's about it for me. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm sorry, right. I've raised my hand. I have raised my hand for the wrong issue. Um, I yield my time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's any other member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, uh, now is the time. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you'll be given two minutes to speak on, this, on item number 20, which is a general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation effort. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello, I'd like to uh, speak on the uh, possible proposal of uh, housing in the near future. Uh, I think that uh, as far as housing goes within our county, we need to be really urgent for our community members, specifically our working class in Santa Cruz County. Um, I feel that um, we've been doing way too many proposals for far too long on the, uh, housing or rather affordable housing um, we had. Uh, measures such as Measure M that was not passed to uh, kind of help uh, the working class residents in Santa Cruz County. Uh, there's been many opportunities to really uh, focus on this issue as far as housing goes, but it's been a really lackadaisical issue, I feel, on 
the issue of housing because we feel that affordable housing it uh, leaves an eyesore within our community. Uh, it brings in the wrong crime or it brings in the wrong element, which is ridiculous. I feel uh, me uh, personally being under affordable housing um, is also as a negative stigma put upon our community members who live under affordable housing, which I feel it needs to be more of. And um, if we're going to talk about proposing uh, community outreach, uh, the first people group of people we need to ask is our community members, specifically uh, the people we were talking about earlier, street vendors, uh, people who are working class citizens in the food industry downtown and as well as er other areas in the Santa Cruz community. And um, I feel that more needs to be done and needs to be more urgent. I urge our community members to be more diligent and to be more hands-on instead of passing the buck to other outside forces and entities. I feel that first of all, we need to have our community members to be up and foremost within dealing with these issues instead of passing the issue to uh, outside community forces who have no idea about the Santa Cruz community with all due respect. And also we need to uh, really need to be more urgent in urging these outside forces to bind up so much property in the Santa Cruz community. Um, Walgreens that just shut down uh, is owned by a private property that has perfect space for affordable housing as well as many other properties in the downtown region. So thank you for your time. Last four digits of your phone number, 4965, you're on the line. Hello? Hello. Good evening. Yes, sorry. Wasn't sure if I was on. Uh, yes, my name is Candace Brown, and I live on the east side um, along the SoCal corridor. Um, I was very actively involved in the corridor advisory committee and filmed all of it um, and, and actually had the only recording of it at this point. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that was not properly documented before the advanced planning manager and um, other planner left. Um, but I think there's a lot of information in that that is very worthwhile looking at because it brought up a lot of issues around the mass density um, inadequacy of parking and the fact that there's not an existing infrastructure in very narrow parcels. Uh, throughout the 36 uh, acres, if you included all the different aspects of the parcels designated at that time. The other thing I wanted to mention is that with the downtown update plan, uh, they did set up a technical advisory committee, which was very successful, and it, they went and they met over a six-month period. They were very hardworking, and, um, they, and I think it was a very effective and efficient process. So I think I am very surprised um, that in a sense this has been criticized by not allowing the Planning Commission to go through their normal process. And um, I think it um, would be a better process. I also want to mention that the community um, has a lot of input, a great input, and in, in fact the 708 Water Street affordable housing for low income and developmentally disabled was so successful because of the significant input of the community uh, over three major community meetings. And it also was because the developer was very open to that feedback. And I think everybody's quite happy with that project. I also want to mention as a transportation commissioner, the transportation issues would be key. And I hope they will be brought into that discussion also. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. If there's any other member of the public who'd like to call in, now's the time. Please press star nine on your phone and you'll be given two minutes to speak on item number 20. Okay, so seeing no remember, remaining members of the public who'd like to speak on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action deliberation. Council member Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for your questions and for, for the, the public input as well as for the consultants here. I just had a, a few comments, and then I'm happy to um, to move the, move the recommendation by the staff. Um, 
um, one of the things that I think, and I don't think we have to go into all of this right now, but you know, as we're looking at um, design standards and um, thinking about our most recent uh, fires, how are we thinking about integrating resilience into those standards and uh, our, our ability to withstand, um, you know, extreme weather events? So I know that uh, it's a bigger conversation, but I think it's an important one to mention considering what's happening with climate change. I just also want to um, ensure that as the work also continues that we uh, are uh, aware of the health and all policies work that's underway and um, also some of the outreach that is currently being uh, conducted by Tiffany Wise West uh, in terms of how to uh, reach our, our vulnerable community members through the Resilient Coast and Climate Action Plan and um, <laughs> it's great that meaningful way, uh, as well as not trying to oversaturate with uh, outreach to, to uh, specific community members uh, with various sort of efforts within the city. So how are we sort of, you know, being synergistic with that? Um, and then lastly, I guess I would just say is how are we building this into our uh, recovery and our processes around engagement as we think about recovery moving forward? So just sort of trying to make sure that uh, internally we're all aware of what's happening and what's underway and how we can have the foresight to, to uh, bring forward really good policy that's going to be resilient in the future. Um, so with that, I'm prepared to move the recommendation. And I know that um, it, it's always tricky in terms of how to balance uh, input and process and, and I think the, the work that's gone into have uh, various checkpoints along the way in terms of how to engage with our, our planning commission as well as um, really keeping a broader understanding of how to outreach the voices that we haven't necessarily heard from traditionally. So uh, with that, I'm happy to move the recommendation as presented in our agenda report. Okay, so we have a motion by council member Watkins, council member Matthews. I'm happy to second the motion. Um, I will make a couple of comments. Uh, emphasizing again, this is about multifamily housing. So uh, a couple of speakers <laughs> spoke about the, the housing crisis here, and it is explicitly designed to uh, create a, a better path forward for uh, specifically multifamily housing. Uh, I am pleased to see the optional parking path included as an optional, but certainly uh, the parking issues are huge in some areas, not so much in others, but I think that will be a necessary uh, component. And I would be quite comfortable in the third item, if it's agreeable to the maker of a motion, to add uh, the words and invite planning commission input as the project progresses. It says that amendment accepted by the maker of the motion. Sure. Can I get the, that repeated? It was breaking sure. out. Yeah. Um, so that number three would read, direct staff to invite the planning commission to significant outreach events, incorporate regular updates to the planning commission into the project schedule, and invite planning commission input as the project progresses. I just wanted to ask the question. So the the change to the way the in, the planning commission might be engaged doesn't seem like it's a substantive change to me. Um, but I, I did want to just go back to the question that Council Member Byers raised early on about um, at a minimum uh, making the creating the opportunity of these public events for planning commissioners to be there as planning commissioners and publicly notice those meetings. I mean, I imagine we're going to be publicly noticing them anyway. Um, so I'd like to make sure that happens. So Council Member Brown, I'm wondering if, if there's a, if there's wording that you can include to, that can be included as a friendly amendment that you'd like to. Um, okay. So, 
I don't have the thing pulled up. So um, just as a as part of number three, uh, to uh, uh, in, I'm. I'll use the word invite, but it's not, it, I, like, like Council Member Byers said, it seems a little insulting, but um, uh, uh, invite planning commissioners to attend uh, public meetings as members of the planning, in their official capacity as members of the planning commission, uh, publicly noticed so that uh, a quorum of uh, planning commissioners can attend. <laughs> Is that in addition to or replacing something? No, I think it's in addition to. As part of that number three, though, it's just a, you know, additional. If I. Sure, Councilor Matthews. Yeah, I, if I could just say as a seconder, I, um, that seems cumbersome and not really necessary. Um, they're specifically called out directing staff to invite planning commissions to significant outreach events. Um, we, we could just say, uh, including Brown Act notification. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. that does it. It doesn't give them special status, but it just means notice that they were all some the next yeah. year. So, Tony, I, is I, that? Oh, go ahead. I, sorry, Justin. I'm comfortable with that. I just wanted to ensure that that was legally. Yeah, that's what I was going to do as well. I don't see any problem with that. Okay. Okay. Good. Right. Take my hand down. Okay. Um, any further questions or comments, Councilmember Brown? Um, no. Oh, I do have some, but I'll, uh, in the interest of time, I'll uh, spare you. <laughs> Uh, Councilmember Matthews. Um, well, I'm, as for the motion, that's it. I have one final comment I want to make. Is it time to do okay. it? Um, sure. I have a, <laughs> a, a, a question to ask regarding a comment made by Councilmember Byers earlier, but you can go ahead. Um, this is a side comment. Um, we are going into now the first three months or so of this process. Um, it will be carried out for the nine months, I'm figuring out numbers, following at least two members of the city council would be different at that time. So I would also encourage that planning staff reach out to council candidates and just know this is a big deal. <laughs> and it will be a different council that digests the final report. So I would suggest that the candidates are made aware of this and made, made aware of the community input. Everyone's running for housing. Everyone's running for affordable housing. This is, and they're running for community. So that's my only comment. <laughs> Let the candidates get in on the ground floor on this one. Okay. Uh, the one comment I had was something that Council Member Byers brought up regarding the um, this item going to the planning or the the approval going to the planning commission for discussion that was brought up earlier. And um, maybe staff could comment on this, but I'm wondering if we could direct the, that um, this report be sent to the Planning Commission for their first meeting in September, given that um, sounded like Council, Council Member Byers, that was something that you had brought up earlier, and it seemed like that was something that Council Members were kind of nodding their heads to, saying, okay. <laughs> okay. Council Member Matthews. On that issue specifically, it's one thing to have it go to the Planning Commission for a discussion, information, explanation of the process, et cetera, but not for approval. And I think even several, several people said that. I said that. Okay, yeah. yeah, got it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm wondering if we can include in the motion that we send uh, the approved document to the um, Planning Commission for discussion at the first meeting in September. I, you know, I don't think... No, personally, I don't think we see the motion because it's the additional direction. Or oh, sorry, yeah, it's a friendly amendment, not a motion. Yeah. Sorry. I just, um, as a maker of the motion, I guess I would just ask if that's possible given the the agenda. I mean, I don't know what they currently have on queue to be on that agenda, but if if they can accommodate that, then I'm happy with that timeline. 
We're, we currently have the uh, Front Riverfront project. Um, it's 175 units um, across from the um, the uh, Metro Pacific Station, uh, between Metro Pacific Station and the river on that agenda. Um, so that is, it's a big uh, project, but um, you know, as far as a referral goes, um, you know, we can just put these items on there and if, if the Planning Commission chooses to discuss them, they have that opportunity. Okay. So I'm, is that something the amendment accepted then? Yeah. And, and you know, for my purposes, I would say uh, that date is not a fall on your sword issue. I would say right. or next reasonably available on the on that we work on it. Right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We've got we've got a lot of things lined up for the PC. I think uh, we'll, and this, we'll get into them as soon as we can. Yeah, and this is more of an informational than a full on. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think I think early September might be better because late September we've got the wharf and various yeah. other things <laughs> moving forward. Okay. Great. Uh, Council Member Byers. Real quick to the item you were just discussing. I uh, yeah I. We're going to approve it, so they don't need to get it instantly. But I think it's important, but also important, um, uh, um, Mr. Butler, that Sarah or someone or yourself uh, go over it with them or, or show them the importance of it. I wouldn't just say, here's the, if you get around to read it, you may want to discuss it. But I think it's important that they're given a presentation on it. They're going to be involved for you know this year on it, and it's a good document, an important document. So I think they deserve some introduction to it in you know 15 minutes. That's all. That's all. Okay. All right. If there's no further discussion, I think we're ready to move forward um, with the roll call vote on this item. Councilmember Byers. Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Um, why don't we take a, why don't we reconvene at 5.30 um, and we're, we'll try to get through these. I think we have three more items that we need to get through. And I know that some council members need to jump off, so hopefully we can make it through um, some of these before seven, so. Hey, Cynthia. Yes. Can I give you a call so we can try to work on your audio? It's really bad. Yeah. Okay, I'll call you. Okay. general business for the AB 2162 affordable supportive housing projects increase the number of units allowed as a use by right. For members of the public who are streaming, if you'd like to comment on this item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Uh, the order will be a presentation by staff followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and return to the council for action and deliberation. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Matt Von Wa, Principal Planner, to uh, present on this item. Great. Good evening, Council. Let me get the PowerPoint up here. Can you see that okay? Yes. Yep. Great. All right. Thank you again. I'm presenting on State Assembly Bill 2162. And uh, AB 2162 uh, was signed into law in 2018. And it was really to streamline supportive housing uh, only in zones where multifamily and mixed use development is permitted. And supportive housing is defined uh, as 100% affordable to lower income with 25% or 12 units, whichever, whichever is greater, dedicated to supportive housing and services for homeless individuals. 
And part of the streamlining included uh, making supportive housing as a use by right. And use by right really means uh, it does not require a discretionary review like a use permit. Uh, also under this bill, uh, it, it would not require a CEQA process and projects could also receive significant parking reductions if they're located close to quality transit stops. And then finally, uh, the state law requires that projects 50 units or fewer uh, be, as, be a, a use by right for a city the size of Santa Cruz. But the bill does allow for that limit to be increased uh, as, as a city policy. And we're here before you today, uh, the staff recommending that that be increased uh, for three specific projects. And those supportive housing projects, uh, the first one is New Way Homes at 115 Coral Street. Uh, and that's 121 units. And it's already been submitted to planning and it's, and it's far along in that process and has already been deemed exempt from CEQA. Uh, additionally, the applicants are likely to continue that formal process, including a planning commission meeting and may or may not need this uh, additional streamlining, uh, but do wish to stay in, involved if, uh, if it were to pass. Uh, the second project is Pacific Station South, which is a city owned property uh, on Pacific and Front, and that's uh, 85 units uh, and includes a nonprofit clinic, uh, Dientes. And that project would be seeking uh, a 100 unit limit, but it's currently still only at, at 85 units of the proposal. And this project is especially important in that it's eligible for up to $10 million in competitive state funding uh, if it is deemed a ministerial approval through AB 2162. And, and the final project is 314 Jesse Street, which is currently a 50 unit proposal. Uh, and it's still very in, the, in a very preliminary and conceptual feasibility analysis stage. And it really may stay at 50 units, uh, so there would only be two projects going forward uh, with this policy uh, for streamlining those projects. And then through this process, the city can really decide if design permits uh, should be required. And staff recommends that they be required for projects on private property, but not for ones on public property. And uh, staff, staff wishes to clarify that this would be a requirement uh, for all AB 2162 projects, not just the ones that we're talking about today that might be over 50 units. Additionally, uh, uh, all projects, whether they're public or private, uh, we would want to in, uh, have at least one community meeting and for both of those things, uh, those changes are reflected in an updated uh, resolution language that I'll, I'll show you at the end of the presentation. Uh, but as far as the design permit goes, uh, the public uh, for a project that's on city owned property, the city is in a position to have uh, a great deal of control over those development outcomes. So it's not very necessary for, uh, for a design permit on public property. Um, but for, public, for projects on private property, a design permit would allow staff to place conditions of approval on the project so long as they don't hinder that development, uh, for instance, tree replacement. Um, and then finally, if, if a design permit were required for the private property projects, staff recommends that there be an administrative approval process. So the design permit process would add some time and cost. Uh, to the project, and it's, it's, it's vital to maintain some amount of streamlining through this for these projects. So uh, we really feel that the approach to having an administrative approval process would reduce the cost and processing times for applicants while still offering uh, community participation and the ability to influence the process. And so finally, the, the benefits of this are really that it you know, streamlines and encourages the product production of affordable and supportive housing, uh, which we feel is very important for the community. It also helps the city of Santa Cruz achieve lower income affordable housing goals. 
um, especially given the focus of this bill on supportive and lower income housing. Um, the city of Santa Cruz, uh, based on our uh, regional housing needs allocation numbers, uh, really needs more very low income housing. Uh, and the projects before you uh, re really seek to add those types of units to the city. And then finally, the, the policy is, is only for these three projects currently. Uh, so the effect of this policy is really defined and has a has a specific has a specific goal to help these three projects. So if if any further projects were to come forward to also ask for this additional stream streamlining policy, council could decide so at a later date. And so here is the resolution language before you with those uh, with those additional clarifications uh, towards the end, uh, highlighting the community engagement process, as well as uh, making sure that the, that the requirements for the design permit are for all proposals and not just the ones over 50 units. So that includes staff presentation. Thank you very much, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much for that presentation and for bringing this item forward to us at this time. Um, I had, a, well, I'll let other council members ask questions first, but I do have a couple questions regarding the, um, the design review process as it relates to this. So, uh, council member Matthews and then council member Byers. A couple of uh, points. In your uh, introduction, you talked about the Pacific Station South having the Diente Clinic located there, but I believe that Santa Cruz Community Health Centers is also to be co-located there. So it's really two different community health clinics. I believe I'm correct on that. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, just got a wit here from our economic development housing team that can help with clarifying that. Jessica? Yeah, that's correct. It's, it's the community health center as well as Dientes. Yeah. Together. Yeah, both, both clinics. And uh, I do want to uh, appreciate you for including the change that there would, at the very least, be community meetings about the design. I understand the reason for not requiring the design permit on a project on public land, but to my mind, having some opportunity to engage the public in response and feedback on design was important without slowing down the process. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, that change. Yes, the affordable housing developer is planning to have a community engagement meeting. It's just really getting through that ministerial process to be able to be competitive for the state funding. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Any other council members with questions at this time? I had a question just regarding the process um, as it relates to council approval of the designs. Is that something that was, so would these come to council in terms of, um, you know, having final approval on the designs of these projects just to ensure that we're going to be responding to the public, you know, concern around the design and, and if we don't have any control on that. I'm just kind of curious, like, how that might impact. Okay. They, they, they would not. Um, I, the, the way it's proposed currently, if, if a project did need a design permit, it would go through a design process, a design review process, uh, but that would be approved administratively through, through the planning division. If I may add, I know for the Pacific Station project, we are planning to reach out to the housing uh, subcommittee that city of uh, uh, subset of the city council members, so they will be actively involved in, in uh, you know, the city-owned projects. Okay. Um, Vice Mayor Myers, Council Member Brown, and Council Member Byers. Oh, I apologize. I didn't realize my video was off. Um, yeah, hi, thank you, Jessica. Um, I just was hoping for some clarification. I heard a, a very big number um, discussed just now about the Pacific Station uh, project. So I just was wondering if you could maybe just give us a quick little update. Sounds like sounds like a very promising situation. So maybe just a, you know, I know it's not part of this agenda per se, but I'm just curious about that. Sorry, yeah. I'm getting a big echo. 
No Thank problem. you. So I, I, we do actually have the affordable housing developer here on the line as well if they want to add in. But um, essentially there's some state housing and community development funding that is called, the program is called Transit Oriented Development. And the funding had, the last time this funding NOFA, sorry, notice of funding availability was issued was back in 2014. They happened, the state happened to issue this NOFA two months ago and happened to be right in the middle of, uh, you know, city council recess when we had to apply. Um, and so we took the bold effort of trying to get an application in um, to, to be able to fund the affordable housing component of this project. Um, it's, it's, it's up to 10 million. We have, our funding request is for 10 million. Um, and it is looking very favorable that we could potentially uh, be able to be awarded this this funding, and part of this is if the project is able to utilize the 2162. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Byers. Yeah, thank you. I first I want to say I totally support this. I'm thrilled about the potential to get these affordable units built. Um, it, I mean, it, this is something that obviously uh, is uh, very important to all of us, and I've been working on it diligently. It's kind of one of my main fo focuses here on the council. I just want to make sure that uh, I understand, so, and maybe we can just make sure that the community understands the implications of this. And so the council will not determine, there won't be a design review process that the council needs to approve. But there are places along the way that the council ha is involved in the, in these projects, right? I mean, we are, so what are the, I mean, certainly in terms of, you know, funding, any dedicated funding, you know, dedication of land, et cetera. Um, but just, just to make sure that it's clear for the public and for all of us what we, um, what role we will play absent the design review process. And I know that could vary, but just, just a little explanation of that would be helpful. Correct. So ultimately there would be at least one community meeting for those projects on, on, on private property and public property. And so for those projects that would be on private property requiring a, a design permit, it, it would still go through planning, but ultimately there, there would be that community process and that would still be a time to get feedback from, and from anyone in the community, including council on, on what that design uh, could and should look like. And that will certainly go into the, the, the process. Thanks. If I could just ask a follow up. So would there, I mean, it's not saying that there would need to be council approval, but is there the opportunity for these projects to come to council you know, presentations to come to council where we can provide input. Um, and so it's not per se that we were approving or rejecting the project, but more along the lines of in addition to those community meetings, is there an opportunity for these projects to come to council um, for discussion and for recommendations? For, for these projects that are over 50 units that we're uh, looking to add policy on, um, that certainly is a possibility. Um, however, we, we do want to encourage the streamlining of these as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and additional community or additional council meetings uh, could add to that timeline and, and cost on those applicants. So one thing I would add, and thank you, I, I agree with that in terms of, you know, the point, uh, a large part of this is streamlining the applications. Um, mm -hmm. And um, not all of these development applications would even go to the city council in the first place. The one, for example, that um, is proposed on Coral Street um, likely is not going to take advantage of this, even though we've got it in there. You know, we, we focused on doing this for the Pacific Station South, and we said, hey, maybe these other two projects uh, could benefit as well. Um, one of the uh, criteria is public funding. That Coral Street project um, 
may not have any public funding in it and they may choose to actually decline any public funding that we provide um, because that would trigger prevailing wage, which um, may cost them more than we would be able to provide to them. And so um, they may not have any public funding and they may wanna go through the regular process, which they're well on their way to completing at this point. And that would just bring them to the planning commission for a final decision. And so depending on the application, it may not even trigger a council review. And um, one of the things that uh, we wanted to do as part of this, you know, with the streamlining was minimize that timeline and, uh, and get these projects moving. So as, as Matt mentioned, that is uh, doing an administrative approval is one way to save a, a decent chunk of time in the um, application processing. Councilmember Matthews. And I just want to um, clarify for my own purposes, and I think for others, um, any uh, project that was going after this kind of um, uh, uh, resolution benefit um, that had the uh, affordable and supportive housing would not require, would, would require at least one community meeting the private project would require a design permit, but that would be issued at the administrative level, not at the city council level. And the project on city property would not even require that. So basically it's a trade-off between getting a better rating for access to this state money in return for less control over the design. That, that's the trade-off for us, um, which I am willing to make. <laughs> I, and so I think to the, kind of to your point, to, your point to, the extent that council, to the extent that council members want to have input or knowledge of the design issues, it seems to me, and staff can respond to this, that they should just go to the community design <laughs> And that's, that's the trade-off for us. So maybe staff can, comment on if I've understood that correctly. We, we get a better rating if we streamline the process. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh, you, your, your overview was uh, exact. Okay. Okay, if there's no further comment, oh, council member Byers. You're muted, by the way. The council can pull up things, you know, on appeals or they can bring items to the council. Let's say uh, I'm, you know, supportive of this, but what if there is a project that's so controversial and it's so prominent wherever it's gonna land? Can we pull that to the council for review? So that's, that's why we, we initially focused on just these three projects. Uh, we feel it provides oh, you're right. uh, a you. great deal of control. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I forgot as far you as, did. As far as projects under 50 units, we, we already don't have that control because the, right. that's a state requirement. Yes, I understand. I forgot about the three. Great, I'm done. Okay, if there's no further comment, um, let's move to um, public comment on this item. So if there's members of the public who would like to speak to item 21, AB 2162, affordable supportive housing projects, increase in the number of units allowed as a use by right. Um, now is the time to call in. Once you've entered the meeting, please press star nine on your phone and you will be given two minutes to speak. Online. Yes, uh, my name is Rafa Sonnenfeld. Uh, I've served on the Community Advisory Committee on Hom Homelessness, and um, I'm really enthusiastic about this idea of streamlining supportive housing projects uh, in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I, I think at the very least, you know, these three projects are, are really something that our community is definitely going to benefit from. Um, but I am worried that we're not going far enough. I'd really like us to streamline more supportive housing projects in the future. Um, I, I know that uh, the 
uh, supportive housing is can be a controversial thing for our community, and and we're just not going to get stuff built, and we're not going to solve homelessness for the city of Santa Cruz if uh, if we don't. Uh, make some efforts to streamline the the process uh, otherwise it will just end up getting delayed and delayed and delayed i'm also worried that uh our uh homelessness point in time count is is um too low uh i believe we had something like 1200 people counted in 2018 but uh that didn't account there wasn't a uh, account of anyone in pogo nip at that time and that's done in the middle of the winter and we know typically that we have more people in the summer so i think we could probably say that that we have 1500 people who are experiencing homelessness in the city of santa cruz already and we should follow that under state law Yeah, good evening, uh, Jim Remler with Board of Future Housing. Um, really appreciate your time this evening. I know it's been a, a long meeting and um, especially stressful with everything going on. I, I just wanted to echo that um, we are absolutely uh, committed to uh, engaging with not only the community, but also um, the city. This really is a unique and exciting um, project because it, it is really a partnership. Um, the city is, I wanted to mention also, the, you know, the city is retaining the land. There's commercial components that, um, you know, the city will be involved in. So I, I absolutely am committed to um, engaging the uh, various stakeholders and the city. The reality is that, you know, these funding sources that we go after are so um, oversubscribed and it's so challenging that um, this is extremely helpful and you know, we're optimistic that we hopefully can um, get this large piece of funding. And I'm happy to answer any other questions uh, that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, next caller on the line. Hey, this is Kyle Kelly. Uh, I just want to speak in strong support of streamlining supportive housing and affordable housing. Uh, and I hope that we can do it for even more projects. Uh, we're, we have a severe need here. Uh, and affordable housing developers already have to go through quite a bit, face quite a bit of opposition. Uh, and meanwhile, while we wait and we create new process, we're preventing people from getting homes <clears throat> that, that otherwise could, could be housed much sooner. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, again, so if you'd like to speak to this item, please press star nine on your phone. Um, you will be unmuted uh, and you'll be allowed to have two minutes. Okay. You're uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Hall and um, I'm I certainly want to voice my uh, support for streamlining the process of affordable housing. I've seen affordable housing projects that just get mired in detail. But I do want to add a cautionary note, and that is I think it's one thing to have uh, a streamlined process that um, uh, minimizes um, uh, city council and community input uh, when it's in relatively um, – unproblematic areas or areas that are not central to the character of Santa Cruz as a city. But it does concern me that um, the uh, council would not have um, uh, review uh, capacity as a council for the Pacific Station uh, South project. I think that's a huge difference. That's right on uh, Pacific Avenue in uh, the heart of the city. I also think it's highly problematic that city-owned land not uh, have a design uh, permit required. Uh, these are things 
things that really matter to the citizens of Santa Cruz, that we have a process where there is review. I don't know why city-owned land wouldn't be subjected to the same kind of review process as other kinds of, of land. So it strikes me that, uh, especially with controversial projects, uh, this is uh, just an unfortunate way of failing to develop a consensus about a good project, and we want to develop a consensus about a good project. So I'd like to see uh, Pacific Station South uh, um, have a full review from the city council and other city-owned uh, uh, land projects that have design review. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further comments from the public, I'm gonna bring it back to council for action deliberation. Council Member Matthews. Um, I am happy to go ahead and move the recommendation before us. I do wanna note that we got correspondence from the Santa Cruz Community Health Centers also supporting this um, came in late. So that's just for the record, I think, yeah. There you go. Um, so with that, just having made that announcement, I will go ahead and move that we adopt the, re the revised resolution establishing a policy authorizing an increase in the 50 unit use by right limit to a limit of 125 units for one specified project and 100 units for two specified projects of affordable, supportive housing development that complies with requirements set in California State Assembly Bill 2162. So motion by Councilmember Matthews. Councilmember Brown, I see your hands raised. Yeah, second, I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, second by Councilmember Brown. Uh, vice, uh, I think that's, that's it, so. Um, is there any further discussion from council members? Hearing none, uh, I'd just like to say that um, I'm excited to see what can come forward with this, and I think it'll be an opportunity for us to see how this process works for bringing it, for streamlining these um, affordable housing projects, and we'll get a sense from this process how we might be able to improve on it moving forward since it's just three projects. And with that, I'll call on the clerk to uh, call the vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Oh, aye. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Um, hopefully we can move through the next item. Um, we might um, we might run into an issue with our last item because I think we might have uh, council members leaving, but hopefully we can get to these and get through this one fairly quickly. Uh, next item on our agenda is authorizing is item number 22, authorizing the mayor to respond to the Santa Cruz County School Grand Jury on behalf of the city of Santa Cruz. And presenter is Ralph Demerica, principal management analyst. Hey, good evening, um, Mayor Cummings and uh, members of the City Council. Uh, Ralph America, Principal Management Analyst, and um, I'm here today to um, uh, request that Council authorize the Mayor to respond to the uh, grand jury reports that the Council, the City Council, is required to respond to. Um, each year, the Civil Grand Jury issues reports and requires certain agencies and departments to respond. Um, in many cases, the respondents are department heads and administrators. In some other cases, um, the respondent is the agency itself. Uh, so this year, the grand jury issued 10 reports. Um, out of the 10, um, seven require responses from the city council. And uh, consistent with the approach and uh, process that previous councils have adopted for responding to these reports, um, council tonight is uh, being requested to authorize the mayor to respond on behalf of the council to the seven published um, grand jury reports that require responses from the city council. Um, council also has the option to authorize the mayor to respond to specific reports and have the remaining reports presented at a future council meeting for the full council to discuss as well. 
And um, for the reports that the mayor is authorized to respond to, um, staff will be there to help um, draft some responses uh, uh, for the mayor. And um, we will be submitting it to the grand jury um, pending the mayor's approval. Um, so staff's recommendation tonight is to authorize the mayor to um, respond to all seven um, of the uh, reports or um, for council to provide direction as to which reports uh, council would like brought back to the full council for discussion. Thank you. Um, if there's any questions from council members, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I don't have a question. I'd, I would be ready to uh, make a motion. I think that uh, one one report in particular is interest, of interest to me to allow um, possibly council members to engage it with staff on some of the um, the report outs. Uh, I, I'm particularly um, thinking about the report that had to do with the I can't remember the name of it. It's the discord basically that happened last year. Um, I do think that um, potentially having maybe one council member uh, participate in that. Um, there's there's a lot of us that were involved in some of those situations and I think it would be best if we had sort of an impartial sort of process around some of those some of those questions that need to be answered. So I don't know if the city manager could work with work on that city manager's office. So I'd like to just try to clarify that in a motion at some point. Thank you. Councilmember Byers. Well, I just want to, I understand the role that we review these responses and our name, right, the mayor signs them, but it's, it's really our response. I think we have an obligation um, and a role to play in them. Now, do we need all of them to come back? Uh, I would say, yes, we should get them all, go through them quick, read them. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but I certainly feel there's some serious issues on some of them, some serious recommendations. Uh, and I want to be sure in our responding that we are going to respond to those recommendations. Yes, we will work on this. It's in the works or whatever we do, especially the homeless one and the one on uh, the city government or whatever it was called. Oh, what a tangled web we weave, I think no. is the name of it. Uh -huh. No, it's the failure, failure to communicate. Failure to oh, communicate. is that it? What's the tangled web one? <laughs> Somebody remind me what that was. Oh, the website. Oh, the website. Oh, God. I don't care. That's fine. But the homeless one, um, yeah, the failure to communicate. I'm sorry. I know um, for me, I trust Tony is going to respond to the golf course one. I think many of the recommendations are probably in the work. So. But um, the homeless one and the well, failure to communicate for sure. Anyway. That's where I am, but uh, we, we, we really have a role to play. And I think it's written in state law. So I I want them to come back before they are sent to the, before we get to input in them. I would say a draft of the response, not just the final response, but we should have a draft stage. Only two of them, even though our obligation is to be sure and review all of them. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Brown, and then I have a couple of comments I'd like to make. In for consideration as well. Councilmember Matt. Well, uh, yeah, I know the staff has been working already on the uh, responses to quite a few of these. And I should say just for the um, public information, although seven of these require a response by the city, they're not all directed exclusively at the city. Some of them are about um, issues involving multiple public agencies. So just to clarify that. Um, uh, I generally support the idea of um, the mayor um, working with the staff on the uh, responses that are already being prepared in draft form. Um, I would like to uh, explicitly direct that the um, council members be invited to contact the mayor and city manager about the specific issues or suggestions or observations that they have. I think these are gonna be probably 
um, a, a good variety on some of them, probably very little on others. Um, but I think that would be a service um, as we develop even a working draft. If we can all say by, I'm trying to pick a date out of the hat, I think we've all probably read them. If we could get our own personal comments to the mayor and city manager by September 4th, that gives, gives them a time to uh, understand the landscape and try and incorporate those into the draft. Um, so that that would be my suggestion moving forward, um, and that they feel free to engage other council members as they feel appropriate individually. And we're we're aware of the Brown Act, and um, just functionally, I think uh, we it, it doesn't it doesn't serve us well to have work in progress drafts floating out in the public. I think we should do our best as a as the city and council to come up with um, our best effort at the draft, at, at, the, at the statement. Um, I have talked with the city manager about this and also with the mayor. And um, also I think to the extent that council members have um, strong personal input on these, that, that they can review the working draft with one-on-one um, -on -one, um, with the city manager and mayor. Um, that's just kind of my take on it, so that we get a, a well-fleshed out um, document ready to submit. So I would just put that forward as a, a process. If I can just, just well, Council Member Brown and then uh, Council Member Byers. If, Mayor, if you want to respond directly to that, I, I kind of am too, but you're welcome to go first if you want to. It's up to you. No, go ahead. Okay. Well, I'll just say quickly that I um, am not comfortable with uh, delegating that authority. Uh, I think it's inappropriate to expect the mayor and, and, and just unfair to expect the mayor to be responsible for uh, having you know, be, having, being the, per, the, the council, the member of this governing body that uh, make, responds. Uh, and I think that we all have a responsibility to weigh in, I agree. Um, but I also think that the public has a right to um, be made aware of the type of response that we're gonna give. The state law, state law does require the governing body to respond. And if my name is mm -hmm. gonna be on it, I wanna have a chance to see it before it is sent and made and then made public. I think that we ought to, um, at a minimum, as Council Member Byers suggests, um, get, provide some direction and then be willing to weigh in individually um, along the lines of what Council Member Matthews suggests. But I think they need to come back to us for uh, approval before they are sent to the grand jury as a response. And in particular, uh, I think that the two that, that um, Council Member Byers pointed out, failure to communicate and homelessness, there are some really, really significant uh, recommendations there. And another reason I don't think it's appropriate for the mayor to kind of be put in the position of being the, per, the individual responding as a representative of this governing body um, without any authority to implement any of the recommendations unilaterally, um, that it ought to be uh, decision that comes to the council. I mean, a lot of the, the recommendations would need council approval if we were to move forward. And so I think it's, it's important that we uh, be fully engaged in that process. If I may, I just want to clarify one, one quick item with respect to uh, council member Matthews' uh, suggested approach. I think uh, to avoid Brown Act uh, issues, what the, the way it would have to work is that the council members would provide input to staff regarding any of the reports that they may want to, and then we would work with the mayor to uh, to finalize that. Uh, so that's that's the, just to clarify, that would be the way to do it without uh, so we would violate the Brown Act. Just want to clarify that. However, that does not give council members the ability to approve or not approve of what gets sent. If I, you know, I can give you my my individual thoughts. Those go into the mix. There, these are contentious issues. There are differences of opinion, and I don't want my voice represented as one voice in that way without having some discussion with my colleagues first. If I could, I think what I was hearing from Councilmember Matthews 
Council Member Byers and then Council Member Brown. It seems like a similar approach, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think part of that recommendation was that part of what Council Member Matthews said was, you know, that if everybody provided input by September 4th, then I can work with staff on this. And it sounded like the idea would be to bring something back to Council for approval. Good. That's what I want. If that's the intention, yeah. no problem. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I just wanted to say, I, I just wanted to clarify that because I, I feel like. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Byers, you still have. Uh, no, nope, that's good. Okay. Okay. Um, if there's no further comments on this item, I'd like to open up to the public for public comment. This is item number 22 on our agenda, authorizing the mayor to respond to the Santa Cruz County Civil Grand Jury on behalf. City of Santa Cruz. If you'd like to comment on this item, please press star nine on your phone and you will be given two minutes to speak on this item. Okay, seeing that there's no members of the public who'd like to comment on this item, Council member Byers. Oh, I lowered my hand. Oh. Oh. Council member Matthews. Yeah, I'll go ahead and move that we authorize the mayor to respond to the Santa Cruz County Grand Jury uh, on behalf of the city of Santa Cruz, building on the draft responses um, prepared by staff. Um, and um, requesting council to submit their comments and concerns to the city manager by September 4th with the um, proposed responses to return to the council for action. Okay, I'll second that. Are there any further comments from council members on the motion that was just made? And so it appears to me that this is going to, everyone will provide feedback and work with staff to incorporate that feedback into our responses. That we need to come back at our first meeting in September because for some of these items, I guess we, I guess we would need to work with staff because I know that some responses need to be submitted by September 14th, but it ranges from September 14th to October 1st. Yeah. So um, we'll have to bring them back for approval. Um, as appropriate. Okay. Uh, I, just just um, on the date, I think there's some flexibility on that date. I think maybe it would help if Ralph would, would check on that, but I understand there really is, uh, especially with everything going on. I mean, fine if we make it, that's fine with me, but just, you know, just so we know that. We'll do that. Um, but I, I, I do think it's, it's a courtesy to the staff as they're working on this, if they hear from us sooner rather than later, <laughs> so they can be incorporating our, our concerns yeah. in, the, in their responses. Yeah, um, and I would also say um, uh, this doesn't preclude involving other council members, consultation with other council members in the responses as long as the Brown Act um, Right. protections are observed. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Byers? No, I'm done, sorry. Okay. All right, with that, um, I'll turn it over to the city clerk to take the roll call vote. Thank you. Can I just confirm that it is to return uh, to submit comments to the city manager by September 4th to return to council yeah. At, a, at another meeting, not a specific, not the September 14th. With, with, the, um, with the proposed responses to return to council for action. Got it, okay. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. 
Um, knowing that we might lose a couple council members, let's move right into our the last item on our agenda, uh, which is the 101, the public hearing for 101 Felix Street. Um, I know that Council Member Matthews yourself on this item, so thanks for joining. And I guess um, are you going to yes, talk about I, I, communications? Um, I think I need to make a formal announcement at this point that I need to recuse myself from this because um, my husband and I own property within 500 feet of the proposed project. So I am formally disqualified from participating. Does that do it, Bonnie? <laughs> yes, that, that works. <clears throat> okay. That's fine. Then Tony? All right. Yeah, I'll leave. Okay, so um, at this point in time, if there's members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in for item number 23 on our agenda. Uh, the order will be a presentation by staff with time allowed for the public to speak after the, um, after the, after the items have been heard. And there will also be time allowed for the applicant to speak on this item. Council may then ask questions followed by public comment, and then we'll, re we'll return to the Council for Action and Deliberation. And so I'll invite um, presenters Brian Bain, Senior Planner, and the applicant Brian Raphael to join us. Let's see Ryan's phone. This is Ryan, can you guys hear me? Yes. Good okay, great. And I'm gonna bring up the, now, can you guys see the uh, presentation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what we're discussing tonight is a project at 101 Felix Street, Cypress Plain Apartments. Um, the preliminary consideration of a proposed general plan amendment, local coastal plan amendment, and zone change. Um, here. So, although this is not a typical step in the development review process, uh, a preliminary consideration hearing has been conducted in the past, and it's mainly for larger projects that are accompanied by uh, proposed legislative action, such as a general plan amendment or rezoning. Uh, so the purpose of this preliminary consideration will be to review the proposed amendment and rezoning for consistency with the general plan policies and to receive input from the public. Um, this early consideration provides an opportunity for the council to review the proposed uh, amendments and prior to further significant investment in time and cost by the applicant and city staff required to complete the remaining environmental review and hearing process. Additionally, it can save public time um, that they would otherwise spend tracking and commenting on the proposal. So to give a little background, um, in fall of 2018, the Cypress Point owners um, contacted um, the city staff with interest in, in the adding units to the underutilized open space within their existing 240 unit, uh, unit complex. Uh, however, with the general plan designation of LM, low medium density, the 8.89 acre parcel would, would only permit a maximum of 178 units. So when the apartment complex was developed in 1971, the general plan designation allowed for a higher density, making it legal non-conforming under today's general plan designation. Um, in addition, there's no inclusionary, there were no inclusionary requirements in 1971, so there are currently no deed-restricted affordable units uh, within the complex. Um, through the course of discussions and at, staff suggestion to maximize affordable housing opportunities, the property owners offered to provide an increased level of affordability uh, for a favorable consideration of a general plan amendment and rezoning to increase the density on the site. At the time of the discussions, the proposal was an additional 66 units, and the owners had agreed to set aside 20% of the new units um, for 80% uh, area median income. At that time, the municipal code inclusionary requirement was 10% of the additional uh, base density. So this was a significant offering of affordable units above and beyond um, the code requirement. In December of 2018, they applied for a pre-app, um, which the city processed to give them an, kind of an idea of what was going to be required as part of the formal application. And in November of 2019, they submitted for the formal application for 100 units. Um, and then 
as part of that formal application, a community outreach meeting was held um, in June of 2020. So the online uh, community outreach meeting was very well attended by surrounding neighbors who expressed some concerns with the proposed increase in the density and, and the additional units to the complex. Some of the um, some of the concerns included increased traffic and speeding on Felix Street, uh, negative impacts to Neary Lagoon, um, not enough parking on the site, which will force tenants to uh, take up street parking, spot zoning, um, which in turn could set a dangerous precedent for subsequent proposals to increase density in the neighborhood, um, the height and location of some of the proposed buildings in relationship to some townhomes that uh, um, abutted the property, um, tree removals, uh, poor management of the complex, impacts from construction of the new units on the existing um, tenants, and also um, encouragement to, if it were to proceed, that an EIR be completed for the project. Um, in response to some of the concerns expressed by the neighbors, the applicants went back to the drawing board and revised the plans and reduced the number of proposed units from 100 to 80. Um, they eliminated the three-story building that was adjacent to the neighboring townhomes, uh, thereby reducing the number of trees to be removed as well as traffic and parking impacts um, you know, through the elimination of 20 units. Um, the application is, is close to being deemed complete and the city's environmental consultant has begun working on the initial study. Um, and there's a number of studies that still need to be prepared in order to complete the initial study and make a determination as to whether a neg deck or environmental impact report should be prepared. So this is the project site. Uh, as I mentioned, it's an 8.89 acre site, centrally located within the city, um, south of Laurel Street, with portions of the property abutting Neary Lagoon. Uh, the property was developed in 1971 with 240 rental apartment units. And as I mentioned, the general plan density um, was subsequently reduced at some point after the apartments were constructed. And we did some research and we're, we're we believe that it was done as part of a general plan update around 1980. So therefore, the development is currently legal non-conforming from a density standpoint. Um, this, is a, this is a site plan that shows um, where the proposed buildings, there's, as I mentioned, 80 uh, new rental apartments proposed uh, within five buildings. These buildings are essentially infilled within the existing complex. There's no expansion, it's basically there's four buildings that are proposed over what's existing parking, um, and then one that um, is actually part of, uh, there's a pool area here now, and they're looking at uh, putting in a new building and then building a new, a new pool uh, adjacent to it. Here's just a quick elevation of the, of the three-story building. This is the one that's next to the pool, so this has a lobby, leasing offices, a fitness center, and as I mentioned, a new pool will be part of it. And then this is an example of some of the carriage units that would be built um, over what is currently carports within the, the existing parking areas. So the applicant is proposing a general plan amendment to change the land use designation from LM, which is low medium density, uh, 10 to 20 dwelling units per acre, to M, medium density, which is 20 to 30, and a rezoning from RL to RM to bring the property into general conformance and allow up to 267 units. Uh, in addition to the new land use designations, the applicants are proposing a density bonus that would allow the additional 80 units with 14 units that will be affordable to very low income households, which is 60% of AMI, and two units to low income, which is 80% of AMI. Um, based on staff's current analysis at this, at this stage in the application review, the density bonus law would require 14 units at the very low income level in order for the project to receive its 20% density bonus, meaning that the two low income units exceed the affordability levels that would be required. So they're above and beyond the density bonus requirements. As this preliminary consideration is in intended to determine whether council would like staff and the applicant to further proceed with the processing of the legislative act, staff is providing analysis of the project for consistency with general plan policies. Um, you know, our general plan when it's adopted is not always something that's set in stone. Um, once adopted, there is, it does not remain static. So state law does allow up to four general plan amendments per mandatory element per year. Um, so while they're not a, a normal occurrence, they, they aren't uncommon. 
Um, so most amendments propose a change in land use designation of a particular property. And um, Santa Cruz is currently experiencing high demand for housing with low levels of affordability that are affecting the quality of life of the community, which has long-term implications for maintaining Santa Cruz's diversity. Affordable housing for extremely low, very low, low and moderate income households is of utmost concern right now. And affordable housing allows persons of all economic segments to live in the community, provide housing for the city's workforce, allows the integration of families and racial ethnic groups. The proposed general plan amendment and zone change to increase the density on the subject property and provide additional rental units, specifically low and very low income units, furthers the city's affordable housing policies listed in the city's housing element, which I, which I have here provided. So the subject parcel uh, is located within an area made up of primarily multifamily housing um, with the LM low medium general plan designation. That's kind of the orangey, lighter brown uh, area that you can see there. Um, while the abutting properties share the same designation, there are a number of properties in the vicinity that have the medium uh, density designation that they're proposing to um, um, have. This includes three fairly large properties that are between 300 and 500 feet away, in addition to a grouping of properties approximately two to three blocks from the complex in that Chestnut Laurel Street area. So similarly, similarly designated properties already exist in the vicinity. Um, also looking at some other general plan policies, um, the project optimizes the use of the parcel by infilling underutilized portions of the site um, consistent with general plan policies. Um, and due to the project, the property's location, increasing the density would encourage a sustainable and healthy lifestyle given the project's spikeable, walkable nature due to its close proximity to downtown, as well as other recreational uh, amenities in the area, such as near a lagoon, uh, Loud Nelson Center, Depot Park, um, Santa Cruz High School. So the site is also in close proximity to public transit stops, including the downtown Metro Center that is a half mile away and as well as other uh, designated high quality transit stops, thereby further promoting sustainable transportation use by residents. So it's a really centrally located uh, parcel. The proposed project promotes social diversity by offering lower priced housing options and achieves a higher degree of sustainability by more efficiently using underutilized land uh, within an existing development. The project also provides more housing options in an area where healthier and more environmentally friendly transportation options such as pedestrian, bike, and transit are convenient. Um, this is especially true given the central location of, of the project and its proximity of the downtown. And the application's consistency with these policies is the basis um, for the Community Development Department's support of the proposed project continuing its application process. So here are the options for council um, this evening. One is uh, can direct staff to continue processing the application. Uh, the second is to de deny the application without prejudice. Um, the third is to deny the application with prejudice. Um, if the council decides to recommend denial, uh, either one, two or three, it is requested by staff that the council continue the matter to the next council meeting to allow staff time to bring back a resolution articulating the reasons uh, for the denial. So the, applic the application, just to be clear, cannot be approved tonight at this hearing as we still have environmental review that needs to be completed um, as well as the process is that we need to go to Planning Commission first um, to give a recommendation to City Council. Um, it shall it also be noted that should the council direct that the application processing proceed uh, it would be, it would no way obligate the council to approve the project in the future. So that being said, um, staff's recommendation is that the council consider the information provided in the report, listen to testimony from the public, and give direction to staff to continue processing the application. And that concludes my report. Thank you for that report. So at this time, um, I'd like to allow the applicant to speak to us on this item. Justin, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, good evening, City Council, Mayor Cummings. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to discuss our project with you. Uh, Ryan, thank you. 
for a great uh, summary report and uh, you know make the, this uh, this will be brief. I know everyone's uh, got a timing issues. Uh, I'm Brian Rappel. I work for uh, Braddock and Logan, uh, the owner and operator of uh, Cypress Point Apartments. Um, you know, there's been some misinformation out there. We are actually uh, based here in the Bay Area. We've uh, owned the asset since uh, 2005. Uh, members of the community um, and, and stakeholders. We're not some fly-by-night uh, developer. We, uh, we are long-term holders. Um, and uh, you know, far from an out-of-state conglomerate that I've seen, uh, you know, posed uh, in some of these uh, responses. Um, but you know, I, I need to do. We need to do a better job of educating uh, people about the project and uh, do some more community outreach, uh, which we will do. Um, just to, to be clear, is, is we have on the uh, project since uh, 2005 and it's made significant investments uh, into the development. Um, some of these upgrades, including the common areas, the pool, pool deck, um, a new gym, leasing office, um, and we'd like to continue to do so. Um, I think uh, you know, looking at Santa Cruz and the, and the housing uh, crisis uh, that uh, built up the entire Bay Area and Santa Cruz, um, that's a great opportunity to. Uh, Identify an existing project. Um, if I can share my screen, everyone. You can see that uh, this is the overview um, of the project that you saw from uh, Ryan's presentation. And uh, you know, we did take some uh, significant thought in, into uh, developing these 80 units. Uh, you know, we went from 100 to 80. Uh, they are developed in the interior uh, portion as I'm highlighting here over these carports is 64 units. Uh, the amenities building is over here. And if you saw what we had previously, we eliminated an entire building here that helped shelter Lagoon and neighbors. It was a significant source of uh, contention there uh, from, the, from the neighbors. Um, we, we made that change. And there was a building here near the lagoon uh, that we removed as well. Um, in, in that, you know, we, we uh, reduced our project by uh, by 20 units, and uh, we also uh, saved or uh, preserved five more uh, heritage trees. Um, you know, looking at this, is we think we can make some further improvements. But again, that that's the project. The details um, were well, uh, you know, it, it are all were all just presented to you from uh, from Ryan. Um, you know, looking at this, stepping back is the general plan right now uh, requires uh, or only allows us to uh, develop 178 units. The project today is 240 uh, apartment units, and uh, you know, top of mind right now, it's you know, a catastrophic event. Um, you know, something happened with with our project. We could only rebuild uh, 178 apartment homes, and uh, from that regard. Uh, we think the general plan should be moving ahead uh, and being amended as we go back and discuss our project in greater detail to the community um, that we have that done now. Otherwise, you, you, there's a risk that, you know, 62 homes uh, and, you know, upwards of approximately 100 people will be permanently displaced. Um, so we like the consideration of that general plan amendment uh, regardless as, as we move forward with the, uh, with the project. Uh, we think it adds significant benefits to the city. Um, you know, adding 16 affordable, uh, very low uh, income units to an existing project um, and the other 64 market rate uh, apartment uh, homes uh, on an existing territory and, and not disrupting any, uh, any green fields or uh, other uh, open spaces. Um, you know, I think it's a great opportunity. And uh, from that, I'll, uh, I'll yield back my time and just ask that uh, we have the opportunity uh, for rebuttal to, uh, to public comments. Okay. Thank you for that presentation. Are there any questions from council members at this time for either the applicant or the uh, city staff? Council member Brown. Uh, thank you. I am. I'm trying to figure out uh, the math on the proposed changes because, you know, I've I've done I've run the numbers different ways. I've got my calculator out, and I'm just not understanding how uh, 267 gets. So if 267 is what would be allowable with the change, then 
um, and 240 units are already there, and then we have 27 uh, possible additional units, and even with a 20% density bonus, that still doesn't get us to um, what I'm seeing here would be about 320 um, with the additional units. So I, if somebody could help me understand the, the math, how those numbers are, have been figured, it would be, that would be helpful. Yes, uh, Councilman Brown, I, I can answer that. So 267 units would be the increase in density would be the 30 uh, for 8.9 acres. So 30 times 8.9 uh, would equal 267. Mm -hmm. And then a density bonus on top of that of approximately 20% gets you to the 320 units. Um, and then at that point, we provide you know, 14, um, okay. Sorry. And so 14 of those, of 267 is, you know, 20 or 5% of 267 rounded upwards gets you to the 14 units uh, of affordability of very low income. And uh, from the get-go, we, uh, we said 20%, even when the requirement was all the way down to 10. To honor that, we're keeping another two units, uh, two apartment homes that will be uh, a low income. Okay, so just a quick follow-up question. Thank you. Um, so, so then the uh, interpretation is that uh, existing units can be considered to um, to get to the density bonus amount. So the density bonus is applied to all of the units, even though most of them are already there. And then, it, but it doesn't apply for the affordable units, uh, for the inclusionary units, just for density bonus you're using the, the total base, but for the affordable units, you're using the base of the new construction. Correct. Yeah, the affordable right. units are based on what the maximum is allowable for the general plan. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, why don't we hear from the public? I know that we have council members who may have to leave, and so if at a minimum they can hear from the public. I think that would be important. Um, there are a number of people who uh, called in or who requested additional time. So we have Koresh Durham from the Sierra Club. Uh, we have representatives from Save Near Lagoon slash Shelter Lagoon Homeowners Association. Chris Steggers from the Felix Street Group and Alyssa Barnes from the Seaside Cottages HOA and also representative from the Project Near Lagoon and Liberal Neighborhoods. If you are one of those individuals, Please let us know before you speak um, because of the fact that we only see phone numbers and we don't have your names. So if you are, if you call in to request additional time from one of those groups, please um, announce before you comment. And for other members of the public, now's the time. If you'd like to comment on this item, now's the time to call in. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And for those members of the public who did not request additional time or were not approved for additional time, you will have two minutes.
having uh, the view from my bedroom changed a little bit. However, as a member of the affordable housing advocacy community, I know it's essential that our city be approved, uh, approving projects like this. Last year, not a single unit of low-income deed-restricted affordable housing was built by a for-profit developer. We need inclusionary units in order to fulfill our housing needs, and the, and the units that come with a density bonus rental project like this, uh, restricted to below 50% area median income, are the most underproduced type of housing Santa Cruz needs. We're an over overwhelmingly white community. On the other hand, Cypress Point, which is currently has no deed-restricted affordable units, is one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the city. Cypress Point is home to many immigrant families and peoples of color who may be discriminated against elsewhere in town for having Section 8 vouchers. Rental housing brings desperately needed diversity to our community, and we have a real opportunity here to increase the diversity of Santa Cruz by allowing more infill uh, rental housing to be built on parking lots. My neighbors have plenty of experience using misleading environmental concerns in order to attempt to stop housing development. They did that before suing the city in the 80s to stop the 100% affordable Neary Lagoon Apartments project on Chestnut Street over concerns about flooding and wetland studies. This project within walking distance to downtown and a block from a bus line is the kind of project Santa Cruz should be building more of. Downtown alone can't fulfill all of our housing needs, and my neighborhood is a great place to build more infill units on parking lots. I encourage you to approve, allow the process to continue. Thank you. Um, hello, this is Susan Monheit. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You can hear me. Okay, thank you. Um, I am also a homeowner at Shelter Lagoon, adjoining the Cypress Point apartment building structure, uh, a complex. And I am opposed to the spot rezoning of this parcel for higher density. I think spot rezoning is Poor, poor planning on the part of the city. Um, I'm an environmental scientist and wildlife biologist, and I find that increasing the density on the shores of this unique and rare uh, wetland, urban wetland uh, site is inappropriate, that the higher density along the shores of the lagoon and the noise um, from from the construction and from the higher density people living at the site will be detrimental um, to the habitat and the the nest the ongoing nesting and migratory birds that come through. There's um, 228 different species of birds and some endangered species such as western pond turtles that are located at that lagoon. Um, I really urge the city council to deny the application with prejudice and just stop the project at this point. Um, the construction over the parking islands allows no safe exit or egress from the buildings. When people leave them, they step out into traffic. And that, I think, was left off the uh, summary agenda that was presented by the developer. Um, those are my comments this evening. I really appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next member of the public. Hello, this is Christina Buchanan, and I am a resident of Cypress Point Apartments. Hello. My, sta my statement is: my statement is, um, I have no faith in the 80 proposed units that will be affordable. I'm actually living in an apartment right now that's unaffordable. And it was built in 1971, um, paying 2400 a month, including utilities that run nearly 400 I moved here to enjoy the native environment. And it is the current management. And on top of that, the current management is subpar 
in managing this complex currently. I can see every day people moving out of this complex, and I understand now why. Also, I need to also mention that this is a, a cul-de-sac. There is no exit. There's no egress. We are stuck. If there is a fire or any kind of emergency, we will be in serious trouble. The Walmart location would be perfect or far better used to add affordable housing than here in Neary Lagoon. I respectfully ask that this be denied, this whole thing be denied with prejudice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Conlon. I'm calling in strong support of this project. Um, I think that it is absolutely essential that the city takes building affordable housing seriously. And I'm pleased that the council voted to approve the um, streamlining by right of affordable housing. I also think that it's great that we are building affordable housing and market rate housing together. Um, and yeah, I, and um, from a personal perspective, I support this because as a recent arrival to Santa Cruz, I am also facing the issue of affordability and availability of housing. And that's not gonna get any better unless we build housing. So I just wanna strongly support and ask that you approve this with a smile. Thank you. Good evening, Council. My name is Mike Dunham. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Mike Dunham. I am an environmental activist. Uh, I actually live uh, not in Santa Cruz. I live further up the peninsula in Burlingame. Uh, but I was interested in this project because I someone had forwarded me to the petition to save Near Lagoon Wildlife Refuge. And Burlingame itself has a number of water and coastal-based resources that I think are really important to protect. Uh, so I was very interested in this particular issue. Um, that's why I was surprised when I actually looked at the project proposal that it didn't actually seem to do much uh, directly affecting the lagoon. Um, it, it, this project seems to be just building on an existing parking lot. Uh, and uh, one of the things I think we've seen as a region, uh, I know Santa Cruz uh, County is suffering right now, just like my county, San Mateo County, uh, is wildfires. And the number of pe people and families that have been pushed into the wildland urban interface because they can't afford to live in downtown areas that are much less prone to wildfire. Uh, I also happened to be at a presentation a few months ago by Governor Gavin Newsom, senior advisor on climate, Kate Gordon, uh, and she said that in California, the single best thing you can do to fight climate change is to speak out in support of dense infill housing projects. Uh, it's a problem across the state that our downtowns are t too low density, that too many people are sort of being pushed into the fringes of regions because they can't afford to live in downtown because there's so much demand and so little supply. Uh, so I think, I suspect you're going to hear a lot of arguments about the environment tonight, but uh, it, it's hard to see how they could possibly outweigh uh, the value of, of building up density in walkable, bikeable, uh, transit accessible areas. That is essential for defeating climate change. I urge you, please continue this process, project along the process. It's essential for the future of our region and for the future of, of the rest here. Thank you. I'd like to add, I know that uh, Council 
council member Watkins has to leave at seven. I wasn't sure if there's any, um, I know we're in the middle of public comment, but I wanted to, to give Governor Watkins an opportunity if you have any comments or questions, given that we're about eight minutes away from seven o'clock, if you want, if you had any comments you'd like to make. Mayor, if I, if I may, I, I apologize. I, ha I have to sign off at 7.30. Oh, okay. um, yeah, and so I um, realize I haven't heard all of the public input, nor have I heard the uh, response from the developer. Um, but I was just sort of sure, just instinctually, you know, in terms of the spot zoning and um, the exceptions, it doesn't necessarily instinctually feel like the right decision for me to move forward at this time. Um, but I also just want to um, put an asterisk by that, knowing that I haven't fully heard all elements of the presentation. And I apologize for having to, to tune out early. I will stay until 7.30. Okay. I apologize, too. I thought it was 7. But, yeah, I'll hopefully um, there'll be more time for, for discussion. Okay. Okay, next speaker. Hey, thank you, sorry about that. Uh, I'm Kyle Kelly. I live not too far from this project. Uh, like was echoed before, uh, it's, it's really important that we build urban infill. I think at a time like this, when you know we have family and friends that are fleeing the mountains, uh, and it will continue to get worse, the more that we can get people into walkable, bikeable communities in Santa Cruz and improve the ability for the workforce that, that comes into Santa Cruz to work. Now they're coming. All the people are coming from Watsonville. Hollister, all over the place to come and work, and we need more opportunities for them. We're not going to make things more affordable by not building it. And and the reality is that the main way that we're going to get affordable housing out of these out of these you know private for-profit developers is to re is to require them and to, and to help them get through on getting those affordable units built. Like was noted earlier, we didn't have any we didn't have any permitted and built last year. We thankfully have some being permitted this year, and I'd like to see more. So I'd like to see this continue on. Uh, as for the community, I think there's plenty more community engagement that can happen um, in terms of uh, bike lanes, you know, mixed mobility options, um, as well as as, an, as a commitment to, to helping with some of the issues that the community is facing with the current project and, and, and with the, the current owners. Um, but I would like to see them be able to build on those parking lots and, and build up a lot more. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. You're on the line. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Dan Council. Good evening. This is Chris Sager. I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Phoenix Street Group. Okay. And so Chris, uh, we'll give you, um, since you called in for additional time, we'll give you four minutes to speak on behalf of your group. Thank you. Thank you. And um, obviously, the, the previous speakers are not in the neighborhood, I believe, because just the way they sound. But anyway, I am for affordable housing. Um, I am a member of a local CR club, as I am passionate about the environment and spot. Zoning is not the way to go. Um, the process of singling a specific parcel of land for use in a classification totally different from that of the surrounding area for the benefit of the owner of uh, property and to the detriment of other owners. So other owners around this property aren't going to be able to or they will be able to build up. And this will not just be down here, but this will be right throughout the entire lower west side of Santa Cruz, reaching out to the um, entire west, lower west side of Santa Cruz. It's not just this area. Um, this area is not in downtown. It is lower west side. Um, the area of Lagoon encompasses areas that, in the general plan, um, one is located in a natural area, a natural area, according to the general plan, page 54. It's a fresh wetland zone, page 129 general plan, 
which is sensitive habitat. It's highly sensitive archaeological site, page 21, and it, um, which hopefully, if they're doing this, they should go to study to see if there are sites there or if they need to have an archaeological archaeologist on site. Chris, 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 you're breaking up pretty bad. I'm not sure if there might be a better place in your house or wherever you're at where you can get a better signal, but you're breaking up pretty badly. Are you still there? If we could have his time paused, maybe. Um, yep. I think, he, I think he dropped off the line. So if he comes back on, we'll we'll try to pick up where he left off. Okay, next speaker. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Hi, my name is Adam Bookbinder. I'm not in Santa Cruz, but I am a planning commissioner in the South Bay. And I want to drop in to say this is precisely the kind of project that we'd love to see more of. This project puts housing in the least environmentally destructive place conceivable, parking lots. The severity of the shortage means that any housing is desperately needed, but especially this. It's even a density and aesthetic match to the surrounding apartments. The fundamental truth of environmentalism is that you can't truly throw anything away, because a way isn't a place. It's true for people, too. If you don't put the building here, the result will be even more unaffordable single-family homes in fire-risk zones where residents will drive more, will certainly not bike to downtown, and will have a far, far greater effect on natural resources than being adjacent to a lagoon. A goodly portion of Santa Cruz County is literally on fire right now. If you don't make room for people to live in the safe parts, you're condemning them to the fires. This isn't just a great idea. This is a moral imperative. I urge the council to move the application ahead as quickly and efficiently as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Kelsey Hill. Um, I'm calling to express my opposition to a general plan amendment and zone change for the pro proposed development at Neary Lagoon. I have multiple concerns about this project, including the rate of affordability units and environmental impact. Um, but at this stage, I'm concerned with spot zoning in this application because it undermines the integrity of the community input process on the general plan. Uh, there was an extensive process to get feedback in the plan in 2012, and the neighbors made it clear that they wanted lesser density in the Felix Street neighborhood plan than planned for in previous decades. So the question on the diet should not be if we can squeeze in more density in this area, one that is a wildlife sanctuary and home to a sensitive wetland, but should we, and is that added density appropriate for this neighborhood? Change on a parcel by parcel basis concerns me as it opens the door to inappropriate developments that could prove detrimental to the quality of life in certain pockets of our community. We should build affordable density in places where it is appropriate to do so and places that increase the quality of life for residents. I don't believe this neighborhood is appropriate for that increase. Moreover, an approach that zones to the needs of developers is generally not a good practice and sends a message to our community that their input on the general plan isn't as important. I urge the council to resist spot zoning for this project, and I thank you for my time. Thank you. Hi, am I am I on now, Justin? Yes. Good evening. Oh, hi. Hi. My name is Sandra Ivany. I live in Shelter Lagoon. Um, I'm one of the uh, one of the uh, community members that serves as a liaison with the community with the Department of Public Works that oversees the uh, the lagoon every year. Uh, an extensive um, $300,000 budget to remove tules and sediment from the lagoon. <laughs> and protect the, the wildlife um, in the lagoon and the birds, the two, over 200 species of birds. Um, I just wanted to give that pre uh, preliminary because um, the lagoon is very, a very sensitive wetland and one of the few remaining coastal wetlands in California. And um, as I said before, home to 200 species of birds. By the way, I'm representing the Save Neary Lagoon 
group, so let's get four minutes. I don't know if I'll need four minutes, but, and I, yeah, so that's the group I'm representing right now. And um, within less than a month, we got 3,000 signatures of community members that were completely outraged and vehemently opposed to having uh, this project put adjacent to uh, the lagoon. Not only would it be adjacent to the lagoon um, with a year and a half of building materials going up and down Felix Street, up and down Laurel Street, building 80 houses while we're trying to overcome a fire um, and all that will be going on, we'll be having trucks building 80 houses down already blocked near um, Felix Street and, and Laurel Street. Um, I, I just can't even imagine it before the fire. But getting back to the lagoon, once the lagoon and, and the, the environment, the, the, the sensitive environment of the lagoon is, is, is um, affected, there's no turning back. There's no creating the lagoon again and the, 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 cell, the, the delicate um, ecosystem that exists there. Um, and let's be clear about this. There, there's so many points here, but let's be really clear because I, I hear you talking about affordable housing, and, and it certainly is important, but it's important to be smart about it, and it's important not to have a knee-jerk, oh, you know, we're going to make, after this fire, the, um, the developers, uh, uh, like Christmas morning, uh, because we need more housing. It's not like that. First of all, it's 64 units of not affordable housing, 64 units of gentrification, 64 units where either, you know, it's going to be, oh, it's going to be market rate. Are we going to destroy this whole area of Felix Street that's already overly dense for 16 affordable units? Is that really a decision that, that makes sense? 16 affordable units. Uh, adjacent to a lagoon, cutting down 37 trees, 22 of the trees are heritage trees, for 16 affordable units. This does, this does not reflect the, the values of the community that lives here. Uh, within a month, we've gotten 3,000 signatures. So uh, we could get more than that over the months, and we, we really urge you during this crisis time that we're going through that we don't all, the community would like to spend our time and our energy helping the people that have been affected by the fires, our friends, our neighbors, and not arguing about this and, and, and fighting against this developer who may call himself a Bay Area developer, but while we've been on the phone, I've looked up Braddock and Logan, and I've looked up them an, another time, and their server was down. I don't know, maybe they go under another name, but there's three Google reviews, um, and I know Google reviews is not exactly um, a legitimate um, um, authority, but um, they're all one-star reviews. It's a terrible builder and a terrible management, and I, I, I urge you not to support this project. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello? Hi. Uh, thanks uh, for having the time uh, for us. Um, I would like to express my extreme opposition towards this project. I live over on Blackburn Street, and I don't know. Um, I've heard two people on this phone call talk about who live in Monterey Bay and Burlingame. It's kind of, you know, I would really like if the opinions of the people who actually live in this neighborhood were really considered. I live the street over from Felix Street. Um, if you walked up and down Felix Street, you would see currently that there is no parking. I have friends that have told me that they have to get cars towed from the front of their driveways because there's not enough room for them to park their own cars, and a lot of those cars are coming from Cypress Point Apartments. The developer does not plan to provide additional parking, so that would exacerbate the issue of the already existing issue of traffic and parking. Um, Another thing that I think has not been addressed yet is that this area, this Neary Lagoon area of the Lower West Side, we are in a tsunami hazard zone, and as the climate is changing, which it is, and as water is rising, we are also at risk for, floods, for flooding. Um, so we talk about making environmentally um, 
conscious decisions, and I am most definitely not opposed to affordable housing and the construction of affordable housing. However, building an, an area where there is uh, tsunami risk and flood risk is not smart, and it does put human lives at risk. There is only one path of egress for this entire community. Adding hundreds of more people to a single apartment complex that are leaving in the case of emergency endangers human lives. So to answer the question of whether you should amend the general plan or the local coastal program is no, you should not. Um, the vast majority of this community opposes this very strongly. And um, in the midst of a fire, cutting down 22 heritage trees is just unthinkable. Um, this is already a highly, highly impacted neighborhood. We do not want this. Believe me, I have gone door to door. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Hi, my name's Alyssa Barnes, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Seaside Cottages HOA, so I'm requesting extra time, please. Okay, so we'll give um, Alyssa Barnes four minutes. Thank you. So I live on, on uh, in the area. I'm part of the HOA, the Seaside Cottages HOA. I've lived in Santa Cruz for 30 years. My family has owned this home on Neary Street, which is one of the streets that goes off of Felix, for the last 20 years. Our HOA it has nine homes, but there's only 13 privately owned homes on Felix Street. 70%, that makes for 70% of the private homes on Felix Street. Felix Street already is massively uh, densely populated in terms of the general outlying neighborhoods. We have far too many people in this area right now, and we cannot afford to have more people put in as an infill. Affordable housing is one thing. 16 units of, the, of affordable housing compared to the amount of money that this builder and owner will be making is not a good um, choice. So. Felix is a long straight street, and Cypress Point is at the very end of it. That's where getting in and out of that complex would be problematic <coughs> for any kind of uh, natural disaster or issue. Right now, traffic on Felix Street is very fast, and um, parking is completely built up. It's a, narrow, it's a fairly narrow street. I am strongly opposed to building more uh, units at the Cypress Point resident area, and largely because the Cypress Point management is not doing a good job of um, managing their appointment, their apartments as it is. They have an F rating, the lowest rating on the rent, the online renters forum, and when. The trees that are lining the small waterway called Laurel Creek that goes into the lagoon fall or limbs break off. They're letting them sit. They're throwing them over the fence into the waterway, blocking the waterway. They just are not doing a good job of managing the complex that they have, and I do not feel that it is a good policy to allow them to have more people in there and to manage more people while they're already having such a, a bad, they're not doing a good job to start with. Basically, our neighborhood is as dense as it can tolerate. Uh, walking back and forth to downtown is great, but we do have just incredible foot traffic and as well as car traffic on these streets already. Uh, I do not feel that it's a good idea to add more foot traffic at night and weekends. The people who are living here are severely impacted. This area just has more um, density than any other other areas, any other neighborhoods in Santa Cruz. Um, the community can't afford to lose the 36 trees that they want to cut down, 27 of which are heritage trees. A natural wetlands is the kind of thing that people come to Santa Cruz to be around. I know we have a housing shortage. We are already densely packed into this area. I don't think spot rezoning is a good way to go. It just 
is not supportive of the general plan of our community. Um, we have a beautiful natural area and we need the amount of trees that we have. We need every tree. Wild wildlife is being pushed into this area from the fires and I just don't feel that this is a good project. Please vote no. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, I'd like to uh, address two issues that weren't uh, previously mentioned in the webinar back in June. First is asbestos. Everyone is vulnerable to asbestos, but that is especially true during the pandemic. The lease reveals asbestos in unit ceilings and outer walls, but the developer still wants to renovate roofs, balconies, and external walls. Uh, there's a possibility that an entire building could be tented. However, I think an environmental review, something of that sort, uh, should be a requirement since not only are uh, nearby buildings at risk for asbestos exposure, but perhaps Felix Street itself. Uh, my second issue is uh, relocation. As buildings are renovated, tenants will supposedly be re relocated to other units. But with occupancy already high, how do they intend to magically empty units and avoid mass evictions? This project is supposed to take place in 18 months, and there are at least three, 400 people already living here. The numbers just don't add up. Um, it's especially unwise during a pandemic, relocating for obvious reasons. Uh, so my question is, if management neglects these apartments, which they already own, then why should we trust them with more units and also, can we trust such a business to properly renovate without exposing tenants to asbestos? And uh, I have one more issue I just noticed earlier today. I was looking through the agenda packet. Uh, emails written on August 19th. Uh, I would like to refer the council members to this packet, pages 788 to 816. There are about 15 emails I've noticed that they're like form emails or uh, fake Yelp emails. And um, I've worked in tech before. I find it very suspicious and sleazy that management or business would resort to emailing city council members these sort of form emails. Thank you. Sorry, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Does that mean I'm speaking? Yes, you are on the line. Hello, um, my name is Kathy Haber and I live a hundred uh, feet from the property line to Cypress Point and I've lived here for 19 years. There are many problems uh, associated with this particular neighborhood. Um, the Cypress Point <coughs> Apartments apparently does not have a dog policy other than the fact that they allow every apartment to have two dogs, including the studio apartments. There are many dogs there. They bark and bark and bark. And because there are openings in the fence down at the lagoon end where our properties adjoin the city property, the residents of Cypress Point walk through uh, Shelter Lagoon, which is a private property. It's posted private. They walk through all the time with their dogs and just walking through. Um, we've posted signs. It does no good at all. Um, the dogs pee and poop on everything, and I really don't like that. I just would like to say I don't like the neighbors to come into my place with their animals to relieve themselves. This is the management of Cypress Point that these other speakers have talked about. I went on their website um, last week and discovered that they, as of now, have 14 vacancies. 
I don't understand why you're saying that we need more apartments at Cypress Point if right now they have 14 vacancies. This neighborhood has a lot of publicly operated affordable housing. At the end of Chestnut Street, there is a very large public housing project with hundreds of units. And immediately adjacent to us, there is a senior affordable housing. This neighborhood has too many people already. Bye now. Next speaker, last four digits, 6187. You can unmute yourself. You, you'll be able to speak on this item. If you're having trouble Hello? unmuting. Hello. Okay. Oh, hi. I apologize. Hello. No worries. My name is. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. My name is Sarah Ogilvy, and I am of the Bay Area. And I would just first like to say how disheartened and how saddened I am to hear all of the um, hostile um, folks that are calling and and uh, chastising people who are calling in from different parts of the Bay Area to um, express their support for this project. I want to remind folks that, um, you know, there is a Senate Bill 167. It's called the Housing Accountability Act. Signs of the lack of housing is a critical problem in California that threatens the economic, environmental, and social quality of life for all Californians. California housing has become the most expensive in the nation. Excessive cost of state housing supply is partially caused by the activities and policies of many local governments that limit the approval of housing increase the cost of land for housing and require the high fees of actions paid by producers of housing and um, you know also by uh, people who live uh, close to housing projects to, who um, essentially kill them. Um, I would like to speak in favor of this project. Um, I've, I've come to um, become familiar with it. It's walkable to downtown. It's a block from the bus line. It creates 16 actual affordable housing units on site, converts parking lots into housing. It does not just any existing, existing residents. You cannot gentrify parking lots. It improves traffic. It protects and preserves 121 heritage trees, and 44 new native trees will be planted. Being just a 15-minute walk from the heart of downtown and a block away from the bus and UCSC, it's the perfect place for more people to arrive and contribute to the economy of Santa Cruz, live car-free lifestyles. But while we value tree-filled neighborhoods, removing 22 trees should not be the sole reason to reject a needed housing development, um, especially since mature trees can be replaced with young trees, resulting in more carbon sequestration. Please allow the Smart Growth Project at 101 Felix Street to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hello? Hello. Good evening. Hi. How are you doing this evening? Um, I've just been listening, and I, I don't have a whole lot to say. But um, oh, by the name, by the way, my name is Molly Bream, and I'm a resident next door to uh, the proposed project. Uh, I live at Shelter Lagoon uh, Apartments or condos. Um, I'm calling because, well, for one, I, I mean, overall, I've heard both sides, and I see both sides, and I think a lot of good points have been made. But I overall feel like this really just comes down to. You know, general greed. <laughs> People just want to build more to make more money, and that they're entitled to that. It's a capitalist society. I get all that, blah, blah, blah. My question for if anyone is still on the line who is part of this project, uh, if they can say how many apartments currently at this location are affordable or for low-income uh, residents, um, you know, how much? what are they doing right now for low-income? And 
I don't know if they can answer that. Um, and I just, I, I liked what somebody else, one of the residents at Cypress Point had said earlier. Uh, she pointed out that, that they live on a cul-de-sac. I never have thought about that. We walk by that. We walked by there this morning, and that is such a concern. I've never thought of before for the, the issue of safety and thinking of so many more residents coming in. And then I think another call had mentioned, you know, we're in a tsunami uh, zone or, or such, however it's labeled. Uh, that's that's kind of concerning. I, I I just hadn't thought about that, but um yeah I guess overall I'm I'm in oppose I, I oppose this project personally. So thank you for my t thank you for your time and have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye bye. My name is Kirsha Durham. Thank you, commissioners, for your time. I just want to note that uh, Kirsha is with the Sierra Club, and um, she has asked for four minutes. So if she can have four minutes to speak, um, that would be appreciated. Thanks. Yeah, I, um, you received a 14-page analysis of this project. Um, it's in-depth. We looked at all the documents. Um, I have a lot of experience over the years. Um, investigating developmental projects in our county. And I will give a NIMBY disclaimer. I've lived a stone's throw from this project for 17 years. And I just want to say in all my years of environmental activism, it's the neighbors that care the most. They're the ones who live near this natural space. They know the land, the nuances. We have, walk, we have walked the lagoon. We know those 36 trees. By the way, it's 36 trees, and it's 27 are heritage. We've measured the trees. There are trees with 12, these people calling from the San Francisco Bay Area or who have been, you know, paid by the San Francisco developer to talk. They do not know that those trees are, some of them are 12 feet around, and they'll be lost permanently. And that's even more endearing when we've had a fire that has destroyed thousands of trees nearby. We have recently many, many more animals and birds, coyotes coming down the creek we're hearing. They are refugees from this fire. And it is not, I want to respond to Mr. Bain, it's not unutilized space. Just because the, the parking area, this was put in before there were general plan restrictions, 125 feet one of the building sites is just 125 feet and it is down, um, a down flow. It will have runoff from, I sent you photos, from um, the parking lot. There's already severe issues about this. So we care because we live here. We're connected with the area. We walk it every day. It's our, it is our backyard and we're proud of that. And I think that neighbors should be heard stronger. So we do support high density infill. This is the crux of the analysis. When it follows the appropriate zoning, the legislation, the general plan that the community took years to develop. This was for protection, for sustainable development and protecting our sensitive habitat. It's what makes Santa Cruz really special and unique. And we definitely oppose putting high density at the end of a street next to a precious wetland and open space. There's too many inconsistencies which have been outlined in this 14 pages. I'll go over a few. They do not agree with the general plan. The guidelines about open space and sustainable development. Um, as a fact, a planner told me that this development only got in in 1971, that it could never have been built today if we followed our general plan and local coastal program. There's a buffer. Some of the buildings are 13 feet from the creek and the lagoon. That would not be allowed, thank goodness, for people like you holding up legislation. There's a small margin. The closest area to the parking lot is 65 feet. So near the lagoon, also, if you look at that 2009 local biologist assessment of the area, there are 12 endangered species. It is an unusual diverse habitat. It's one of a few wetlands, as someone mentioned before, 90% of wetlands in California have been forever lost. 
It has an abundance of threatened and protected species. They do not know the difference between the edge of the lagoon and two trees that have been paved around in the parking lot. That wildlife is very sensitive, if you see in that report, to light pollution, to human disturbance. A year to two years of construction noise will disrupt their nesting and, and upset us. So in sum, I'm saying please, I urge you to vote no and oppose this. Look at our detailed analysis of how this does not agree with the community and our values, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Henry Hooker. I live in Santa Cruz, and I'm calling in support of this project. It seems to me that if the city of Santa Cruz is serious about um, building housing, that this for uh, workforce and affordable housing, that this is the place to do it. It's near downtown. It's sustainable, bikeable, walkable, and um, I'm calling to represent actually the 20,000 people who commute into Santa Cruz every day because there's no place for them to live. 12,000 of those people are commuting more than 10 miles, um, and it's contributing to the disaster that we see on Highway 1 morning and evening. Um, and this is infield housing. It's on a parking lot, on parking lots. It's hard to imagine, actually, a better place to put dense infill housing, which is actually what the Sierra Club is suggesting is key to uh, solving the housing crisis in California. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hi, my name is Morgan Bishop. I'm a Santa Cruz resident and a, um, I'm affiliated with a local um, homeless services nonprofit. And um, I would just like to say that I think we can all agree that there is um, obviously a housing crisis um, here in Santa Cruz. And I'm in support of this project um, for the, just for the fact that we need more affordable housing. And I think that it's the responsibility of the city to take care of the people who live there. Um, that would be over 1,200 people who are homeless, living on our streets, um, and about 78% of those being without any shelter whatsoever. Um, and additionally, around 80% of those people are Santa Cruz locals, and they have been forced to live on the streets because um, the housing prices have skyrocketed so much that they simply can't afford to live there anymore. I recognize what all previous speakers have said. Um, I too value um, our value our ecosystems, and I feel for the people that are saying that it's going to be overcrowded. But I think when it comes down to it, we need to solve this housing crisis, and we can't just sit back and let 1,200 people sleep on the streets every single night. Um, another point that I would like to make is. Uh, one of the largest um, homeless services nonprofits um, in Santa Cruz is Housing Matters, uh, which actually makes an effort to put um, unhoused people into units. Um, the fact is, is that uh, those units just aren't available right now from my understanding. Um, and so that's why I'm in support of building more units, um, affordable units, uh, to um, house people in our community. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker.
Uh, it's the last four digits of your phone number are 2294. You are unmuted and you are uh, allowed to speak. You have two minutes. The last four digits of your phone number are 2294. You are on the line. This is Chris. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. So this is Chris from Felix Street Group again? Okay. Um, we'll give you three minutes uh, to kind of finish up with, uh, to continue. Okay. So, so he's at two. Left over. <laughs> okay. So to finish up, then. So parks and open spaces, the, the areas in parks and open spaces, it's in a tsunami zone. It's in a red liquefaction zone, um, to finish my previous points. And I know Felix very well. Um, the apartments, they rent for $2,400. Um, how many families can afford that? Is that affordable to people? Uh, I don't think so. One bedroom in the um, document plus fees goes for $2,400, $2,500. This is not affordable. There's no homeless person I know that is going to be able to afford $2,400, $2,500 a month for one bedroom. And so what happens is they fill up these, it's mostly students who fill in these apartments with four to six people, and it's just crazy. It makes for increased traffic, cars, et cetera. Everybody that comes to school, especially students, they bring their cars here. Um, and one more thing on, on management, please talk to the people in the area, in the apartments that live there, as far as the complaints that they have. And just one side note, um, Cypress Point Apartments is owned by Graystar, which is the largest um, um, rental property in the United States, if not the world. On their website, they say that they are the largest rental leader, rental in housing in the world. Um, in April, they had $32 billion in gross assets. In June of 2020, they had 693,000 units of apartments in the United States. The company was sued for violating consumer protection laws in Los Angeles by um, gathering extensive personal identifying information about its tenants, knowledge, or consent. And um, the money from this does not stay locally. It goes out to their headquarters, I'm guessing, in Char Charleston, South Carolina, which the Attorney General for the state of California issued a travel ban on any type of public dollars or travel being spent in South Carolina because of discriminatory um, state laws that they have there. So I urge the council to um, really just say no to this and kill it. It's bad all the way around. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. So for the last four digits of your phone number are 0643. You've been unmuted and you're allowed to speak. Last four digits of your phone number are 0643. You've been unmuted and you're allowed to speak. Last four digits of your phone number, 4810, you are being asked to unmute your, your line. Uh, 
Okay. Am I uh, good to go? Yes. Perfect. Hey, everybody. I'll keep this pretty short. Um, thanks for having me, and hope you guys are all safe during uh, during this time. My name is Aaron. I'm a local resident here. I live in the downtown area. Um, I am against the uh, the 101 Felix Street uh, Cypress Point apartment uh, expansion. I wanted to touch on a couple of things uh, why I'm against that. I have actually had a personal experience trying to rent from them as uh, I recently moved uh, to Santa Cruz about a month or two ago. And, uh, you know, I tried to rent from them. They had very misleading advertising, I found. Uh, they had extremely low ratings. Um, their apartments, you know, as being a recent college grad, their apartments were extremely expensive, um, a lot more than they had led on to believe. I created an appointment with them and um, found out later that, you know, they upcharged by quite a bit. Um, taking a look at their reviews online, you can see clearly with their 1.8 uh, stars on Google reviews and 2.0 stars on uh, Yelp that uh, in multiple reviews um, talk about them taking advantage of their tenants, withholding deposits, uh, the rundown apartments, they hide costs. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, we're talking about this being affordable houses. Well, with COVID-19, many of the reviews state that there is no leeway with COVID-19, even though that was uh, there was laws passed to, uh, to avoid evictions. Uh, a lot of people spoke about that they wrongfully sent out eviction notices. Um, I am pro uh, affordable housing and expansion of housing in Santa Cruz, but I do not think that Cypress Point uh, management is the one to, uh, I don't think they should be, uh, they should be running, I guess, the show. But uh, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Hello, everyone. Um, I thank you tonight for having this public question. I'm a tenant at Service Point Apartments, and I'm against this project because, first of all, um, we've had firsthand experiences with the management. Management, they're very unprofessional. They never follow up on your uh, fixed orders around the apartment. And I also know someone who scheduled a move-out inspection like probably 10 to two weeks ago and uh, the management they just completely flaked like they never appeared there was no email no phone call so as we can see they are barely barely struggle they're, they're they're barely functioning to manage all these apartments and imagine if they add 80 more how bad it will be Clearly, they're not, up, they're not up to standard, they're not up to the task, and uh, they honestly don't care about the residents or just this neighborhood in general. In fact, there is actually a huge branch, it's like half a tree that fell on the property of this complex, and it's been there for um, almost 10 days now. So again, it's a fire hazard, they haven't done anything about it. I don't think they even emailed us, to be honest. So again, I think it's, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge mistake if we allow Cypress Point to continue uh, with this project, as well as um, the Big Baza owns them, Graystar, um, their website is not really helpful. It's really hard to contact them uh, via phone or email, so I don't, I, I don't think they really care. They're not invested in this uh, society, this community, so uh, that is why I think uh, they should not be building this. Uh, in addition, there are problems with parking, global warming, tsunamis, all that. Um, so I, I think there are better places around town that can handle a good... Thank you very much for your comments. So there's two members of the public who... Um, I'm not quite sure if their hands are up from earlier, but I'm going to give them the opportunity to speak just in case they haven't spoken yet. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's Christina Buchanan again, uh, and I live in front of the tree that collapsed 
at Sumter's point. And uh, I, I completely concur with the previous caller. Um, the management here is, I don't, they can't even handle what they have now, which is, what, 240 units? And they want to take care of an additional 80. Anyway, I know Star has taken this all over. Um, I don't see any improvement in the management of this of this apartment complex. Can, and meanwhile, can I interrupt we you for have a dead tree. Can I, if I can interrupt you for one sec. Have you already spoken on this item? Because members of the public are only allowed one opportunity to speak, and we're trying to make it through this item uh, so that we can um, move on to oral communications and uh, action. Well, action on this item and then oral communication. So if you've already spoken, we're going to ask that you please uh, yield your time to other members of the public who haven't spoken yet. I yield my time. Thank you. So we have one more speaker and then we'll move on to um, action and deliberation and questions from council. Last four digits are 9212. You're being asked to unmute and you'll be given two minutes. by the developer, by the owner, that those apartments are paid for. People 
students from out of town pay for those apartments year round, but they don't live in them. So there is empty housing in this neighborhood. And we can see the impact in the summer when students are gone, there's parking, there's less trash around. But when they're here and it's full, there it's the neighborhood is completely Thank you for your time. I urge you to vote no. Thank you. Okay, we have one more speaker and I'm not quite certain if they've had a chance to speak, so I'm gonna to ask to unmute and then find out whether they've spoken already. Hello? Hello, hi, have you had a chance to speak this evening? Uh, yes, but I wanted to speak for a few tenants who were too afraid to call in for fear of being evicted. Is that okay or not okay? Un unfortunately, at this moment, I think we, um, each individual only gets two minutes, but if they can send us email correspondence, we're happy to put that on the record for those individuals as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, we'll bring it back to council, um, and I'll, I'll give the developer, uh, we, we give five minutes for rebuttal, so, um, and then we'll also ask if you can stand the line for council questions. So, Brian, if, you, if you'd like, you'll have up to five minutes to uh, Great, thank you. rebut. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so just the one thing on the spot, uh, rezoning here, we are just changing it back to what it was when we developed the project. Um, you know, basically what, to confirm what's there now. Um, and we'd be legally uh, conforming at that point. Um, you know, there's several things done here. We, we've had a lot of reports completed. Um, and uh, two of those reports are the arborist report. Um, and, you know, the trees that we are removing that will not be uh, able to preserve based on our design. Uh, all of them were built, uh, you know, with the project or since the project was developed. So uh, just to be clear, and then the traffic uh, impact study that we, uh, we completed, um, you know, it included a parking analysis. And uh, the parking stalls, we are actually adding 48 new stalls. Um, and that isn't sufficient for 80 uh, apartment units on, on the surface, but we have a parking, uh, we counted the parking stalls at 11 p.m. on two different nights in mid-January, including a weekday and a weekend, and there were 76 and 119 stalls. And so there's empty stalls open. And uh, those uh, indicates that we have ample parking. Um, and just to be clear, we are not Graystar. Uh, we, we, uh, we, again, we've owned the project since 2005. In 2017, we, uh, we hired Alliance, which is now uh, owned by Graystar, to help us manage the project, uh, institutional management. And, uh, you know, to be clear, you know, we are it's owned by an affiliate of Braddock and Logan, and we are very much local, private capital, not Wall Street, nothing like that. We are here in the Bay Area, been around since 1947. But uh, there was a lot of comments on the property management, and uh, I actually have David Lee, who's been here since 2005, in charge of our property management, uh, that wants to speak. Thank you, Brian. Just really quickly, um, we have owned Cypress Point Apartments since 2005. Uh, we've been a member of that community, uh, that real estate community for 15 years. Uh, I think we provide a valuable resource to the community. Uh, it's moderately priced workforce rental housing. That's what Cypress Point Apartments are. There are many apartments in Santa Cruz that are much more expensive than Cypress Point. Uh, we invest and reinvest in the property every year, and we try to make it as nice a community as it can be. Um, I think Cypress Point's one of, if not the largest apartment communities in Santa Cruz. We're desperately needed safe, clean rental housing stock is, is sorely needed. We've provided that. We've provided it for 15 years. We've done our best to be good neighbors in the Felix Street area. Uh, in fact, today during the, uh, the, the Santa Cruz lightning fire uh, uh, crisis that, uh, that the community is facing, we've opened the community to Santa, Santa Cruz fire, Cal fire. Uh, Santa Cruz Police Department, evacuees were working with the Santa Cruz Relief Organization, Growth Change Organization. Um, they're all bringing evacuees to us. We've uh, so far put people into four apartments. We have furnished those apartments at our cost. Uh, people are staying there, some in, in many cases, uh, free of charge for the next week to two weeks while they figure out what their next steps are. We're doing all that we can to help with temporary shelter. This is part of being in this community. 
I'd also like to address a few of the comments that have been made by the public attendees here. One comment was made by a Cypress Point resident that she sees people moving out of the community all the time. Uh, I'd just like for the council to understand that our apartment community like this will routinely see 30 to 60% turnover every year. That is customary. Uh, we could bring you National Multi-Housing Council uh, facts and figures. People move because they buy homes. People move because they get new jobs. Family situations change. Uh, so that is, that is not uncommon. Uh, turnover occurs here. Um, I'd also like to note that we do allow pets at this community. I think by our records, we have 36 units that have uh, animals, uh, dogs, 54 dogs in total that we have by record. Uh, we're uh, the majority of apartments in the Bay Area, professionally owned and managed, allow pets, allow dogs. Uh, we have dogs here that are also assistance animals. And, and that's outside of our control of what we can, uh, what we could or cannot deny in those assistance animals coming with those residents. Uh, there's a public easement that provides access to the lagoon. People that live in the neighborhood walk their dogs through the property and to the lagoon and along the lagoon. Uh, we can't stop that. So it, it may not just be residents of Cypress Point that are making their way down the lagoon into the neighboring property. Uh, that's, that's the nature of the public easement there. As Brian said, the property is managed by Great Star. They are the largest management company in the United States. They do a good job. That's why they're the largest management company in the United States. We've owned the property for 15 years. We continue to own it for years to come. We commit to being good neighbors. If there are any issues at the property, those should be brought to the property manager, and we are committed to following up with any uh, complaints, matters that are that are being addressed. Uh, that's what we've done for 15 years. It's never perfect. Don't get me wrong. That's this business. But we are 100% committed to addressing those those matters. Thank you. Okay, are there any council members who have questions at this time, either for staff or for the developers? Council Member Golder. Hi, thank you, everybody. So I have a, a couple of questions. So one of the callers and actually someone texted me saying that tenants are afraid to speak out for fear of re retaliation. Um, have, you, have you reached out to the tenants that are currently living there regarding the potential of construction or how have they been informed that this might be happening? I, I can address that. Uh, that. That's absolutely false. There is no threat of eviction to anybody for speaking out. Uh, there are obviously uh, both state and local laws that, that govern uh, how an unlawful detainer process would work and on what grounds. Uh, we have to follow all those laws and, and regulations. We've reached out to the Cypress Point community about this project, uh, and there's no threat of retribution. There are notices posted throughout the community. Uh, so that 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 is 100% false, and I, again, I'm not... I'm not calling anybody a liar. I'd certainly like to hear from that person directly as a follow-up to this, why they feel that way, because that, that is 100% not true. Thank you. And then the other one is, um, how many, do you have like a maximum number of people that can be in like a studio, one bedroom, uh, you know? It's, it's, the, there are HUD, Housing Urban Development, HUD guidelines that all housing owners and managers uh, really are, are um, uh, have to follow. So it's two people per bedroom plus one. So for example, in a one bedroom unit, that would be three people. In a two bedroom apartment, that would be five people. Uh, that, that is, that's really outside of our control. If we were to not allow those three people to live in a one bedroom apartment, we could be subject to fair housing violations. That's a federal law. And so from my understanding, the ones that are gonna be proposed to be built are studios and one bedrooms. What about studios? Um, the studio is two people by HUD guidelines. Thank you. Yep. Are there other council members who have any questions at this point in time? I did have, uh, I have one question for the developer and then I have some questions for staff. Um, somebody brought up the question of uh, are there any
affordable units currently at this project, at this site. And I was just curious if you could speak to that, because it sounds like there are none, um, but just whether you could comment on, on why that's the case. By deed restriction, there are not affordable units by that technical definition. But again, if, if we were to uh, measure the, the rents at Cypress Point today from studios up through two bedrooms uh, against all of the you know class of, of rental housing in Santa Cruz, I think the, the rents here fit into what would definitely be workforce level rents. Uh, at times have, have apartments rented for uh, higher or lower, depending on the, the season, the time of year. Uh, absolutely, studios will rent somewhere between seventeen hundred and 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 nineteen hundred dollars uh, generally, routinely. Uh, one bedroom apartments will rent two thousand to twenty two hundred dollars typically, and two bedroom apartments will rent for uh, twenty four to twenty six hundred dollars. And again, it might be higher than those ranges sometimes. It might be lower. I, I had a question uh, for staff, if there's staff still on this call, uh, with regards to the 2012 general plan and the process that um, that planning, the, that that document went through. So if there's any staff on the call who might be able to speak to that, or maybe the city manager. So just wondering if you could just walk you know, us and the members of the community who are watching through kind of what that, um, you know, general plan process was like um, and like the outreach that was done, et cetera. Sure, so uh, our general plan process started in uh, roughly 2005. It finished in um, 2012. There were um, uh, over 100 meetings that were public meetings associated with that. And um, the uh, environmental impact report and the general plan was certified after you know roughly seven years of uh, the uh, overall process. Thanks, uh, Council Member Byers. And you're muted. To the planning director. Um, and, and reading, uh, it said, what did it say? The applicant is close to being uh, complete. Not the applicant, I'm sorry, the application is close to being complete. Why? Tell me why we're here tonight. So, um, <clears throat> right now, the applicant is uh, in about to embark on what's a costly um, endeavor that would be um, completing the environmental impact. Okay. Work work and um, and moving forward with the, that uh, environmental document, whether that's a, a mitigated negative declaration or an environmental impact report, you know, the, what's required um, can't be determined until those uh, documents are complete. But that's a big uh, investment in both um, time and money, both for the applicant and uh, in time that our staff uh, and our team spends. And so this provides the council an opportunity to weigh in and provide feedback on that in advance of that significant uh, time investment. It's not something that we do for every project, but it's an extra step. Um, I, I believe the last time it was done was with the La Bahia project. Um, and, um, and so it's an opportunity for the community to weigh in. It's an opportunity for the council to weigh in and um, provide direction. Thank you. I, I want. I thought that was it, but I didn't know where there was a little bit more to it. But it's just the environmental review. Yeah, right. the determination of what it was going to be. It could be a negative deck, not quite as expensive. Right, not quite as expensive. We don't know yet. That's correct, and and still um, a, a fair number of technical reports. You know, regardless of the the process, the EIR or MND. It, the reports themselves are expensive and, and time consuming. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I have a, a question that's somewhat related to this project, but somewhat more related to just housing development in general. Maybe this can go to the planning director. So just a kind of a general question, like more of a conceptual and conceptual question, but oftentimes in the community we hear that if we build market rate now, down the line, it'll be affordable, you know, in the future, like 40, 50 years in the future, it'll be affordable. We, here we have a project that was built, an apartment complex, that was built in 1971, and it's now 49 years old, and one bedrooms are going for $2,200 and two bedrooms for $2,600. What kind of mechanisms, I guess, can we put in place as we're thinking about development so that these projects that, you know, we're seeing that are being developed now that are market rate will actually be affordable in the future because, you know, one would, one would think that something built in 1971 would actually be much more affordable today, and this is not. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, because – What's being proposed as well with the new developments, those sound like they're going to be um, more expensive as new homes. And there is this real concern with residents in Santa Cruz around gentrification and what this could do to promote gentrification. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so uh, a couple of things. Um, first, um, I would say the best way to ensure long-term um, affordability is to have deed restrictions. And um, with density bonus projects, you're getting deed restrictions that actually lower uh, levels of affordability. Typically, there are options in which the developer can choose to um, provide more at higher levels or, or fewer at, uh, more affordability, uh, more affordable units at, I should say, a higher number of affordable units at higher affordability levels, so like 80% AMI, or fewer affordable units um, at uh, deeper affordability levels, say 50% of area median income. In any case, whether it's inclusionary or through the density bonus, that's the best way, or 100% affordable projects that use tax credits and so forth. That's how we're getting uh, long-term um, affordability. I think, you know, the, the state uh, legislative analyst office uh, has weighed in on this. The state has weighed in on it in terms of the Housing Accountability Act. I think it's, it's clearly known that throughout the state there is a shortage of housing, and that has certainly driven up prices. It's basic economics 101. Um, what is more debatable, I would say, uh, and, but there are studies supporting this, um, is the fact that um, if uh, you provide additional housing, uh, then the rate of uh, increase isn't going to be as high uh, as it otherwise it would be if additional housing isn't produced. And you can look to some towns not too far from here, whether it's you know Carmel or, or Los Gatos, where there's fewer housing units that are produced and you've got a relatively higher uh, escalation of, uh, of housing prices. Um, so, you know, the, the theory, and supported by some studies, is that um, by providing additional housing, you are still going to get um, increased costs, but that additional housing actually influences the housing prices by not having them increase at the rate that they otherwise would if fewer housing units are produced. So, you know, it's theories and, uh, you know, some specifics in terms of the best thing to do is to deed restrict or get 100% affordable housing projects that are deed restricted. Um, but uh, the production of housing um, can influence housing costs and um, are, there's some examples of that um, in, in local areas. Thanks. <laughs> Council Member Byers, and you're muted. No matter what comes out of this meeting, the applicant can go forward. Is that correct? The council has the opportunity to deny this project outright. If, if the uh, council chooses to do so, we would make the recommendation that uh, we come back at a later meeting with a, a denial resolution and um, 
that uh, if you're choosing to do that, we would ask that you articulate the reasoning uh, surrounding that so that we can capture it in that resolution, just so that we're um, uh, yeah. providing that additional information. Well, why did I think from the beginning, I, I, I just now, yeah, I know from the presentation uh, was given us tonight that we had those three options, but why did I think all along that this was just um, give direction to move forward? But they didn't get, and it wasn't binding to, to a final vote, correct? I mean, that's all we said. You, you do what you do, and then when the whole application comes to us, whatever you did in this meeting is not obligating one to up or down later. But now you're telling me, sitting here tonight, it can actually be denied. It can be denied. It can't be approved. And no, I, I uh, let me let me uh, clarify because I, I, I'm sorry that uh, the, it wasn't entirely clear before. If I, I, I do want to be clear that if you say let's proceed with the, these additional environmental analyses, what that do, what that does is it doesn't um, require that you. It, it doesn't presuppose that you're going to approve the project in four months or however, whatever timeline. You know, you can say proceed now, and then you get that information, and you can deny it later. Right, I understand. That was, that was what we were trying to convey, that saying proceed now does not equate to an approval down the road. It just says proceed now, and we'll see what happens in a few months when we have additional information. But now you've added it all could simply be denied. That's correct. You can. But what, say they get, well, now there's only five of us. Okay. So they have to have a majority still that go forward or they won't go forward. There, uh, you could, you could deny the project. Um, I would have to look and see, and Tony may be able to help me in terms of five of you, how many of you need to vote uh, in order to deny that? Uh, is it a, is it a, quorum of the people that are there or a quorum of the uh, full council. Um, I'd have to take a look at that. And Tony may know off the top of his head, but I've, I've got this section up here as well, so I'll peruse that. Yeah, the, the rule is somewhat arcane. Um, uh, the, the planning director has recommended that if the council is in favor of denying that you bring back a resolution for council consideration. And under California law, for a general, general law city, it, that requires a majority of the, of the council. Uh, it's not as clear for a charter city. Um, it appears that that resolution could be adopted by a majority of council members present, but I need to do a little bit of research before we um, bring that back to the council for action. But to, to Tony's point, if we're coming back at a future meeting, um, at that point we would uh, hopefully have six council members yeah. present who are sure. able to participate. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other council members with comments? I have a few comments I'd like to make, and then I think just given the time and we still have oral communications, um, that maybe we can start oh, moving God. on. So I guess one of the things I really just want to acknowledge, um, I want to thank the developers for reaching out uh, to our staff to bring this forward to us and to bring it to the council um, for consideration. Um, after hearing a lot of the public comment, I think one of the big issues, I mean, there's a lot of issues that have come up. I met with many of the neighbors this weekend toward the property and the tree that was mentioned that was still down is still down over that fence and um, talk to them about a lot of the property management issues and I think that's a completely separate issue. I think one of the things that's most concerning for me that's before us today is the fact that you know seven years went into this planning process uh, for determining the general plan and density within the different areas of Santa Cruz and this area in particular is one of the denser neighborhoods in terms of housing within our entire community. And it might be understandable if we were looking at um, adding a, you know, fully affordable project in a neighborhood that was lower density, where there was, you know, high um, 
approval of this kind of project coming in. But I mean, what we're seeing is that given all the public outreach and all the public process that went into the general plan and that went into the consideration of the zoning of this area, uh, there doesn't seem to be um, very much community support of increasing that zoning to allow for this project. And so making these spot amendments to the zoning, I think we are problematic in an area where there's very low community support. And so um, I'm not supportive at this time of moving in that direction of, in, of making changes to the zoning in this area. Councilmember Brown. Yes, uh, yeah, I also want to uh, appreciate all of the time and uh, energy that people have put in to uh, both bring this uh, question to us and also to comment on the, the agenda item, including the pitfalls, the, poten the merits, um, but I just want to be clear that that is not what we are um, being asked to base our decision upon tonight. Um, our task here is to make a decision um, based on the the um, the process. I would say the process, really. I mean, environmental considerations. I I, I share those concerns. Uh, the behavior of the property management company. I too share those concerns. Uh, but those are not. Uh, uh, bases on which we can make a decision about moving forward with a project. We can make a decision about uh, whether or not we, as a as a council representing the community, uh, want to spot up zone uh, a particular neighborhood. And um, and I'm not inclined to do that uh, here. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, the general plan is. Uh, you know, I want to honor the general plan and the decisions that have been made in previous rounds. We consistently hear from staff when we're talking about potential general plan changes that it's going to take, you know, a year and tons of money and tons of staff time. And, you know, even earlier t today on an agenda item around the um, east side corridors uh, reset, staff said that, um, you know, all that it would entail to do a general plan change. And now here we are a couple hours later being asked to do just that. And so I, I can't support that. Um, I, I want to be clear that I um, absolutely support uh, additional affordable housing. And if that means increased density in some places, I, you know, I have no problem with that. Um, but right now we are not being asked to, to really uh, make a consideration that would lead to a significant contribution in affordable units. Um, and so I'm, I'm not inclined to support this tonight either. Council Member Golder. I'm just wondering if the developer would be um, interested in changing property management companies or exploring that moving forward or looking at it at all. That seems to be a concern from the community. If the that developer wants to comment, go ahead. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. We'd be, uh, I, look, I think that we're always evaluating the performance of the management company. And, and so, uh, as I said before, we're happy to take the, the feedback, constructive feedback. Um, I've been in this business for 25 years, and, and, and I'm not suggesting I'm an expert, but doing this for 25 years, uh, understanding that you can't make everybody happy all the time. You can only try to. Uh, so I, I'd love to say that there's a magic elixir of somebody else out there that can make it perfect. It, it doesn't exist. All we can do is take the feedback and, and try to get better. Uh, it, you know, if, if changing management companies meant approving the project, uh, you know, we'd consider it very swiftly and, and look at alternatives right away. But I, I, I can't guarantee that that makes it better overnight. That's for sure. Thank you. Council Member Golder. Okay. And so just for me, weighing all of the comments from the public and reading the reports and speaking to people on both sides, um, I'm inclined to let the process continue, have the environmental impact report 
I'm not a developer. I'm not an expert in um, environmental review. I would like to see, you know, what would happen with the next step. I think consistently what I've seen living in Santa Cruz is that projects come forward. People say they are for affordable housing or for housing, but it's always like, but not here. And so I think like so many projects are in our riparian corridors or near some um, sensitive habitats, and then they get shut down because of that. And so if we keep thinking like that, we'll never build more housing, but people are going to continue to come. And I've said this till I'm blue in the face, that the population of Santa Cruz has doubled since I graduated high school, which I know I look young, but like it hasn't, it's, you know, 20 years, 23, I don't even know how many years, a long time, but either way, it's going to continue to go up. And we, and ninth grade economics taught me that if we increase the supply, like somebody said, with Carvel, the supply doesn't go up, then the cost can't go down. So whether it's market rate or whether it's affordable, whatever it is, if we increase the supply, the cost can potentially go down. And even without deed restrictions, if there's more housing available, there's going to be um, less demand on the housing that's available. I, I don't know, I have a hard time stopping it right here without going forward and exploring more what can be done. If I could interject, um, I'd like to see if the planning director can come back. Um, I have a, just a clarifying question because I just want to get some clarification around the environmental review process for this and just kind of what that looks like, what those next steps are, and you know, what influence does that have on this project moving forward in terms of density and number of buildings, et cetera? So uh, a next step, and uh, I could lean on the project manager, Ryan Bain, if, if there are specifics, but just as by way of example, the, uh, the project would, for example, hire a biologist uh, to evaluate the potential impacts associated with the locations of the buildings, for example, so long-term things like um, would there be lighting impacts uh, on nearby um, uh, habitat? And then also short-term things like um, would the construction affect nesting birds, for example? And it would come forth with a, a series of recommendations, um, mitigation measures that um, specify here's how you could modify the project um, or here's how you could modify the construction to reduce impacts on the environment. And um, depending on whether or not uh, there would be a significant effect would, would dictate whether or not we uh, have to do an environmental impact report. Um, if mitigation measures couldn't draw, couldn't uh, reduce the impact to a less than significant level, we would have to do an environmental impact report. If it didn't, uh, then there would be the option, or excuse me, if, if all of the uh, mitigation measures uh, resulted in uh, less than significant impacts, then there would be the option to do a mitigated negative declaration. So if that's just one uh, technical report, um, and Ryan could chime in on which ones they've done, which ones are still needed, um, and so forth. But that's kind of generally how the process would go from here. That, those reports, I should say, once, once that uh, document, whether it's an MND or an EIR, that document would be circulated for public comment and the public would be given the opportunity to, uh, to provide feedback on those uh, technical reports. And just for clarification, what are generally the costs around those kinds of EIRs? Or for this project, what would the, that cost look like? Uh, that's going to vary significantly depending on um, the, the number of reports that are necessary. Um, if Ryan, if you can uh, chime in on uh, some of the specifics about which reports have been done and which reports haven't, and then um, the costs associated with um, the environmental uh, paths as well as the time uh, that would be needed. Yeah, um, this is Ryan. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, yeah, there was a number of reports that have already been completed and supplied to us um, by the applicant, um, including archeological, 
uh, traffic impact analysis. Actually, they've they've um, revised that a couple of times just based on you know the differences in the number of units they proposed. So that's been revised a few times. They've done uh, prelim preliminary hydraulic reports, sanitary sewer, water system reports, stormwater reports, um, tree study, um, um, as well as um, reports on some of the road improvements that are being proposed. So those are all reports that have been completed and provided to us um, as part of preparing the initial study. Um, through the preparation of the initial study, um, there were some additional reports that still need to be completed. We determined there needs to be, a, it's called the Cali Mod, it's an energy report. Um, there's further um, testing that needs to be done for archeological, but, um, so there needs to be some additional archeological studies done. Um, as well as uh, biological, um, and then also a geologic uh, report. So that was kind of one of the catalysts to this preliminary uh, consideration is we're kind of at a, at a fork in the road where do we move forward and have these additional reports done, which are gonna be several tens of thousands of dollars to prepare. Um, and then also from that, we need to base do we, as Lee had mentioned, you know, do we do, uh, are there going to be any impacts indicated and do we do a mitigated negative declaration? Do we do an EIR? Um, and there's significant costs involved depending on which direction that goes, uh, as well as the time, obviously. Uh, an EIR usually takes several months to do. Um, we have um, public noticing and all those type of things, so it adds significant time. So that was kind of one of the catalysts for this preliminary consideration is before they make some additional significant investment, I mean, they've already made investment in the plans and uh, fees and all those type of things, and as well as the reports they've provided. Um, so they've already come a long ways, and so before they make another additional investment, uh, we wanted to hear from the council as to, you know, from a legislative act standpoint, what should, should they move forward with, with these reports and continue the process? Thank you. And I just ask those questions too, just so the public is aware that you know, I think that um, you know what we've heard tonight and kind of bringing up these issues around zoning. If we move forward tonight, that could cost the, these people tens of thousands of dollars. And so um, I think that it's also you know in our best interest to take that into consideration when making our decisions because if the money is invested and then it doesn't go in that direction, I think that um, you know. It's it's kind of a you know the the putting the developers in a situation where they're really having to gamble whether this is worth putting their money into or not and it sounds like you know from the community um, that these zoning changes are something that they're not really interested in but I'll leave it at that and allow my other colleagues to speak at this time so Councilmember Myers or Vice Mayor sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, um, yeah, this is, uh, I, I guess my, my comments really, um, it's, I've, I've heard a lot of discussion tonight and it's been a little bit hard to track all of it because we've hit different pieces of it. Um, first off, I guess I have a question. How much outreach was has been done? I, I think this is in the um, staff report. I'm I'm trying to look at it real quickly. Um, I'm just curious about how many community workshops or community outreach types of activities have happened, um, either from the initial the initial application or with the denser application with uh, with the property owners and the and the and the neighborhood. Um, this is Ryan Van, Senior Planner. Um, we've had the, the June community outreach meeting, and um, I'm trying to remember, I don't remember exactly the scope of the, I have it written down somewhere um, as to how far we went in terms of noticing, but, mm -hmm. um, and then I know the applicant or the owners did reach out and did have some meetings separately with some of the Shelter Lagoon owners and maybe among other people. But that's, uh, I think that's the main outreach that we've had other than obviously this uh, this council meeting. 
Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that I think what I'm hearing is I, I, I'm, I'm witnessing and also hearing this sort of an overwhelming um, uh, amount of basically conflict with this project in in this particular neighborhood. Um, and and I I do have concerns about sort of the the, the spot zoning and the increase um, on the site. Uh, this is um, this neighborhood is already very very dense. Um, I appreciate um, you know the perspective of of needing additional housing. However, um, you know I'm a proponent of trying to put that put housing in places that um, would potentially not as densely developed this is that's probably the the most prevalent comment I got from from various people who contacted me um, and so you know I'm in, I'm inclined to to not really support the increased density um, and I, I think I'll leave it at that right now um, it seems well. I'll leave it at that right now, and, and continue with council, uh, my colleagues' uh, discussion on the item for a little bit longer. Thank you, hey, Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Byers. All right, I uh, I want to make one more comment, and then I have a question about trying to figure out a way forward here. Um, so, again, we've heard lots of, you know, opposition, we've heard uh, support, we've heard, uh, you know, lots of reasons why uh, we ought to support or oppose this. Um, I, and I have plenty to say about the, the potential for, you know, the supply-demand question um, in the context of our particular uh, community and the um, the kind of hyper speculative environment we are in with our land market. Um, but I won't, I'll save that for other conversations. Um, I just reject that premise that, you know, this is gonna bring us more affordable housing uh, and, and do all these wonderful things that we know we need in our community. Um, but I, I also just wanna say, I, you know, I, the question before us is about whether or not we want to make a decision that I believe undermines the integrity of the general plan and the general plan process. So to me, that is, uh, you know, fundamental and I'm not interested in upzoning and spot upzoning. I think it's a bad precedent. Um, I certainly could, um, you know, uh, a contribution to affordability is a good reason to um, kind of open up that conversation further, but I don't think that's where we're at today. Um, and so I'd like to kind of figure out how to move us along here. If we were to uh, declaratively say that we we don't support that, um, you know, and we have those the two options of re rejecting um, with prejudice or without prejudice, um, I, I understand that we need to create findings of fact or whatever that might be for whatever it's called for a resolution. Do we need to go through that here tonight? Um, you know, how would that process play out uh, just so we can kind of move along here? And I don't know, that question's probably, yeah, thank you, Lee. Should you choose to um, deny the project, we would ask if you're um, seeking to do so with or without prejudice. And then um, we, uh, based on the comments that we've heard from you all tonight, we would um, draft a resolution that we would bring back to you that articulates the uh, comments that we've heard from you. And then um, you could fine tune that at uh, a subsequent meeting should you uh, choose to do so. But um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation back and forth and um, we can um, uh, take a shot at that and you could have the opportunity to wordsmith it or to accept it as written at a future meeting. Councilmember Byers. You're muted, by the way. Uh, both the mayor and uh, Councilmember Sandy have 
exactly where I'm at, and that is not um, changing the general plan. Uh, I so been on the general plan committees, and then when we've approved them, and uh, uh, not about to want uh, my vote to uh, change, uh, go forward in changing the general plan. I, I'm just finding myself sorry that only I wish that only had come to us. Just change the general plan. Of course, you have to say why you're going to change the plan, and we need some some sense from this developer what he had in mind. But uh, um, for me, I won't be able to support it moving forward. I think it's just a terrible mistake to consider changing our general plan at this time. At all. It's even not this time, but change our general plan. So I have a question for the city attorney, and I'm going to be looking for a motion from my colleagues. Um, so just, you know, breaking down, you know, if we deny with prejudice, you know, that means it's dismissed permanently. Um, it's, that, that's my understanding. I, it seems like if there's any future consideration of this type of change in zoning, I think what some of the sentiments that are being expressed in this meeting currently is that if that were to change through another general planning process, then down the line, if the community wants that, then fine. But um, if that's the case, then what would be the best approach? Because I'm wondering if that language should be such that it's denied without prejudice, but the conditions for that, um, for it to come back, would be that we would need to go through a general planning process and the community would need to um, change the zoning such that it would be it would allow for this increase in density within that area. So I'm wondering if that's something that we could possibly. Yeah, I think I understand your question, and I think that the answer to that is that um, the characterization of the denial as with or without prejudice is really intended to provide the council with an opportunity to provide some feedback as to the circumstances under which it might consider a general plan amendment. And um, even if the council makes a decision today to deny it without prejudice, that can't bind a future council, um, mindful of the fact that there's an election in November and uh, circumstances change, um, which is why you have the ability to amend general plans um, up to three or four times a year, as the planning director said. So, um, so my recommendation would be that if the council does not favor the uh, general plan amendment uh, as presented this evening, that you merely direct staff to return with a resolution uh, expressing the council's uh, 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 disapproval of the amendment as proposed. Um, I don't think it's necessary to characterize it as an amendment with prejudice or without prejudice. Mm -hmm. But again, um, an amendment without prejudice would, would be appropriate if the council were uh, to say, okay, well, uh, uh, we're open to the idea, but with a few modifications. And so what I'm hearing tonight is that the council um, is not interested in densifying the level of development in that location, and so, um, therefore, just a resolution of, uh, uh, of denial would be the, the appropriate um, sure. action for the council to take. To take. Assuming that, um, you know, and based on the comments, it seems like that's the direction the council is going. So assuming that's the case, then that would be my recommendation. And I would just add, um, thank you for that clarification, Tony, because um, in the code, it specifies that um, when a permit is denied or withdrawn, uh, the application for the same or substantially the same project may be filed uh, for a period of one year uh, from the date of denial or withdrawal. Um, and so no new application may be filed unless the application is denied without prejudice. Um, that's, that's referring to the application component. And I think, you know, to Tony's point of it's uh, within the ability of the uh, council to, um, uh, to approve a general plan amendment in the future. Um, this specific section 240470 
um, references a permit. Uh, so I, I would uh, agree with Tony's interpretation there um, that um, it, uh, it would just be a denial resolution for the general plan amendment, general plan. the uh, rezoning. Thank you. Councilmember Byers. Yeah, thank you, Tony, Tony. That, you know, I was thrown for a loop at the beginning when it gave us these three options with or without Fred Meagher, or two, I can't remember. Because I've always thought that the crux to this whole thing is the general plan amendment, then the application. So uh, thanks. That's where my thinking was going, and you clarified what. I hope and tend to vote or we'll have a motion on this issue. It's just we're dealing with the general plan. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. And just to remind the council, the recommendation is to give direction to staff as to whether or not to continue processing the application. Oh, that's the second recommendation? That is the recommendation, so it's not- Why would they go forward if we don't, if we don't change the general plan? Uh, the application would be for a general plan amendment. So mm -hmm. it's oh, just a discretionary action on the part of the city council. Oh, and so, okay. so really the purpose of this meeting is to gauge the council's right. uh, you know, sentiments about whether or not to continue the process. Got it. Okay. Council Member Brown. Okay, so again, just trying to uh, figure out how we move through this. Um, so. As I understand it, the the we are not being asked to uh, reject a proposed general plan, local coastal plan, and zoning or amendments, and then zoning change. We're not that's that wouldn't be the appropriate motion to make because that's what I was just about to do. But it's sounding like maybe not. Um, so we need to the motion would have to be simply to uh, reject the application. Be, and I mean, I think that it, it, it's worth explaining that maybe that's what comes in the resolution that we get in, in a follow-up meeting. I just want to make sure we're, act, you know, making the accurate uh, move here. Well, or appropriate. I think that's right. Okay, so I'll go ahead and make that motion that we uh, reject the application uh, to, we, we reject think, continuing to process the application. Uh, yeah, I think the, the requested uh, direction is to return to the council with a resolution um, uh, expressing the council's lack of support for continuing to process the application. And I would turn to the planning director to just confirm that. Yes, and I think what we can do is when we bring back the, uh, the resolution, we can specify if it is, if what it amounts to is a denial of the general plan amendment and the okay. So, you know, I, I think uh, we've gathered what the council has indicated here, and uh, you know, you can articulate uh, the motion, and um, we'll come back with the resolution with the, the correct language, which. I believe will just be an outright denial of the general plan amendment and uh, the uh, rezoning. And we'll coordinate with the attorney's office on the appropriate language for that. Okay. So I will move that we direct staff to return to council with a resolution uh, rejecting moving forward with the application and uh, and the propose or the 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 general plan uh, amendments required for that purpose. I, again, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm trying to make it clear, but I don't want to. Should sorry. we just say uh, resolution? Can I maybe? <laughs> can, I maybe yeah. can I maybe try to, to articulate that because I was writing some things down. So what I heard is that we could move that staff return to council with a, with a resolution to deny the application for a general plan amendment and rezoning. Yes, yes. that's all. So moved. <laughs> I'll second. Okay, 
Council Member Byers and then Council Member well, Boulder. Uh, it, it was going kind of squirrely for me. We keep talking about the application. What, what we need is the the general plan, and then uh, thank you, Lee. When you spoke, you were weaving it into what you would bring back. So I think it's clear now. We just are denying it, denying the general plan. Yeah, and everything else follows that. Okay, got it. I'm done. <laughs> okay, Councilmember Golder. So for the people that are listening and who are in favor of this development or future development, when can they get involved in the next planning for the next general plan where they can speak up about wanting to increase density in different neighborhoods? So the state um, recommends, uh, Office of Planning and Research recommends the general plans are updated once every 10 years. Um, I don't know that I'm aware of any jurisdiction that actually updates their general plan every 10 years. You, you know, our, our last one took seven years uh, to complete. And so, you know, that would be starting over almost when you, uh, right after you complete it. Uh, but I, you know, sometime within the next five to 10 years, um, we would be looking at um, initiating that process. Um, however, there are there are things that happen on a regular basis, like the objective standards, uh, for example, is an opportunity for people to weigh in on the built form in the community. And so um, that's a, a big project that we've got going on um, that we initiated today. Um, and it'll be there'll be lots of uh, public engagement opportunities uh, for that. And um, there will also be um, a, uh, a recommendation in front of the council in the coming uh, 45 days um, that uh, recommends that we expand the boundary of the downtown to the south. Um, and we've got a grant opportunity that could um, uh, offer $300,000 towards that and we'll be recommending to the council that the, um, the grant be uh, applied towards that. So that would be another opportunity uh, for community feedback in relation to um, modifying what the general plan currently states. Okay, so I just wanted like, so for the reason that I'm not gonna support you, um, my colleagues denying this, I have to say is like, so a high school kid that's 15, so five to 10 years, they'll be 20, 25 years old before they can even provide input into the next plan. And then, and then they can move forward and maybe build some housing by the time they're like in their mid thirties. It just seems like we have an opportunity here where are developers willing to work with the community. Um, there's definitely things that people are um, opposed to. Um, and I, no, I'm not suggesting that you know we're approving the project right now. I just think denying it in its infancy is um, being kind of hypocritical when we're all saying we need housing and we need affordable housing. And even like a mid-career mid teacher or a paramedic or a nurse couldn't qualify for our affordable housing. So they'd be income qualified out. And so they would need to be looking for market rate housing. And so the more affordable housing in a development, the less, um, or the more, yeah, the, the more, the higher the market rate's gonna be. I mean, they have to meet their bottom line. And so I think 20% is a good compromise in a private development and it kind of bums me out to see um, us just squashing, moving forward by, you know, when it could be decades before something like this could come forward again. Council Member Byers. Oh, no, I, oh, sorry, I spoke. Okay. okay. Is there any further comments or questions from council members? We still have oral communications. Uh, following this, Council Member or Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just I just want to acknowledge uh, my colleague um, Council Member Colder um, in terms of really how we're we're really 
you know, Santa Cruz is just not is not building enough housing for residents. Um, we we are continuing to get pressure. Um, I think with with COVID, a lot of people are going to live differently than they were before. Um, every chance we get, I think we do have to seriously think about it. I, I do just believe that um, having this, doing this general plan amendment, this general plan change, I, I just, I, it, it does feel, um, I'm just not in favor of the spot zoning. Um, so I, I'm pleased that my colleagues are, are looking at this as the motion. Uh, I just want to make sure I understand this motion does not kill the project altogether. It just denies the um, the requested general plan amendment and changes, right? No, so this is going to kill the project altogether. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh, it will kill the project altogether. Okay. Yeah. And they can't build additional units um, without the general plan amendment and the rezoning. So uh, this action would kill the project. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, if we're ready to um, take a vote on this item, then um, I guess I'll just say <clears throat> before we vote on this that, you know, there's a lot. Um, we, we were discussing today a number of projects that are moving forward, and there's a lot of projects that are going to be coming before us. And um, I know we're going to be taking a lot of public comment into account when we're making these decisions. Um, this is just one, again, that's, um, you know, it's it's a really – Difficult project, and you know, in terms of the spot zoning changes that need to be made, um, I think that we want to increase density in our community, and we have, you know, we're committed to building more housing, and this is one of the densest communities in Santa Cruz. And I just want to say that we have to be mindful of a lot of the concerns that have come up. And one thing I hope is that um, if this is going to, you know, um, not move this project forward, there's been a lot of concern from people who live within that complex of the need for renovations. And so I'm hoping that maybe there can be a lot of renovations done on the current units there and that we can continue to, you know, put more projects in throughout the city. And with that and the, in the essence of time, I think we should probably go ahead and take a vote on the motion that's before us, which is to return to council with a resolution to deny the application for general plan, plan amendment and rezoning. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Councilmember Byers. Aye. Matthews is um, disqualified. Brown. Aye. Golder. No. Did you say no? Yeah. I said no. Watkins is absent. Um, Vice Mayor Byers. I'm going to vote no. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. So that passes with Council Members Brown, Byers, and Mayor voting in favor with Council Members Golder and Vice Mayor Myers voting opposed. Okay. So that um, moves on, and I think we'll just go directly into oral communications. So for members of the public, who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Uh, the instructions should be on your screen. And this is an opportunity for members of the community to comment or speak to us on items that are not listed on our agenda today. So if you're interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will have two minutes to speak. When it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted we request that you clearly and slowly state your name before your comment so that we can accurately capture it for the meeting notes or meeting minutes, sorry. However, that is not required. So with that, I'd like to open it up for oral communications this evening. Again, you can call the numbers that are on your screen. Please press star nine on your phone if you'd like to speak on this item. Or speak, sorry, generally. Hi, uh, Reggie Meisler calling in again. You know, I just wanted to talk kind of generally about affordable housing strategy because I was pleasantly surprised that Mayor Cohen brought up that very, very old housing of questionable quality has kept market rate in Santa Cruz and not become affordable over time, as market philosophers have argued. 
Uh, I'm also very happy to hear city staff admit that deed restriction is the best approach to affordable housing and not increased supply. And I feel like we understand this problem. So I guess I'm confused why the city is relying on inclusionary zoning policies where 80% or more of units are at minimum unaffordable to 50% of our residents or more than 50% really. Um, why is the city not purchasing existing structures and renovating them like struggling motels? After Loma Prieta, the city was able to achieve 100% affordable housing by renovating St. George Street Hotel uh, and Palomar Inn. Uh, and now during COVID, there are dozens of struggling motels, hotels, and multifamily homes at lower sales values than ever before. Um, and the cost per unit of buying them and renovating them is far less than market rate subsidy. Uh, just last year, not even during COVID, an 11-unit motel, 123 Bixby Street, sold for $2 million. And that per unit cost was $182,000, where the average sort of market subsidy is between 350,000 and 450,000 per unit, I'm told. Um, so it just doesn't make sense to me because if you did it this way, you wouldn't run into any community opposition at all. The structure already exists. There's little or no construction. It's cheaper, it's easier, it's 100% affordable. Um, I just would like to know why we aren't focusing on these kinds of projects uh, and building sort of municipal housing really. And. Uh, you know, I'll just throw in the very last bit here that um, we could fund these projects with probably, you know, a yearly amount of 20% of the police budget, uh, and it would be transformational to housing. And so, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? If so, please call the number that's on your screen now. And when you've called in, please press star nine on your phone if you make, um, to raise your hand and you will be then unmuted and allowed to comment on this item. Okay, seeing no further members of the community who like to comment during oral communications. We will close out oral communications and that will conclude our meeting for this evening. And again, um, I just urge everyone to please stay safe uh, during uh, these fires. And again, um, we're all doing our best to try to look out for each other during this very difficult time. And um, I wish everybody best. And with that, um, good evening. Goodbye.